This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, and for more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristin Luoma, GreenKRI.com, of The Count of Monte Cristo, by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter One. Marseille, the arrival. On the 24th of February, 1815, the lookout at Notre-Dame de la Garde signaled the three master, the Pharaon, from Smyrna, Trieste, and Naples. As usual, a pilot put off immediately, and routing the Chateau d'If, got on board the vessel between Cape Morgeon and Rion Island. Immediately, and according to custom, the ramparts of Fort Saint-Jean were covered with spectators. It is always an event at Marseille for a ship to come into port, especially when this ship, like the Ferron, has been built, rigged, and laden in the old Fossi docks, and belongs to an owner of the city. The ship drew on, and had safely passed the strait, which some volcanic shock has made between the Calasren and Jaros Islands, had doubled Pomeg, and approached the harbour under topsails, jib, and spanker, but so slowly and sedately that the idlers, with that instinct which is the forerunner of evil, asked one another what misfortune could have happened on board. However, those experienced in navigation saw plainly if any accident had occurred, it was not to the vessel herself, for she bore down with all the evidence of being skillfully handled, the anchor a cockbill, the jib-boom guys already eased off, and standing by the side of the pilot, who was steering the Ferron towards the narrow entrance of the inner port, was a young man who with activity and vigilant eye watched every motion of the ship and repeated every direction of the pilot. The vague disquietude which prevailed among the spectators had so much affected one of the crowd that he did not await the arrival of the vessel in harbour, but jumping into a small skiff desired to be pulled alongside the Ferron, which he reached as she rounded into La Reserve Basin. When the young man on board saw this person approach, he left his station by the pilot, and hat in hand, leaned over the ship's bulwarks. He was a fine, tall, slim young fellow of eighteen or twenty, with black eyes and hair as dark as a raven's wing, and his whole appearance bespoke that calmness and resolution peculiar to men accustomed from their cradle to contend with danger. "'Ah, is it you, Dantes?' cried the man in the skiff. "'What's the matter, and why have you such an air of sadness aboard?' "'A great misfortune, Monsieur Morel,' replied the young man. "'A great misfortune, for me especially. Off Civita Vecchia we lost our brave captain, Leclerc.' "'And the cargo?' inquired the owner, eagerly. "'Is all safe, Monsieur Morel, and I think you will be satisfied on that head. "'But poor Captain Leclerc!' "'What happened to him?' asked the owner, with an air of considerable resignation. "'What happened to the worthy captain?' "'He died. "'Fell into the sea?' "'No, sir. He died of brain fever in dreadful agony. "'Then, turning to the crew, he said, "'Bear a hand there, to take in sail.' "'All hands obeyed, and at once the eight or ten seamen who composed the crew "'sprang to their respective stations at the spanker brails, and out haul top sail sheets and halyards, the jib down haul, and the top sail clue lines and bunt lines. The young sailor gave a look to see that his orders were promptly and accurately obeyed, and then turned again to the owner. And how did this misfortune occur? inquired the latter, resuming the interrupted conversation. Alas, sir, in the most unexpected manner. After a long talk with the harbour master, Captain Leclerc left Naples greatly disturbed in mind. In twenty-four hours he was attacked by a fever, and died three days afterwards. We performed the usual burial service, and he is at his rest, sewn up in his hammock with a thirty-six-pound shot at his head and his heels off El Giglio Island. We bring to his widow his sword and cross of honour. It was worth while, truly, added the young man with a melancholy smile, to make war against the English for ten years and to die in his bed at last, like everybody else. Why, you see, Edmund, 
replied the owner, who appeared more comforted at every moment. We are all mortal, and the old must wait way for the young. If not, there would be no promotion, and since you assure me that the cargo— is all safe and sound, Monsieur Morel, take my word for it, and I advise you not to take twenty-five thousand francs for the profits of the voyage. Then, as they were just passing the round tower, the young men shouted, Stand there to lower the topsails and jib, brail up the spanker. The order was executed as promptly as it would have been on board a man of war. Let go, and clue up! At this last command all the sails were lowered, and the vessel moved almost imperceptibly onwards. "'Now, if you will come on board, Monsieur Morel,' said Dantès, observing the owner's impatience, "'here is your supercargo, Monsieur Danglars, coming out of his cabin, who will furnish you with every particular. As for me, I must go look after the anchoring and dress the ship in mourning.' The owner did not wait for a second invitation. He seized a rope which Dantès flung to him and with an activity that would have done credit to a sailor, climbed up the side of the ship while the young man, going to his task, left the conversation to Danglars, who now came towards the owner. He was a man of twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, of unprepossessing countenance, obsequious to his superiors, insolent to his subordinates, and this, in addition to his position as responsible agent on board, which is always obnoxious to the sailors, made him as much disliked by the crew as Edmond Dantes was beloved by them. "'Well, Monsieur Morel,' said Danglars, "'you have heard of the misfortune that has befallen us.' "'Yes, yes, poor Captain Leclerc. He was a brave and honest man. A first-rate seaman, one who had seen long and honourable service, as became a man charged with the interests of a house so important as that of Morel and Son,' replied Danglars replied the owner, glancing after Dantes, who was watching the anchoring of his vessel. It seems to me that a sailor needs not be so old as you say, Danglars, to understand his business, for our friend Edmund seems to understand it thoroughly and not to require instruction from any one. Yes, said Danglars, darting at Edmund a look gleaming with hate. Yes, he is young, and youth is invariably self-confident. Scarcely was the captain's breath out of his body when he assumed the command without consulting any one, and he caused us to lose a day and a half at the island of Elba instead of making for Marseilles direct. "'As to taking command of the vessel,' replied Morel, "'that was his duty as captain's mate. As to losing a day and a half off the island of Elba, he was wrong unless the vessel needed repairs.' "'The vessel was in as good condition as I am, and—' as I hope you are, Monsieur Morel, and this day and a half was lost from pure whim for the pleasure of going ashore and nothing else. Dantes, said the shipowner, turning towards the young man, come this way. In a moment, sir, answered Dantes, and I'm with you. Then calling to the crew, he said, let go. The anchor was instantly dropped, and the chain rattling through the porthole. Dantes continued at his post in spite of the presence of the pilot, until this maneuver was completed, and then he added, Half-mast the colors and square the yards. You see, said Danglars, he fancies himself captain already, upon my word. And so, in fact, he is, said the owner. Except your signature and your partner's, Monsieur Morel. "'And why should he not have this?' asked the owner. "'He is young, it is true, but he seems to me a thorough seaman, and of full experience.' A cloud passed over Danglars' brow. "'Your pardon, Monsieur Morel,' said Dantes, approaching. "'The vessel now rides at anchor, and I am at your service. You held me, I think?' Danglars retreated a step or two. "'I wish to inquire why you stopped at the island of Elba.' "'I do not know, sir.' It was to fulfill the last instructions of Captain Leclerc, who, when dying, gave me a packet for Marshal Bertrand. Then did you see him, Edmund? Who? The Marshal. Oh, yes. Morel looked around him, and then, drawing Dantes on one side, he said suddenly, And how is the Emperor? Very well, as far as I could judge from the sight of him. You saw the Emperor, then? He entered the marshal's apartment while I was there. And you spoke to him? 
"'Why, it was he who spoke to me, sir,' said Dantes, with a smile. "'And what did he say to you?' "'Asked me questions about the vessel, the time she left Marseilles, the course she had taken, and what was her cargo. I believe if she had not been laden, and I had been her master, he would have bought her. But I told him I was only mate, and that she belonged to the firm of Morel and Son. "'Ah, yes,' he said, "'I know them. The Morels have been shipowners from father to son. And there was a Morel who served in the same regiment with me when I was in garrison at Valence.' "'Pardieu, and that is true,' cried the owner, greatly delighted. And that was Polacar Morel, my uncle, who was afterwards a captain. Dantes, you must tell my uncle that the emperor remembered him, and you will see, it will bring tears into the old soldier's eyes. Come, come, continued he, patting Edmund's shoulder kindly. You did very right, Dantes, to follow Captain Leclerc's instructions, and touch at Elba, although if it were known that you had conveyed a packet to the marshal, and had conversed with the emperor, it might bring you into trouble. How could that bring me into trouble, sir? asked Dantes, for I did not even know of what I was the bearer, and the emperor merely made such inquiries as he would of the first comer. But pardon me, here are the health officers and the customs inspectors come alongside. And the young man went to the gangway. As he departed, Danglars approached and said, Well, it appears that he has given you satisfactory reasons for his landing at Porto Ferrajo. Yes, most satisfactory, my dear Danglars. Well, so much the better," said the supercargo, for it is not pleasant to think that a comrade has not done his duty. Dantes has done his, replied the owner, and that is not saying much. It was Captain Leclerc who gave orders for this delay. Talking of Captain Leclerc, has not Dantes given you a letter from him? To me? No. Was there one? I believe that, besides the packet, Captain Leclerc confided a letter to his care. Of what packet are you speaking, Danglars? Why, that which Dantes left at Porto Ferrajo. How do you know he had a packet to leave at Porto Ferrajo? Danglars turned very red. I was passing close to the door of the captain's cabin, which was half open, and I saw him give the packet and letter to Dantes. He did not speak to me of it, replied the shipowner. But if there be any letter, he will give it to me." Danglars reflected for a moment. "'Then, Monsieur Morel, I beg of you,' said he, "'not to say a word to Dantes on the subject. I may have been mistaken.' At this moment the young man returned. Danglars withdrew. "'Well, my dear Dantes, are you now free?' inquired the owner. "'Yes, sir. You have not been long detained.' No, I gave the custom-house officers a copy of our bill of lading, and as to the other papers, they sent a man off with the pilot, to whom I gave them. Then you have nothing more to do here? No, everything is all right now. Then you can come and dine with me? I, I really must ask you to excuse me, Monsieur Morel. My first visit is due to my father, though I am not the less grateful for the honor you have done me. Right, Dantes, quite right. I always knew you were a good son. And, inquired Dantes, with some hesitation, do you know how my father is? Well, I believe, my dear Edmund, though I have not seen him lately. Yes, he likes to keep himself shut up in his little room. That proves, at least, that he has wanted for nothing during your absence. Dantes smiled. My father is proud, sir, and if he had not a meal left, I doubt he would have asked anything from any one except from heaven. Well, then, after this first visit has been made, we shall count on you. I must again excuse myself, Monsieur Morel, for after this first visit has been paid, I have another which I am most anxious to pay. True, Dantes, I forgot that there was at the Catalan someone who expects you no less impatiently than your father. The lovely Mercedes. Dantes blushed. Aha, said the shipowner, I am not in the least surprised, for she has been to me three times, inquiring if there were any news of the pharaon. Pest, Edmund, you have a very handsome mistress. She is not my mistress, replied the young sailor gravely. She is my betrothed. Sometimes one and the same thing, said Morel, with a smile. Not with us, sir, replied Dantes. Well, well, my dear Edmund, continued the owner. 
don't let me detain you. You have managed my affairs so well that I ought to allow you all the time you require for your own. Do you want any money? No, sir. I have all my pay to take. Nearly three months' wages. You are a careful fellow, Edmund. Say, I have a poor father, sir. Yes, yes, I know how good a son you are. Now hasten away to see your father. I have a son, too, and I should be very wroth with those who detained him from me after a three months' voyage. Then I have your leave, sir? Yes, if you have nothing more to say to me. Nothing. Captain Leclerc did not, before he died, give you a letter for me? He was unable to write, sir, but that reminds me that I must ask your leave of absence for some days. To get married? Yes, first, and then go to Paris. Very good. Have what time you require, Dantes. It will take quite six weeks to unload the cargo, and we cannot get you ready for sea until three months after that. Only be back again in three months for the Pharaon added the owner, patting the young sailor on the back. "'Cannot sail without her captain.' "'Without her captain!' cried Dantes, his eyes sparkling with animation. "'Pray mind what you say, for you are touching on the most secret wishes of my heart. Is it really your intention to make me captain of the Pharaon?' "'If I were sole owner, we'd shake hands on it now, my dear Dantes, and call it settled. But I have a partner, and you know the Italian proverb— Chi ha compagno ha padrone. He who has a partner has a master. But the thing is at least half done, as you have one out of two votes. Rely on me to procure you the other. I will do my best. Ah, Monsieur Morel, exclaimed the young seaman, with tears in his eyes and grasping the owner's hand. Monsieur Morel, I thank you in the name of my father and of Mercedes. That's all right, Edmund. There's a providence that watches over the deserving. Go to your father, go and see Mercedes, and afterwards come to me. Shall I row you ashore? No, thank you. I shall remain and look over the accounts with Danglars. Have you been satisfied with him this voyage? That is, according to the sense you attach to the question, sir. Do you mean, is he a good comrade? No, for I think he never liked me since the day when I was silly enough, after a little quarrel we had to propose to him to stop for ten minutes at the island of Monte Cristo to settle the dispute, a proposition which I was wrong to suggest, and he quite right to refuse. If you mean as responsible agent when you ask me the question, I believe there is nothing to say against him, and that you will be content with the way in which he has performed his duty. But tell me, Dantes, if you had command of the Pharaon, should you be glad to see Danglars remain? Captain or mate, Monsieur Morel, I shall always have the greatest respect for those who possess the owner's confidence. That's right, that's right, Dantes. I see you are a thoroughly good fellow, and will detain you no longer. Go, for I see how impatient you are. Then I have leave? Go, I tell you. May I have the use of your skiff? Certainly. Then for the present, Monsieur Morel, farewell, and a thousand thanks. I hope soon to see you again, my dear Edmund. Good luck to you. The young sailor jumped into the skiff and sat down in the stern sheets with the order that he be put ashore at La Canbière. The two oarsmen bent to their work, and the little boat glided away as rapidly as possible in the midst of the thousand vessels which choke up the narrow way which leads between the two rows of ships from the mouth of the harbour to the Quai d'Orléans. The shipowner, smiling, followed him with his eyes until he saw him spring out on the quay and disappeared in the midst of the throng which from five o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night swarms in the famous street of La Canbière, a street of which the modern Phocéans are so proud that they say with all the gravity in the world, and with that accent which gives so much character to what is said, if Paris had La Canbière, Paris would be a second Marseille. On turning round the owner saw Danglars behind him, apparently awaiting orders, but in reality also watching the young sailor but there was a great difference in the expression of the two men who thus followed the movements of Edmond Dantes. End of chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org The Count of Monte Cristo 
by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 2. Father and Son. As read by Gordon Mackenzie. We will leave Danglars, struggling with the demon of hatred, and endeavoring to insinuate in the ear of the shipowner some evil suspicions against his comrade, and follow Dantes, who, after having traversed Le Canabière, took the Rue de Noailles, and entering a small house on the left of the Allée de Mayenne, rapidly ascended four flights of a dark staircase, holding the baluster with one hand, while with the other he repressed the beatings of his heart, and paused before a half-open door, from which he could see the whole of a small room. The room was occupied by Dante's father. The news of the arrival of the Ferron had not yet reached the old man, who, mounted on a chair, was amusing himself by training with trembling hands the nasturtiums and sprays of clematis that clambered over the trellis at his window. Suddenly he felt an arm thrown around his body, and a well-known voice behind him exclaimed, Father! Dear Father! The old man uttered a cry and turned around. Then, seeing his son, he fell into his arms, pale and trembling. "'What ails you, my dearest father? Are you ill?' inquired the young man, much alarmed. "'No, no, my dear Edmund, my boy, my son, no, but I did not expect you, and joy, the surprise of seeing you so suddenly. Ah, I feel as if I were going to die.' "'Come, come, cheer up, my dear father. "'Tis I, really I. "'They say joy never hurts. "'And so I came to you without any warning. "'Come now, do smile instead of looking at me so solemnly. "'Here I am back again, and we are going to be happy. "'Yes, yes, my boy, so we will, so we will,' replied the old man. "'But how shall we be happy?' Shall you never leave me again? Come, tell me all the good fortune that has befallen you. God forgive me, said the young man, for rejoicing at happiness derived from the misery of others. But, heaven knows, I did not seek this good fortune. It has happened, and I really cannot pretend to lament it. The good Captain Leclerc is dead, father, and it is probable that, with the aid of Monsieur Morel, I shall have his place. Do you understand, father? Only imagine me, a captain, at twenty, with a hundred louis pay, and a share in the profits. Is this not more than a poor sailor like me could have hoped for? Yes, my dear boy, replied the old man. It is very fortunate. Well, then, with the first money I touch, I mean you to have a small house with a garden in which to plant clematis and nasturtiums and honeysuckle. But what ails you, father? Are you not well? Tis nothing, tis nothing. It will soon pass away. And as he said so, the old man's strength failed him, and he fell backwards. Come, come, said the young man. A glass of wine, father, will revive you. Where do you keep your wine? No, no thanks. You need not look for it. I do not want it, said the old man. Yes, yes, father, tell me where it is. He opened two or three cupboards. It is no use, said the old man. There is no wine. What? No wine? said Dantes, turning pale and looking alternately at the hollow cheeks of the old man and the empty cupboards. What? No wine? Have you wanted money, father? I want nothing now that I have you, said the old man. Yet, stammered Dantes, wiping the perspiration from his brow, yet I gave you two hundred francs when I left, three months ago. Yes, yes, Edmund, that is true. But you forgot at that time a little debt to our neighbor, Caderousse. 
He reminded me of it, telling me if I did not pay for you, he would be paid by Monsieur Morel. And so, you see, lest he might do you an injury. Well? Why, I paid him. But, cried Dantes, it was a hundred and forty francs I owed Caderousse. Yes, stammered the old man. And you paid him out of the two hundred francs I left you? The old man nodded. So that you have lived for three months on sixty francs? muttered Edmund. You know how little I require, said the old man. Heaven pardon me, cried Edmund, falling on his knees before his father. What are you doing? You have wounded me to the heart. Never mind it, for I see you once more, said the old man. And now it's all over. Everything is all right again. Yes, here I am, said the young man, with a promising future and a little money. Here, father, here, he said. Take this, take it, and send for something immediately. And he emptied his pockets on the table, the contents consisting of a dozen gold pieces, five or six five-franc pieces, and some smaller coin. The countenance of old Dante's brightened. Whom does this belong to? he inquired. To me, to you, to us. Take it, buy some provisions, be happy, and tomorrow we shall have more. Gently, gently, said the old man with a smile and by your leave I will use your purse moderately, for they would say if they saw me buy too many things at a time that I had been obliged to await your return in order to be able to purchase them. Do as you please, but first of all, pray have a servant, father. I will not have you left alone so long. I have some smuggled coffee and most capital tobacco in a small chest in the hold, which you shall have to-morrow. But hush, here comes somebody. Tis Caderousse, who has heard of your arrival, no doubt comes to congratulate you on your fortunate return. Ah, uh, lips that say one thing while the heart thinks another, murmured Edmund. But never mind, he is a neighbor who has done us a service on a time, so he's welcome. As Edmund paused, the black and bearded head of Caderousse appeared at the door. He was a man of twenty-five or six, and held a piece of cloth, which being a tailor, he was about to make into a coat lining. "'What, is it you, Edmund, back again?' said he with a broad Marseillaise accent, and a grin that displayed his ivory-white teeth. "'Yes, as you see, neighbor Caderousse, and ready to be agreeable to you in any and every way.' replied Dantes, but ill concealing his coldness under this cloak of civility. Thanks, thanks, but fortunately I do not want for anything, and it chances that at times there are others who have need of me. Dantes made a gesture. I do not allude to you, my boy. No, no, I lent you money and you returned it. That's like good neighbors, and we are quits. We are never quits with those who oblige us was Dante's reply, for when we do not owe them money, we owe them gratitude. Oh, what's the use of mentioning that? What is done is done. Let us talk of your happy return, my boy. I had gone on the quay to match a piece of mulberry cloth when I met friend Danglars. You at Marseilles? Yes, says he. I thought you were at Smyrna. I was, but am now back again. And where is the dear boy, our little Edmund? Why, with his father, no doubt, replied Danglars, and so I came, added Caderousse, as fast as I could to have the pleasure of shaking hands with a friend. Worthy Caderousse, said the old man, he is so much attached to us. <laughs> yes, to be sure I am. I love and esteem you because honest folks are so rare. 
"'But it seems you have come back rich, my boy,' continued the tailor, looking askance at the handful of gold and silver which Dantes had thrown on the table. The young man remarked the greedy glance which shone in the dark eyes of his neighbor. "'Eh,' he said negligently, "'this money is not mine. I was expressing to my father my fears that he had wanted many things in my absence, and to convince me he emptied his purse on the table. Come, father,' added Dantes, "'put this money back in your box, unless neighbor Caderousse wants anything, and in that case it is at his service.' "'No, my boy, no,' said Caderousse. "'I am not in any want. Thank God. My living is suited to my means.' "'Keep your money, keep it, I say. One never has too much. But at the same time, my boy, I am as much obliged by your offer as if I took advantage of it.' "'It was offered with good will,' said Dantes. "'No doubt, my boy, no doubt. Well, you stand well with Monsieur Morel, I hear, you insinuating dog, you.' "'Monsieur Morel has always been exceedingly kind to me,' replied Dantes. "'Then you were wrong to refuse to dine with him.' "'What? Did, did you refuse to dine with him?' said the old Dantes. "'And did he invite you to dine?' "'Yes, my dear father.' replied Edmund, smiling at his father's astonishment at the excessive honor paid to his son. "'And why did you refuse, my son?' inquired the old man. "'That I might the sooner see you again, my dear father,' replied the young man. "'I was most anxious to see you.' "'But it must have vexed Monsieur Morel, good worthy man,' said Caderousse. And when you are looking forward to be captain, it was wrong to annoy the owner. But I explained to him the cause of my refusal, replied Dantes, and I hope he fully understood it. Yes, but to be captain, one must do a little flattery to one's patrons. I hope to be captain without that, said Dantes. "'So much the better, so much the better. Nothing will give greater pleasure to all your old friends, and I know one down there behind the St. Nicholas Citadel who will not be sorry to hear it.' "'Mercedes?' said the old man. "'Yes, my dear father, and with your permission now I have seen you, and know you are well and have all you require. I will ask your consent to go and pay a visit.' to the Catalans. "'Go, my dear boy,' said old Dantes, "'and heaven bless you in your wife, as it has blessed me in my son.' "'His wife!' said Caderousse. "'Why, how fast you go on, Father Dantes! She is not his wife yet, as it seems to me.' "'So, but according to all probability, she soon will be,' replied Edmund. Oh, yes, yes, said Caderousse, but you are right to return as soon as possible, my boy. And why? Because Mercedes is a very fine girl, and fine girls never lack followers. She particularly has them by the dozens. Really, answered Edmund, with a smile which had in it traces of slight uneasiness. "'Ah, yes,' continued Caderousse, "'and with capital offers, too. "'But you know you will be captain, "'and who could refuse you then?' "'Meaning to say,' replied Dantes, "'with a smile which but ill concealed his trouble, "'that if I were not a captain.' "'Eh, eh,' said Caderousse, shaking his head. "'Come, come,' said the sailor. I have a better opinion than you of women in general, and of Mercedes in particular, and I am certain that, captain or not, she will remain ever faithful to me. Oh, so much the better, so much the better, said Caderousse. When one is going to be married, there is nothing like implicit confidence. But never mind that, my boy. Go and announce your arrival, and let her know all your hopes and prospects. I will go directly, was Edmund's reply, and embracing his father and nodding to Caderousse, he left the apartment. 
Caderousse lingered for a moment, then, taking leave of old Dante's, he went downstairs to rejoin Danglars, who awaited him at the corner of the Rue Senac. Well, said Danglars, did you see him? I have just left him, answered Caderousse. Did he allude to his hope of being captain? He spoke of it as a thing already decided. Indeed, said Danglars. He is in too much hurry, it appears to me. Why, it seems Monsieur Morel has promised him the thing. So that he is quite elated about it? Why, yes. He is actually insolent over the matter, has already offered me his patronage as if he were a grand personage, and proffered me a loan of money as though he were a banker. Which you refused? Most assuredly, although I might easily have accepted it, for it was I who put into his hands the first silver he ever earned. But now Monsieur Dantes has no longer any occasion for assistance he is about to become a captain. Pooh, said Danglars, he is not one yet. Ma foi, it will be as well if he is not, answered Caderousse. For if he should be, there will be really no speaking to him. If we choose, replied Danglars, he will remain what he is and perhaps become even less than he is. What do you mean? Nothing. I was speaking to myself. And is he still in love with a Catalane? Over head and ears, but unless I am much mistaken, there will be a storm in that quarter. Explain yourself. Why should I? It is more important than you think, perhaps. You do not like Dante's. I never like upstarts. Then tell me all you know about the Catalane. I know nothing for certain. Only I have seen things which induce me to believe, as I told you, that the future captain will find some annoyance in the vicinity of the Vallée Infirmerie. What have you seen? Come, tell me. Well, every time I have seen Mercedes come into the city, she has been accompanied by a tall, strapping, black-eyed Catalan, with a red complexion, brown skin, and fierce air, whom she calls Cousin. Really? And you think this Cousin pays her attentions? I only suppose so. What else can a strapping chap of twenty-one mean with a fine wench of seventeen? And you say that Dantes has gone to the Catalans? He went before I came down. Let us go the same way. We will stop at La Reserve, and we can drink a glass of La Malgue whilst we wait for news. Come along, said Caderousse, but you pay the score. Of course, replied Danglars, and going quickly to the designated place, they called for a bottle of wine and two glasses. Père Pamphile had seen Dante's pass not ten minutes before, and assured that he was at the Catalans, they sat down under the budding foliage of the plains and sycamores, in the branches of which the birds were singing their welcome to one of the first days of spring. End of chapter 2 Read by Gordon Mackenzie, in Troy, Michigan, October 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas As read by Gordon Mackenzie Chapter 3 The Catalans Beyond a bare, weather-worn wall, about a hundred paces from the spot where the two friends sat looking and listening as they drank their wine, was the village of the Catalans. Long ago this mysterious colony quitted Spain, and settled on the tongue of land on which it is to this day. Whence it came no one knew, 
and it spoke an unknown tongue. One of its chiefs, who understood Provençal, begged the commune of Marseilles to give them this bare and barren promontory, where, like the sailors of old, they had run their boats ashore. The request was granted, and three months afterwards, around the twelve or fifteen small vessels which had brought these gypsies of the sea, a small village sprang up. This village, constructed in a singular and picturesque manner, half Moorish, half Spanish, still remains, and is inhabited by descendants of the first comers, who speak the language of their fathers. For three or four centuries they have remained upon this small promontory, on which they had settled like a flight of seabirds, without mixing with the Marseillaise population, intermarrying, and preserving their original customs, and the costume of their mother country, as they have preserved its language. Our readers will follow us along the only street of this little village, and enter with us one of the houses, which is sunburned to the beautiful dead-leaf color peculiar to the buildings of the country, and within coated with whitewash, like a Spanish posada. A young and beautiful girl, with hair as black as jet, her eyes as velvety as the gazelle's, was leaning with her back against the wainscot, rubbing in her slender, delicately molded fingers a bunch of heath blossoms, the flowers of which she was picking off and strewing on the floor. Her arms, bare to the elbow, brown, and modeled after those of the Arlesian Venus, moved with a kind of restless impatience, and she tapped the earth with her arched and supple foot, so as to display the pure and full shape of her well-turned leg in its red cotton, gray and blue clocked stocking. At three paces from her, seated in a chair which he balanced on two legs, leaning his elbow on an old worm-eaten table, was a tall young man of twenty, or two and twenty, who was looking at her with an air in which vexation and uneasiness were mingled. He questioned her with his eyes, but the firm and steady gaze of the young girl controlled his look. "'You see, Mercedes,' said the young man, "'here is Easter. Come round again. Tell me, is this the moment for a wedding?' "'I have answered you a hundred times, Fernand, and really you must be very stupid to ask me again.' Well, repeat it, repeat it, I beg of you, that I may at last believe it. Tell me for the hundredth time that you refuse my love, which had your mother's sanction. Make me understand once for all that you are trifling with my happiness, that my life or death are nothing to you. Ah, to have dreamed for ten years of being your husband, Mercedes, and to lose that hope, which was the only stay of my existence. At least it was not I who ever encouraged you in that hope, Fernand, replied Mercedes. You cannot reproach me with the slightest coquetry. I have always said to you, I love you as a brother, but do not ask for me more than sisterly affection, for my heart is another's. Is not this true, Fernand? Yes, that is very true, Mercedes, replied the young man. Yes, you have been cruelly frank with me. But do you forget that it is among the Catalans a sacred law to intermarry? You mistake, Fernand. It is not a law, but merely a custom, and I pray of you, do not cite this custom in your favor. You are included in the conscription, Fernand, and are only at liberty on sufferance, liable at any moment to be called upon to take up arms. Once a soldier, what would you do with me, 
a poor orphan, forlorn, without fortune, with nothing but a half-ruined hut and a few ragged nets, the miserable inheritance left by my father to my mother, and by my mother to me. She has been dead a year. And you know, Fernand, I have subsisted almost entirely on public charity. Sometimes you pretend I am useful to you, and that is an excuse to share with me the produce of your fishing, and I accept it, Fernand, because you are the son of my father's brother, because we were brought up together, and still more because it would give you so much pain if I refuse. But I feel very deeply that this fish which I go and sell, and with the produce of which I buy the flax I spin, I feel very keenly, Fernand, that this is charity. And if it were, Mercedes, poor and lone as you are, you suit me as well as the daughter of the first ship-owner or the richest banker of Marseilles. What do such as we desire but a good wife and careful housekeeper? And where can I look for these better than in you? Fernand, answered Mercedes, shaking her head, a woman becomes a bad manager, and who shall say she will remain an honest woman when she loves another man better than her husband? Rest content with my friendship, for I say once more, that is all I can promise, and I will promise no more than I can bestow. I understand, replied Fernand. You can endure your own wretchedness patiently, but you are afraid to share mine. Well, Mercedes, beloved by you, I would tempt fortune. You would bring me good luck, and I should become rich. I could extend my occupation as a fisherman, might get a place as clerk in a warehouse, and become, in time, a dealer myself. You could do no such thing, Fernand. You are a soldier, and if you remain at the Catalans, it is because there is no war. So remain a fisherman and contented with my friendship, as I cannot give you more. Well, I will do better, Mercedes. I will be a sailor. Instead of the costume of our fathers, which you despise, I will wear a varnished hat, a striped shirt, and a blue jacket with an anchor on the buttons. Would not that dress please you? What do you mean? asked Mercedes with an angry glance. What do you mean? I do not understand you. I mean, Mercedes, that you are thus harsh and cruel with me because you are expecting someone who is thus attired. But perhaps he whom you await is inconstant, or if he is not, the sea is so to him. Fernand, cried Mercedes, I believed you were good-hearted, and I was mistaken. Fernand, you are wicked to call to your aid jealousy and the anger of God. Yes, I will not deny it. I do await, and I do love him of whom you speak. And if he does not return, instead of accusing him of the inconstancy which you insinuate, I will tell you that he died loving me, and me only. The young girl made a gesture of rage. I understand you, Fernand. You would be revenged on him because I do not love you. You would cross your Catalan knife with his dirk. What end would that answer? To lose you my friendship if he were conquered, and see that friendship changed into hate if you were victor. Believe me, to seek a quarrel with a man is a bad method of pleasing the woman who loves that man. No, Fernand, you will not thus give away to evil thoughts. Unable to have me for your wife, you will content yourself with having me for your friend and sister. And besides, she added, her eyes troubled and moistened with tears. Wait, 
Wait, Fernand. You said just now that the sea was treacherous, and he has been gone four months, and during these four months there have been some terrible storms. Fernand made no reply, nor did he attempt to check the tears which flowed down the cheeks of Mercedes, although for each of those tears he would have shed his heart's blood. But these tears flowed for another. He arose, paced a while up and down the hut, and then suddenly stopping before Mercedes, with his eyes glowing and his hands clinched. Say, Mercedes, he said, once for all, is this your final determination? I love Edmund Dantes, the young girl calmly replied, and none but Edmund shall ever be my husband. And you will always love him as long as I live. Fernand let fall his head like a defeated man, heaved a sigh that was like a groan, and then suddenly looked her full in the face with clinched teeth and expanded nostrils, said, But if he is dead, if he is dead, I shall die too. If he has forgotten you. Mercedes! called a joyous voice from without. Mercedes! Ah! exclaimed the young girl, blushing with delight, and fairly leaping in excess of love. You see, he has not forgotten me, for here he is! And rushing towards the door, she opened it, saying, Here, Edmund, here I am! Fernand, pale and trembling, drew back, like a traveller at the sight of a serpent, and fell into a chair beside him. Edmund and Mercedes were clasped in each other's arms. The burning Marseille sun, which shot into the room through the open door, covered them with a flood of light. At first they saw nothing around them. Their intense happiness isolated them from all the rest of the world, and they only spoke in broken words, which are the tokens of a joy so extreme that they seem rather the expression of sorrow. Suddenly Edmund saw the gloomy, pale, and threatening countenance of Fernand, as it was defined in the shadows. By a movement for which he could scarcely account to himself, the young Catalan placed his hand on the knife at his belt. "'Ah, your pardon,' said Dantes, frowning in his turn. "'I did not perceive that there were three of us.' Then, turning to Mercedes, he inquired, "'Who is this gentleman?' "'One who will be your best friend, Dantes, for he is my friend, my cousin, my brother. It is Fernand.' the man whom, after you, Edmund, I love the best in the world. Do you not remember him? Yes, said Dantes, and without relinquishing Mercedes' hand, clasped in one of his own, he extended the other to the Catalan with a cordial air. But Fernand, instead of responding to this amiable gesture, remained mute and trembling. Edmund then cast his eyes scrutinizingly at the agitated and embarrassed Mercedes, and then again on the gloomy and menacing Fernand. This look told him all, and his anger waxed hot. I did not know when I came with such haste to you that I was to meet an enemy here. An enemy? cried Mercedes with an angry look at her cousin. An enemy in my house, do you say, Edmund? If I believed that, I would place my arm under yours and go with you to Marseilles, leaving the house to return to it no more. Fernand's eye darted lightning. And should any misfortune occur to you, dear Edmund, she continued with the same calmness which proved to Fernand that the young girl had read the very innermost depths of his sinister thought. 
if misfortune should occur to you, I would ascend the highest point of the Cape de Morgion and cast myself headlong from it. Fernand became deadly pale. But you are deceived, Edmund, she continued. You have no enemy here. There is no one but Fernand, my brother, who will grasp your hand as a devoted friend. And at these words the young girl fixed her imperious look on the Catalan, who, as if fascinated by it, came slowly towards Edmund and offered him his hand. His hatred, like a powerless though furious wave, was broken against the strong ascendancy which Mercedes exercised over him. Scarcely, however, had he touched Edmund's hand than he felt he had done all he could do, and he rushed hastily out of the house. Oh! he exclaimed, running furiously and tearing at his hair. Oh, who will deliver me from this man? Wretched, wretched that I am! Hello, Catalan! Hello, Fernand! Where are you running to? exclaimed a voice. The young man stopped suddenly, looked around him, and perceived Caderousse sitting at table with Danglars under an arbor. Well, said Caderousse, why don't you come? Are you really in such a hurry that you have no time to pass the time of day with your friends? Particularly when they have still a full bottle before them, added Danglars. Fernand looked at them both with a stupefied air, but did not say a word. He seems besotted, said Danglars, pushing Caderousse with his knee. Are we mistaken, and is Dante's triumphant in spite of all we have believed? Why, we must inquire into that, was Caderousse's reply. And turning towards the young man said, Well, Catalan, can't you make up your mind? Fernand wiped away the perspiration steaming from his brow, and slowly entered the arbor, whose shade seemed to restore somewhat of calmness to his senses, and whose coolness somewhat of refreshment to his exhausted body. "'Good day,' said he. "'You called me, didn't you?' And he fell, rather than sat down, on one of the seats which surrounded the table. I called you because you were running like a madman, and I was afraid you would throw yourself into the sea," said Caderousse, laughing. Why, when a man has friends, they are not only to offer him a glass of wine, but, moreover, to prevent his swallowing three or four pints of water unnecessarily. Fernand gave a groan, which resembled a sob, and dropped his head into his hands, his elbows leaning on the table. Well, Fernand, I must say, said Caderousse, beginning the conversation with that brutality of the common people in which curiosity destroys all diplomacy. You look uncommonly like a rejected lover. And he burst into a hoarse laugh. Bah! said Danglars. A lad of his make was not born to be unhappy in love. You are laughing at him, Caderousse. No, he replied. Only hark how he sighs. Come, come, Fernand, said Caderousse. Hold up your head and answer us. It's not polite not to reply to your friends who ask news of your health. My health is well enough, said Fernand, clenching his hands without raising his head. Ah, you see, Danglars, said Caderousse, winking at his friend. This is how it is. Fernand, whom you see here is a good and brave Catalan, one of the best fishermen in Marseilles, and he is in love with a very fine girl named Mercedes. But it appears, unfortunately, that the girl is in love with the mate of the Ferron. And as the Ferron arrived today, why, you understand. No, I don't understand, said Danglars. Poor Fernand has been dismissed, continued Caderousse. Well, 
"'And what then?' said Fernand, lifting up his head and looking at Caderousse like a man who looks for someone on whom to vent his anger. "'Mercedes is not accountable to any person, is she? Is she not free to love whomever she will?' Oh, if you take it in that sense, said Caderousse, it is another thing. But I thought you were a Catalan, and they told me the Catalans were not men to allow themselves to be supplanted by a rival. It was even told me that Fernand, especially, was terrible in his vengeance. Fernand smiled piteously. A lover is never terrible, he said. Poor fellow, remarked Danglars, affecting to pity the young man from the bottom of his heart. Why, you see, he did not expect to see Dante's return so suddenly. He thought he was dead, perhaps, or perchance faithless. These things always come on us more severely when they come suddenly. Ah, ma foi, under any circumstances, said Caderousse who drank as he spoke, and on whom the fumes of the wine began to take effect. Under any circumstances, Fernand is not the only person put out by the fortunate arrival of Dante's, is he, Danglars? No, you're right. And I should say that would bring him ill luck. Well, never mind, answered Caderousse, pouring out a glass of wine for Fernand and filling his own for the eighth or ninth time while Danglars had merely sipped his. Never mind. In the meantime, he marries Mercedes, the lovely Mercedes. At least he returns to do that. During this time, Danglars fixed his piercing glance on the young man, on whose heart Caderousse's words fell like molten lead. And when is the wedding to be? he asked. Oh, it is not yet fixed murmured Fernand. No, but it will be, said Caderousse, as surely as Dante's will be captain of the Ferron, eh, Danglars? Danglars shuddered at this unexpected attack and turned to Caderousse, whose countenance he scrutinized to try and detect whether the blow was premeditated. But he read nothing but envy in a countenance already rendered brutal and stupid by drunkenness. Well, said he, filling up the glasses, let us drink to Captain Edmond Dantes, husband of the beautiful Cataline. Caderousse raised his glass to his mouth with unsteady hand and swallowed the contents at a gulp. Fernand dashed his own on the ground. Eh, eh, stammered Caderousse. What do I see down there by the wall in the direction of the Catalans? Look, Fernand, your eyes are better than mine. I believe I see double. You know wine is a deceiver, but I should say it was two lovers walking side by side and hand in hand. Heaven forgive me, they do not know what we can see them, and they are actually embracing. Danglars did not lose one pang that Fernand endured. Do you know them, Fernand? he said. Yes, was the reply in a low voice. It is Edmund and Mercedes. Ah, see there now, said Caderousse, and I did not recognize them. Hello, Dantes, hello, lovely damsel. Come this way and let us know when the wedding is to be, for Fernand here is so obstinate he will not tell us. Hold your tongue, will you? said Danglars, pretending to restrain Caderousse, who, with the tenacity of drunkards, leaned out of the arbor. Try to stand upright and let the lovers make love without interruption. Look at Fernand and follow his example. He is well behaved. Fernand, probably excited beyond bearing, pricked by Danglars, as the bull is by the bandileros, was about to rush out for he had risen from his seat and seemed to be collecting himself to dash headlong upon his rival, when Mercedes, smiling and graceful, lifted up her lovely head and looked at them 
with her clear and bright eyes. At this Fernand recollected her threat of dying if Edmund died, and dropped again heavily on his seat. Danglars looked at the two men, one after the other, the one brutalized by liquor, the other overwhelmed with love. "'I shall get nothing from these fools,' he muttered, "'and I am very much afraid of being here between a drunkard and a coward. He's an envious fellow making himself boozy on wine when he ought to be nursing his wrath, and here is a fool who sees the woman he loves stolen from under his nose and takes on like a big baby. Yet this Catalan has eyes that glisten like those of the vengeful Spaniards, Sicilians, and Calabrians, and the other has fists big enough to crush an ox at one blow. Unquestionably Edmund Starr is in the ascendant, and he will marry the splendid girl, and he will be captain too, and laugh at us all, unless— A sinister smile passed over Danglars' lips. Unless I take a hand in the affair, he added. Hello, continued Caderousse, half rising with his fist on the table. Hello, Edmund! Do you not see your friends, or are you too proud to speak to them? No, my dear fellow, replied Dantes. I am not proud, but I am happy, and happiness blinds, I think, more than pride. Ah, very well, that's an explanation, said Caderousse. How do you do, Madame Dantes? Mercedes curtsied gravely and said, that is not my name, and in my country it bodes ill fortune, they say, to call a young girl by the name of her betrothed before he becomes her husband. So call me Mercedes, if you please. We must excuse our worthy neighbor Caderousse, said Dantes. He is so easily mistaken. So, then, the wedding is to take place immediately, Monsieur Dantes, said Danglars, bowing to the young couple. As soon as possible, Monsieur Danglars. Today all preliminaries will be arranged at my father's, and tomorrow, or next day at latest, the wedding festival here at La Reserve. My friends will be there, I hope. That is to say, you are invited, Monsieur Danglars, and you, Caderousse. <laughs> and Fernand, said Caderousse with a chuckle, Fernand, too, is invited. My wife's brother is my brother said Edmund. And we, Mercedes and I, should be very sorry if he were absent at such a time. Fernand opened his mouth to reply, but his voice died on his lips, and he could not utter a word. Today the preliminaries, tomorrow or next day the ceremony, you are in a hurry, Captain. Danglars, said Edmund, smiling, I will say to you, as Mercedes said just now to Caderousse, Do not give me a title which does not belong to me. That may bring me bad luck. Your pardon, replied Danglars. I merely said you seemed in a hurry, and we have lots of time. The Ferron cannot be under way again in less than three months. We are always in a hurry to be happy, Monsieur Danglars, for when we have suffered a long time, we have great difficulty in believing in good fortune. But it is not selfishness alone that makes me thus in haste. I must go to Paris. Ah, oh, really? To Paris? And will it be the first time you have ever been there, Dantes? Yes. Have you business there? Not of my own. The last commission of poor Captain Leclerc. You know to what I allude, Danglars. It is sacred. Besides, I shall only take the time to go and return. Yes, yes, I understand, said Danglars, and then in a low tone he added, To Paris, no doubt to deliver the letter which the Grand Marshal gave him. Ah. This letter gives me an idea. Ah, Dante's my friend. 
You are not yet registered number one on board the good ship Ferron. Then turning towards Edmund, who was walking away, A pleasant journey, he cried. Thank you, said Edmund with a friendly nod, and the two lovers continued on their way, as calm and joyous as if they were the very elect of heaven. End of chapter 3 As read by Gordon Mackenzie Troy, Michigan October 2006This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, as read by Gordon Mackenzie. Chapter 4 Conspiracy Danglars followed Edmund and Mercedes with his eyes until the two lovers disappeared behind one of the angles of Fort St. Nicholas. Then, turning round, he perceived Fernand, who had fallen pale and trembling into his chair, while Caderousse stammered out the words of a drinking song. "'Well, my dear sir,' said Danglars to Fernand, "'here is a marriage which does not appear to make everybody happy.' "'It drives me to despair,' said Fernand. Do you, then, love Mercedes? I adore her. For long, as long as I have known her, always. And you sit there, tearing your hair instead of seeking to remedy your condition. I did not think that was the way of your people. What would you have me do? said Fernand. How do I know? Is it my affair? I am not in love with Mademoiselle Mercedes. But for you, in the words of the Gospel, seek and you shall find. I have found already. What? I would stab the man, but the woman told me that if any misfortune happened to her betrothed she would kill herself. Pooh! Women say those things, but never do them. You do not know Mercedes. What she threatens, she will do. Idiot, muttered Danglars. Whether she kill herself or not, what matter, provided Dantes is not captain? Before Mercedes should die, replied Fernand, with the accents of unshaken resolution, I would die myself. "'That's what I call love,' said Caderousse, with a voice more tipsy than ever. "'That's love, or I don't know what love is.' "'Come,' said Danglars. "'You appear to me a good sort of fellow, and hang me, I should like to help you, but—' "'Yes,' said Caderousse. "'But how?' "'My dear fellow,' replied Danglars. You are three parts drunk. Finish the bottle, and you will be completely so. Drink, then, and do not meddle with what we are discussing, for that requires all one's wit and cool judgment. I? Drunk? said Caderousse. Well, that's a good one. I could drink four more such bottles. They are no bigger than cologne flasks. Père Pomphile, more wine! and Caderousse rattled his glass upon the table. "'You were saying, sir,' said Fernand, awaiting with great anxiety the end of this interrupted remark. Uh, "'What was I saying? I forget. This drunken Caderousse has made me lose the thread of my sentence.' "'Drunk if you like. So much the worse for those who fear wine, for it is because they have bad thoughts which they are afraid the liquor will extract from their hearts. And Caderousse began to sing the two last lines of a song very popular at the time. Tous les méchants sont buveux d'eau, c'est bien prouve par la déluge. 
The wicked are great drinkers of water, as the flood proved once for all. You said, sir, you would like to help me, but... Yes, but I added, to help you it would be sufficient that Dantes did not marry her you love, and the marriage may easily be thwarted, methinks, and yet Dantes need not die. Death alone can separate them, remarked Fernand. You talk like a noodle, my friend, said Caderousse. And here is Danglars, who is a wide-awake, clever, deep fellow who will prove to you that you are wrong. Prove it, Danglars. I have answered for you. Say there is no need why Dante should die. It would indeed be a pity he should. Dante's is a good fellow. I like Dante's. Dante's, your health. Fernand rose impatiently. Let him run on said Danglars, restraining the young man. Drunk as he is, he is not much out in what he says. Absence severs as well as death, and if the walls of a prison were between Edmund and Mercedes, they would be as effectually separated as if he lay under a tombstone. Yes, but one gets out of prison, said Caderousse, who, with what sense was left him, listened eagerly to the conversation. And when one gets out and one's name is Edmond Dantes, one seeks revenge. What matters that? muttered Fernand. And why, I should like to know, persisted Caderousse. Should they put Dantes in prison? He has not robbed or killed or murdered. Hold your tongue, said Danglars. I won't hold my tongue, replied Caderousse. I say I want to know why they should put Dantes in prison. I like Dantes. Dantes, your health. And he swallowed another glass of wine. Danglars saw in the muddled look of the tailor the progress of his intoxication, and turning towards Fernand said, Well, you understand there is no need to kill him. Certainly not, if, as you said just now, you have the means of having Dante's arrested. Have you that means? It is to be found for the searching. But why should I meddle in the matter? It is no affair of mine. I know not why you meddle, said Fernand, seizing his arm. But this I know. You have some motive of personal hatred against Dante's. For he who himself hates is never mistaken in the sentiment of others. I! Motives of hatred against Dante's? None on my word. I saw you were unhappy, and your unhappiness interested me, that's all. But since you believe I act for my own account, adieu, my dear friend. Get out of the affair as best you may and Danglars rose as if he meant to depart. "'No, no,' said Fernand, restraining him. "'Stay. It is of very little consequence to me at the end of the matter whether you have any angry feeling or not against Dantes. I hate him. I confess it openly. Do you find the means I will execute it? Provided it is not to kill the man, for Mercedes has declared she will kill herself if Dantes is killed.' Caderousse, who had let his head drop to the table, now raised it, and looking at Fernand with his dull and fishy eyes, he said, "'Kill Dantes! Who talks of killing Dantes? I won't have him killed! I won't! He's my friend, and this morning offered to share his money with me as I shared mine with him. I won't have Dante's killed. I won't. And who said a word about killing him, muddlehead? replied Danglars. We were merely joking. Drink to his health, he added, filling Caderousse's glass, and do not interfere with us. Yes, yes, Dante's good health, said Caderousse, emptying his glass. Here 
cares to his health. His health! Hurrah! But the means, the means, said Fernand. Have you not hit upon any? asked Danglars. No, you undertook to do so. True, replied Danglars. The French have the superiority over the Spaniards, that the Spaniards ruminate, while the French invent. Do you invent, then? said Fernand impatiently. Waiter, said Danglars, pen, ink, and paper. Pen, ink, and paper, muttered Fernand. Yes, I am a supercargo. Pen, ink, and paper are my tools, and without my tools I am fit for nothing. Pen, ink, and paper, then, called Fernand loudly. There's what you want on that table, said the waiter. Bring them here. The waiter did as he was desired. When one thinks, said Caderousse, letting his hand drop on the paper, there is here wherewithal to kill a man more sure than if we waited at the corner of a wood to assassinate him. I have always had more dread of a pen a bottle of ink and a sheet of paper than of a sword or a pistol. The fellow is not so drunk as he appears to be, said Danglars. Give him some more wine, Fernand. Fernand filled Caderousse's glass, who, like the confirmed topper he was, lifted his hand from the paper and seized the glass. The Catalan watched him until Caderousse, almost overcome by this fresh assault on his senses, rested, or rather dropped, his glass upon the table. "'Well,' resumed the Catalan, as he saw the final glimmer of Caderousse's reason vanishing before the last glass of wine. "'Well, then, I should say, for instance,' resumed Danglars, "'that if after a voyage such as Dante's has just made, in which he touched at the island of Elba, someone were to denounce him to the king's procurer as a Bonapartist agent. I will denounce him, exclaimed the young man hastily. Yes, but they will make you then sign your declaration and confront you with him you have denounced. I will supply you with the means of supporting your accusation, for I know the fact well. But Dantes cannot remain forever in prison, and one day or other he will leave it, and the day when he comes out, woe betide him who was the cause of his incarceration. Oh, I should like nothing better than he would come and seek a quarrel with me. Yes? And Mercedes, Mercedes, who will detest you if you have only the misfortune to scratch the skin of her dearly beloved Edmund? True, said Fernand. No, no, continued Danglars. If we resolve on such a step, it would be much better to take, as I now do, this pen, dip it into this ink, and write with the left hand, that the writing may not be recognized, the denunciation we propose. And Danglars, uniting practice with theory, wrote with his left hand, and in a writing reversed from his usual style, and totally unlike it, the following lines which he handed to Fernand, and which Fernand read in an undertone. The Honorable, the King's Attorney, is informed by a friend of the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, mate of the ship Ferron, arrived this morning from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been entrusted by Murat with a letter for the usurper, and by the usurper with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee in Paris. Proof of this crime will be found on arresting him, for the letter will be found upon him, or at his father's, or in his cabin on board the Ferron. Very good, 
resumed Danglars. Now your revenge looks like common sense, for in no way can it revert to yourself, and the matter will thus work its own way. There is nothing to do now, but fold the letter as I am doing, and write upon it to the king's attorney. And that's all settled. And Danglars wrote the address as he spoke. "'Yes, that's all settled!' exclaimed Caderousse, who, by a last effort of intellect, had followed the reading of the letter and instinctively comprehended all the misery which such a denunciation must entail. "'Yes, and that's all settled. Only it will be an infamous shame!' And he stretched out his hand to reach the letter. "'Yes,' said Danglars, taking it from beyond his reach. And as what I say and do is merely in jest, and I, amongst the first and foremost, should be sorry if anything happened to Dantes, the worthy Dantes. Look here, and taking the letter he squeezed it up in his hands and threw it into a corner of the arbor. All right, said Caderousse. Dantes is my friend, and I won't have him ill-used. And who thinks of using him ill? Certainly neither I nor Fernand, said Danglars, rising and looking at the young man who still remained seated, but whose eye was fixed on the denunciatory sheet of paper flung into the corner. In this case, replied Caderousse, Let's have some more wine. I wish to drink to the health of Edmund and the lovely Mercedes. You have had too much already, drunkard, said Danglars. And if you continue, you will be compelled to sleep here, because unable to stand on your own legs. I? said Caderousse, rising with all the offended dignity of a drunken man. I can't keep my own legs. Why, I'll wager I can go up into the belfry of the Akuls, and without staggering, too. Done, said Danglars. I'll take your bet, but tomorrow. Today it is time to return. Give me your arm and let us go. Very well, let us go, said Caderousse. I don't want your arm at all. Come, Fernand, won't you return to Marseilles with us? No, said Fernand. I shall return to the Catalans. You are wrong. Come with us to Marseilles. Come along. I will not. What do you mean you will not? Well, just as you like, my prince. There's liberty for all the world. Come along, Danglars, and let the young gentleman return to the Catalans if he chooses. Danglars took advantage of Caderousse's temper at the moment to take him off toward Marseilles by the Porte Saint-Victor, staggering as he went. When they had advanced about twenty yards, Danglars looked back and saw Fernand stoop, pick up the crumpled paper, and putting it into his pocket, then rush out of the arbor towards Pilon. Well, said Caderousse, why, uh, what a lie he told. He said he was going to the Catalans, and he's going to the city. Hello, Fernand! No, you don't see straight, said Danglars. He's gone right enough. Well, said Caderousse, I should have said not. How treacherous wine is. Come, come said Danglars to himself. Now the thing is at work, and it will affect its purpose unassisted. End of chapter 4 As read by Gordon Mackenzie Troy, Michigan, October 2006
Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, January 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 5 The Marriage Feast. The morning's sun rose clear and resplendent, touching the foamy waves into a network of ruby tinted light. The feast had been made ready on the second floor at La Reserve, with whose arbor the reader is already familiar. The apartment destined for the purpose was spacious and lighted by a number of windows, over each of which was written in golden letters, for some inexplicable reason, the name of one of the principal cities of France. Beneath these windows a wooden balcony extended the entire length of the house, and although the entertainment was fixed for twelve o'clock, an hour previous to that time, the balcony was filled with impatient and expectant guests, consisting of the favored part of the crew of the Pharaon, and other personal friends of the bridegroom, the whole of whom had arrayed themselves in their choicest costumes in order to do greater honor to the occasion. Various rumors were afloat to the effect that the owners of the Pharaon had promised to attend the nuptial feast, but all seemed unanimous in doubting that an act of such rare and exceeding condensation could possibly be intended. Danglars, however, who now made his appearance, accompanied by Caderousse, effectually confirmed the report, stating that he had recently conversed with Monsieur Morel, who had himself assured him of his intention to dine at La Reserve. In fact, a moment later M. Morel appeared, and was saluted with an enthusiastic burst of applause from the crew of the Ferron, who hailed the visit of the shipowner as a sure indication that the man whose wedding feast he thus delighted to honor would ere long be first in command of the ship. And as Dantes was universally beloved on board his vessel, the sailors put no restraint on their tumultuous joy at finding that the opinion and choice of their superiors so exactly coincided with their own. With the entrance of Monsieur Morel, Donglers and Caderousse were dispatched in search of the bridegroom, to convey to him the intelligence of the arrival of the important personage, whose coming had created such a lively sensation, and to beseech him to make haste. Donglers and Caderousse set off upon their errand at full speed, but ere they had gone many steps they perceived a group advancing towards them, composed of the betrothed pair, a party of young girls in attendance on the bride, by whose side walked Dante's father, the whole brought up by Fernand, whose lips wore their usual sinister smile. Neither Mercedes nor Edmund observed the strange expression of his countenance. They were so happy that they were conscious only of the sunshine and the presence of each other. Having acquitted themselves of their errand, and exchanged a hearty shake of the hand with Edmund, Donglers and Caderousse took their places behind Fernand and old Dantes, the latter of whom attracted universal notice. The old man was attired in a suit of glistening watered silk, trimmed with steel buttons, beautifully cut and polished. His thin but wiry legs were arrayed in a pair of richly embroidered clocked stockings, evidently of English manufacture, while from his three-cornered hat depended a long streaming knot of white and blue ribbons. Thus he came along, supporting himself on a curiously carved stick, his aged countenance lit up with happiness, looking for all the world like one of the aged dandies of 1796, parading the newly opened gardens of the Tuileries and Luxembourg. Beside him glided Caderousse, whose desire to partake of the good things provided for the wedding party had induced him to become reconciled to the Dantes, father and son, although they still lingered in his mind a faint and unperfect recollection of the events of the preceding night, just as the brain retains on waking in the morning the dim and misty outline of a dream. As Danglars approached the disappointed lover, he cast on him a look of deep meaning, while Fernand, as he slowly paced behind the happy pair, who seemed, in their own unmixed content, to have entirely forgotten that such a being as himself existed, was pale and abstracted. Occasionally, however, a deep flush would overspread his countenance, and a nervous contraction distort his features, while, with an agitated and restless gaze, he would glance in the direction of Marseilles, like one who either anticipated to foresee some great and important event. Dantes himself was simply but becomingly clad in the dress peculiar to the merchant service, a costume somewhat between a military and a civil garb, 
with his fine countenance radiant with joy and happiness, a more perfect specimen of manly beauty could scarcely be imagined. Lovely as the Greek girls of Cyprus or Chios, Mercedes boasted the same bright flashing eyes of jet and ripe round coral lips. She moved with the light, free step of an Arlesienne or an Andalusian. One more practiced in the art of great cities would have hid her blushes beneath a veil, or at least have cast down her thickly fringed lashes so as to have concealed the liquid luster of her animated eyes. But on the contrary, the delighted girl looked round her with a smile that seemed to say, If you are my friends, rejoice with me, for I am very happy. As soon as the bridal party came in sight of La Reserve, Monsieur Morel descended and came forth to meet it, followed by the soldiers and sailors there assembled, to whom he had repeated the promise already given that Dantes should be the successor of the late Captain Leclerc. Edmund, at the approach of his patron, respectfully placed the arm of his affianced bride within that of Monsieur Morel, who, forthwith, conducting her up the flight of wooden steps leading to the chamber in which the feast was prepared, was gaily followed by the guests, beneath whose heavy tread the slight structure creaked and groaned for the space of several minutes. "'Father,' said Mercedes, stopping when she had reached the center of the table, "'sit, I pray you, on my right hand.' On my left, I will place him who has ever been as a brother to me, pointing with a soft and gentle smile to Fernand, but her words and look seemed to inflict the direst torture on him, for his lips became ghastly pale, and even beneath the dark hue of his complexion the blood might be seen retreating as though some sudden pang drove it back to the heart. During this time, Dantes, at the opposite side of the table, had been occupied in similarly placing his own honored guests. M. Morel was seated at his right hand, Dangleres at his left, while, at a sign from Edmund, the rest of the company ranged themselves as they found it most agreeable. Then they began to pass around the dusky piquant Arlesian sausages and lobsters in their dazzling red cuirasses, prawns of large size and brilliant color, the echinus with its prickly outside and dainty morsel within, the clovis, esteemed by the epicures of the South as more than rivaling the exquisite flavor of the oyster, all the delicacies, in fact, that are cast up by the wash of waters on the sandy beach, and styled by the grateful fishermen fruits of the sea. "'A pretty silence, truly,' said the old father of the bridegroom, as he carried to his lips a glass of wine of the hue and brightness of the topaz, and which had just been placed before Mercedes herself." Now would anybody think that this room contained a happy, merry party, who desire nothing better than to laugh and dance the hours away? Ah, sighed Caderousse, a man cannot always feel happy because he is about to be married. The truth is, replied Dantes, that I am too happy for noisy mirth. If that is what you meant by your observation, my worthy friend, you are right. Joy takes a strange effect at times. It seems to oppress us almost the same as sorrow. Danglars looked towards Fernand, whose excitable nature received and betrayed each fresh impression. "'Why, what ails you?' asked he of Edmund. "'Do you fear any approaching evil? I should say that you were the happiest man alive at this instant.' "'And that is the very thing that alarms me,' returned Dantes. "'Man does not appear to me to be intended to enjoy felicity so unmixed.' Happiness is like the enchanted palaces we read of in our childhood, where fierce, fiery dragons defend the entrance and approach, and monsters of all shapes and kinds requiring to be overcome ere victory is ours. I own that I am lost in wonder to find myself promoted to an honor of which I feel myself unworthy, that of being the husband of Mercedes. "'Nay, nay!' cried Caderousse, smiling. "'You have not attained that honor yet. "'Mercedes is not yet your wife. "'Just assume the tone and manner of a husband, "'and see how she will remind you "'that your hour is not yet come.' "'The bride blushed, while Fernand, restless and uneasy, "'seemed to start at every fresh sound, "'and from time to time wiped away "'the large drops of perspiration that gathered on his brow.' "'Well, never mind that, neighbor Caderousse. "'It is not worth while to contradict me for such a trifle as that. "'Tis true that Mercedes is not actually my wife, but,' added he, drawing out his watch, "'in an hour and a half she will be.' 
A general exclamation of surprise ran around the table, with the exception of the elder Dantes, whose laugh displayed the still perfect beauty of his large white teeth. Mercedes looked pleased and gratified, while Fernand grasped the handle of his knife with a convulsive clutch. "'In an hour?' inquired Danglars, turning pale. "'How is that, my friend?' "'Why, thus it is,' replied Dantes. "'Thanks to the influence of Monsieur Morel, to whom, next to my father, I owe every blessing I enjoy, every difficulty has been removed. We have purchased permission to waive the usual delay, and at half-past two o'clock the mayor of Marseilles will be waiting for us at the city hall. Now, as a quarter-past one has already struck, I do not consider I have asserted too much in saying that, in another hour and thirty minutes, Mercedes will have become Madame Dantes.' Fernand closed his eyes, a burning sensation passed across his brow, and he was compelled to support himself by the table to prevent his falling from his chair. But in spite of all his efforts, he could not refrain from uttering a deep groan, which, however, was lost amid the noisy felicitations of the company. "'Upon my word!' cried the old man. "'You make short work of this kind of affair. Arrived here only yesterday morning, and married today at three o'clock.' "'Commend me to a sailor for going the quick way to work.' "'But,' asked Danglars, in a timid tone, "'how did you manage about the other formalities, the contract, the settlement?' "'The contract,' answered Dantes languidly, "'it didn't take long to fix that. "'Mercedes has no fortune. "'I have none to settle on her. "'So, you see, our papers were quickly written out, "'and certainly do not come very expensive.' This joke elicited a fresh burst of applause. So that what we presume to be merely the betrothal feast turns out to be the actual wedding dinner, said Danglars. No, no, answered Dantes. Don't imagine I am going to put you off in that shabby manner. Tomorrow morning I start for Paris, four days to go, and the same to return, with one day to discharge the commission entrusted to me, is all the time I shall be absent. I shall be back here by the first of March, and on the second I give my real marriage feast. The prospect of fresh festivity redoubled the hilarity of the guests to such a degree that the elder Dantes, who, at the commencement of the repast, had commented upon the silence that prevailed, now found it difficult, amid the general din of voices, to obtain a moment's tranquillity in which to drink to the health and prosperity of the bride and bridegroom. Dantes, perceiving the affectionate eagerness of his father, responded by a look of grateful pleasure, while Mercedes glanced at the clock and made an expressive gesture to Edmund. Around the table reigned that noisy hilarity which usually prevails at such a time among people sufficiently free from the demands of social position not to feel the trammels of etiquette. Such as at the commencement of the repast had not been able to seat themselves according to their inclination, rose unceremoniously, and sought out more agreeable companions. Everybody talked at once, without waiting for a reply, and each one seemed to be contented with expressing his or her own thoughts. Fernand's paleness appeared to have communicated itself to Danglars. As for Fernand himself, he seemed to be enduring the tortures of the damned, unable to rest he was among the first to quit the table and as though seeking to avoid the hilarious mirth that rose in such deafening sounds he continued in utter silence to pace the farther end of the salon caderousse approached him just as danglars whom fernand seemed most anxious to avoid had joined him in a corner of the room upon my word said caderousse from whose mind the friendly treatment of Dantes, united with the effect of the excellent wine he had partaken of, had effaced every feeling of envy or jealousy at Dantes' good fortune. Upon my word, Dantes is a downright good fellow, and when I see him sitting there beside his pretty wife, that is so soon to be, I cannot help thinking it would have been a great pity to have served him that trick you were planning yesterday. Oh, there was no harm meant answered Danglars. At first I certainly did feel somewhat uneasy as to what Fernand might be tempted to do, but when I saw how completely he had mastered his feelings, even so far as to become one of his rival's attendants, I knew there was no further cause for apprehension. Caderousse looked full at Fernand. He was ghastly pale. Certainly, continued Danglars, the sacrifice was no trifling one, when the beauty of the bride is concerned. 
"'Upon my soul, that future captain of mine is a lucky dog. "'Gad, I only wish he would let me take his place.' "'Shall we not set forth?' asked the sweet silvery voice of Mercedes. Two o'clock has just struck, and you know we are expected in a quarter of an hour.' "'To be sure, to be sure,' cried Dantes, eagerly quitting the table. "'Let us go directly.' His words were re-echoed by the whole party with vociferous cheers. At this moment Danglars, who had been incessantly observing every change in Fernand's look and manner, saw him stagger and fall back with an almost convulsive spasm against a seat placed near one of the open windows. At the same instant his ear caught a sort of indistinct sound on the stairs, followed by the measured tread of soldiery, with the clanking of swords and military accoutrements. Then came a hum and buzz as of many voices, so as to deaden even the noisy mirth of the bridal party, among whom a vague feeling of curiosity and apprehension quelled every disposition to talk, and almost instantaneously the most death-like stillness prevailed. The sounds drew nearer. Three blows were struck upon the panel of the door. The company looked at each other in consternation. "'I demand admittance,' said a loud voice outside the room, "'in the name of the law.' As no attempt was made to prevent it, the door was opened, and a magistrate, wearing his official scarf, presented himself, followed by four soldiers and a corporal. Uneasiness now yielded to the most extreme dread on the part of those present. "'May I venture to inquire the reason of this unexpected visit?' said Monsieur Morel, addressing the magistrate, whom he evidently knew. "'There is, doubtless, some mistake easily explained.' "'If it is so,' explained the magistrate, "'rely upon every reparation being made. "'Meanwhile I am the bearer of an order of arrest, "'and although I must reluctantly perform the task assigned me, "'it must nevertheless be fulfilled. "'Who among the persons here assembled answers to the name of Edmond Dantes?' "'Every eye was turned towards the young man who, "'spite of the agitation he could not but feel, "'advanced with dignity and said in a firm voice, "'I am he.' "'What is your pleasure with me?' "'Edmond Dantes,' replied the magistrate, "'I arrest you in the name of the law.' "'Me,' repeated Edmund, slightly changing color, "'and wherefore, I pray?' "'I cannot inform you, but you will be duly acquainted with the reasons "'that have rendered such a step necessary at the preliminary examination.' Monsieur Morel felt that further resistance or remonstrance was useless, he saw before him an officer delegated to enforce the law, and perfectly well knew that it would be as unavailing to seek pity from a magistrate decked with his official scarf as to address a petition to some cold marble effigy. Old Dantes, however, sprang forward. There are situations which the heart of a father or a mother cannot be made to understand. He prayed and supplicated in terms so moving that even the officer was touched, and, although firm in his duty, he kindly said, my worthy friend, let me beg of you to calm your apprehensions. Your son has probably neglected some prescribed form or attention in registering his cargo, and it is more than probable he will be set at liberty directly he has been given the information required, whether touching the health of his crew or the value of his freight. "'What is the meaning of all this?' inquired Caderousse, frowning on Dangliers, who had assumed the air of utter surprise." "'How can I tell you?' replied he. "'I am, like yourself, utterly bewildered at all that is going on, "'and cannot, in the least, make out what it is about.' "'Caderousse then looked round for Fernand, but he had disappeared. "'The scene of the previous night now came back to his mind with startling clearness. "'The painful catastrophe he had just witnessed "'appeared effectually to have rent away the veil "'which the intoxication of the evening before "'had raised between himself and his memory.' "'So, so,' said he, in a hoarse and choking voice, to Danglars. "'This, then, I suppose, is a part of the trick you were concerting yesterday. "'All I can say is, that if it be so, tis an ill turn, "'and well deserves to bring double evil on those who have projected it.' "'Nonsense,' returned Danglars. "'I tell you again, I have nothing whatever to do with it. "'Besides, you know very well that I tore that paper to pieces.' "'No, you did not,' answered Caderousse. "'You merely threw it by. "'I saw it lying in a corner.' "'Hold your tongue, you fool. "'What should you know about it? "'Why, you were drunk.' "'Where is Fernand?' inquired Caderousse. "'How do I know?' replied Danglars. 
gone, as every prudent man ought to be, to look after his own affairs most likely, never mind where he is, let you and I go and see what is to be done for our poor friends. During this conversation, Dante's, after having exchanged a cheerful shake of the hand with all his sympathizing friends, had surrendered himself to the officer sent to arrest him, merely saying, "'Make yourself quite easy, my good fellows. There is some little mistake to clear up, that's all. Depend on it. And very likely I may not have to go as so far as the prison to effect that.' "'Oh, to be sure,' responded Donglers, who had now approached the group. "'Nothing more than a mistake. I feel quite certain.' Dantes descended the staircase, preceded by the magistrate, and followed by the soldiers. A carriage awaited him at the door. He got in, followed by two soldiers, and the magistrate, and the vehicle drove off towards Marseilles. "'Adieu, adieu, dearest Edmund,' cried Mercedes, stretching out her arm to him from the balcony. The prisoner heard the cry, which sounded like the sob of a broken heart, and leaning from the coach he called out, "'Good-bye, Mercedes. We shall soon meet again.' Then the vehicle disappeared round one of the turnings of Fort St. Nicholas. "'Wait for me here, all of you,' cried Monsieur Morel. "'I will take the first conveyance I find, and hurry to Marseilles, whence I will bring you word how all is going on.' "'That's right,' exclaimed a multitude of voices. "'Go, and return as quickly as you can.' This second departure was followed by a long and fearful state of terrified silence on the part of those who were left behind. The old father and Mercedes remained for some time apart, each absorbed in grief. But at length the two poor victims of the same blow raised their eyes, and with a simultaneous burst of feeling rushed into each other's arms. Meanwhile Fernand made his appearance, poured out for himself a glass of water with a trembling hand, then hastily swallowing it, went to sit down at the first vacant place. And this was, by mere chance, placed next to the seat on which Mercedes had fallen half-fainting, when released from the warm and affectionate embrace of old Dantes, instinctively Fernand drew back his chair. "'He is the cause of all this misery. I am quite sure of it,' whispered Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off Fernand, to Danglars. "'I don't think so,' answered the other. "'He's too stupid to imagine such a scheme. I only hope the mischief will fall upon the head of whoever wrought it.' "'You don't mention those who aided and abetted the deed,' said Caderousse. "'Surely,' answered Danglars, "'one cannot be held responsible for every chance arrow shot into the air.' "'You can, indeed, when the arrow lights pointed downward on somebody's head.' Meantime, the subject of the arrest was being canvassed in every different form. "'What think you, Danglars,' said one of the party, turning towards him, "'of this event?' Why, replied he, I think it just possible Dantes may have been detected with some trifling article on board ship, considered here as contraband. But how could he have done so without your knowledge, Donglers, since you are the ship's supercargo? Why, as for that, I could only know what I was told respecting the merchandise with which the vessel was laden. I know she was loaded with cotton, and that she took in her freight at Alexandria from Prestitt's warehouse, and at Smyrna from Pascal's. That is all I was obliged to know, and I beg I may not be asked for any further particulars. Now I recollect, said the afflicted old father, my poor boy told me yesterday he got a small case of coffee and another of tobacco for me. There, you see, exclaimed Danglars, now the mischief is out. Depend upon it, the custom-house people went rummaging about the ship in our absence, and discovered poor Dante's hidden treasures. Mercedes, however, paid no heed to this explanation of her lover's arrest. Her grief, which she had hitherto tried to restrain, now burst out in a violent fit of hysterical sobbing. "'Come, come,' said the old man. "'Be comforted, my poor child. There is still hope.' "'Hope,' repeated Donglers. "'Hope,' faintly murmured Ferdinand, but the word seemed to die away on his pale, agitated lips, and a convulsive spasm passed over his countenance." "'Good news! Good news!' shouted forth one of the party stationed in the balcony on the lookout. "'Here comes Monsieur Morel back. No doubt now we shall hear that our friend is released.' Mercedes and the old man rushed to meet the ship-owner, and greeted him at the door. He was very pale. "'What news?' exclaimed a general burst of voices. "'Alas, my friends,' replied Monsieur Morel, with a mournful shake of his head, "'the thing has assumed a more serious aspect than I expected.' "'Oh, indeed, indeed, sir, he is innocent!' sobbed forth Mercedes. 
"'That I believe,' answered M. Morel. "'But still he is charged.' "'With what?' inquired the elder Dantes. "'With being an agent of the Bonapartist faction. "'Many of our readers may be able to recollect "'how formidable such an accusation became "'in the period at which our story is dated.' A despairing cry escaped the pale lips of Mercedes. The old man sank into a chair. "'Ah, Danglars,' whispered Caderousse, "'you have deceived me. The trick you spoke of last night has been played. But I cannot suffer a poor old man or an innocent girl to die of grief through your fault. I am determined to tell them all about it.' "'Be silent, you simpleton,' cried Danglars, grasping him by the arm, "'or I will not answer even for your own safety.' Who can tell whether Dantes be innocent or guilty? The vessel did touch at Elba, where he quitted it, and passed a whole day in the island. Now should any letters or other documents of a compromising character be found upon him, will it not be taken for granted that all who uphold him are his accomplices? With the rapid instinct of selfishness, Caderousse readily perceived the solidarity of this mode of reasoning. He gazed doubtfully, wistfully on Danglars, and then cautioned supplanted generosity. "'Suppose we wait a while and see what comes of it,' said he, casting a bewildered look on his companion. "'To be sure,' answered Danglars. "'Let us wait, by all means. If he be innocent, of course he will be set at liberty. If guilty, why, it is no use involving ourselves in a conspiracy.' "'Let us go, then. I cannot stay here any longer.' "'With all my heart,' replied Danglars, pleased to find the other so tractable, "'let us take ourselves out of the way, and leave things for the present to take their course.' After their departure, Fernand, who had now again become the friend and protector of Mercedes, led the girl to her home, while the friends of Dantes conducted the now half-fainting man back to his abode. The rumor of Edmund's arrest as a Bonapartist agent was not slow in circulating throughout the city. "'Could you ever have credited such a thing, my dear Danglars?' asked M. Morel, as, on his return to the port, for the purpose of gleaning fresh tidings of Dantes, from M. de Villefort, the assistant procureur, he overtook his supercargo in Caderousse. "'Could you have believed such a thing possible?' "'Why, you know I told you,' replied Danglars, "'that I considered the circumstance of his having anchored at the island of Elba as a very suspicious circumstance.' "'And did you mention these suspicions to any person besides myself?' "'Certainly not,' returned Anglaire's, then added in a low whisper, "'You understand that, on account of your uncle, M. Policar Morel, who served under the other government, and who does not altogether conceal what he thinks on the subject, you are strongly suspected of regretting the abdication of Napoleon. I should have feared to injure both Edmund and yourself, had I divulged my own apprehensions to a soul.' I am too well aware that, though a subordinate like myself is bound to acquaint the shipowner with everything that occurs, there are many things he ought most carefully to conceal from all else. "'Tis well, Danglaise, tis well,' replied M. Morel. "'You are a worthy fellow, and I had already thought of your interests in the event of poor Edmund having become captain of the Ferron. "'Is it possible you were so kind?' "'Yes, indeed. I had previously inquired of Dantes what was his opinion of you, and if he should have any reluctance to continue you in your post, for somehow I have perceived a sort of coolness between you.' "'And what was his reply?' "'That he certainly did think he had given you offence in an affair which he merely referred to without entering into particulars, but that whoever possessed the good opinion and confidence of the ship's owner would have his preference also.' "'The hypocrite!' murmured Danglars. "'Poor Dantes,' said Caderousse. "'No one can deny his being a noble-hearted young fellow.' "'But meanwhile,' continued M. Morel, "'here is the Ferron without a captain.' "'Oh,' replied Danglars, "'since we cannot leave this port for the next three months, "'let us hope that, ere the expiration of that period, "'Dantes will be set at liberty.' "'No doubt. But in the meantime?' "'I am entirely at your service, M. Morel,' answered Danglars. "'You know that I am as capable of managing a ship as the most experienced captain in the service, and it will be so far advantageous to you to accept my services that upon Edmund's release from prison no further charge will be requisite on board the Ferron than for Dantes and myself each to resume our respective posts.' "'Thanks, Danglars. That will smooth over all difficulties. I fully authorize you at once to assume the command of the Ferron, and look carefully to the unloading of her freight, 
private misfortunes must never be allowed to interfere with business. Be easy on that score, Monsieur Morel, but do you think we shall be permitted to see our poor Edmund? I will let you know that directly. I have seen Monsieur de Villefort, whom I shall endeavor to interest in Edmund's favor. I am aware he is a furious royalist, but in spite of that, and of his being king's attorney, he is a man like ourselves, and I fancy not a bad sort of one. Perhaps not, replied Donglers, but I hear that he is ambitious, and that's rather against him. Well, well, returned Monsieur Morel, we shall see. But now hasten on board. I will join you there ere long. So saying, the worthy shipowner quitted the two allies and proceeded in the direction of the Palais de Justice. You see, said Donglers, addressing Caderousse, the turn things have taken. Do you still feel any desire to stand up in his defense? Not the slightest, but yet it seems to me a shocking thing that a mere joke should lead to such consequences. But who perpetrated that joke, let me ask? Neither you nor myself, but Ferdinand. You knew very well that I threw the paper into the corner of the room. Indeed, I fancied I had destroyed it. Oh, no, replied Caderousse, that I can answer for. You did not. I only wish I could see it now as plainly as I saw it lying all crushed and crumpled in a corner of the arbor. Well, then, if you did, depend upon it. Ferdinand picked it up and either copied it or caused it to be copied. Perhaps, even, he did not take the trouble of recopying it. And now I think of it, by heavens, he may have sent the letter himself. Fortunately for me, the handwriting was disguised. Then you were aware of Dante's being engaged in a conspiracy? Not I, as I said before. I thought the whole thing was a joke, nothing more. It seems, however, that I have unconsciously stumbled upon the truth. Still, argued Caderousse, I would give a great deal if nothing of the kind had happened, or, at least, that I had had no hand in it. You will see, Donclairs, that it will turn out an unlucky job for both of us. Nonsense! If any harm come of it, it should fall on the guilty person, and that, you know, is Fernand. How can we be implicated in any way? All we have got to do is to keep our own counsel, and remain perfectly quiet, not breathing a word to any living soul, and you will see that the storm will pass away without in the least affecting us. Amen, responded Caderousse, waving his hand in token of adieu to Danglars, and bending his steps towards the Allées du Milien, moving his head to and fro, and muttering as he went, after the manner of one whose mind was overcharged with one absorbing idea. So far, then, said Danglars mentally, all has gone as I would have it. I am temporarily commander of the Ferion, with the certainty of being permanently so, if that fool of a Caderousse can be persuaded to hold his tongue. My only fear is the chance of Dante's being released. But there he is in the hands of justice, and, admitted he with a smile, she will take her own. So saying, he leaped into a boat, desiring to be rowed on board the Ferron, where Monsieur Morel had agreed to meet him. End of chapter 5This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, May 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 6 The Deputy Procureur du Roi. In one of the aristocratic mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cours opposite the Medusa Fountain, a second marriage feast was being celebrated, almost at the same hour with the nuptial repast given by Dantes. In this case, however, although the occasion of the entertainment was similar, the company was strikingly dissimilar. Instead of a rude mixture of sailors, soldiers, and those belonging to the humblest grade of life, the present assembly was composed of the very flower of Marseilles society, magistrates who had resigned their office during the usurper's reign, officers who had deserted from the imperial army and joined forces with Condé, and the younger members of families brought up to hate and execrate the man whom five years of exile would convert into a martyr, and fifteen of restoration elevate to the rank of a god. The guests were still at table. 
and the heat and an energetic conversation that prevailed betrayed the violent and vindictive passions that then agitated each dweller of the south where unhappily for five centuries religious strife had long given increased bitterness to the violence of party feeling the emperor now king of the petty island of elba after having held sovereign sway over one half of the world counting as his subjects a small population of five or six thousand souls after having been accustomed to hear the vive napoleons of a hundred and twenty millions of human beings uttered in ten different languages was looked upon here as a ruined man separated for ever from any fresh connection with france or claim to her throne the magistrates freely discussed their political views the military part of the company talked unreservedly of moscow and leipzig while the women commented on the divorce of josephine it was not over the downfall of the man but over the defeat of the napoleonic idea that they rejoiced and in this they foresaw for themselves the bright and cheering prospect of a revivified political existence an old man decorated with the cross of st louis now rose and proposed the health of king louis XVIII. it was the marquis de saint meran this toast recalling at once the patient exile of hartwell and the peace-loving king of france excited universal enthusiasm glasses were elevated in the air à l'anglais and the ladies snatching their bouquet from their fair bosoms strewed the table with their floral treasures in a word an almost poetical fervour prevailed ah said the marquise de saint meran a woman with a stern forbidding eye though still noble and distinguished in appearance despite her fifty years are these revolutionists who have driven us from those very possessions they afterwards purchased for a mere trifle during the reign of terror would be compelled to own were they hear that all true devotion was on our side since we were content to follow the fortunes of a falling monarch while they on the contrary made their fortune by worshipping the rising sun yes yes they could not help admitting that the king for whom we sacrifice rank wealth and station was truly our louis the well-beloved while their wretched usurper has been and ever will be to them their evil genius their napoleon the accursed am i not right villefort i beg your pardon madame i really must pray you to excuse me but in truth i was not attending to the conversation marquise marquise interposed the old nobleman who had proposed the toast let the young people alone let me tell you on one's wedding day they are more agreeable subjects of conversation than dry politics never mind dearest mother said a young and lovely girl with a profusion of light brown hair and eyes that seemed to float in liquid crystal tis all my fault for seizing upon m de villefort so as to prevent his listening to what you said but there now take him he is your own for as long as you like m villefort i beg to remind you my mother speaks to you if the marquise will deign to repeat the words i but imperfectly caught i shall be delighted to answer said m de villefort never mind rene replied the marquise with a look of tenderness that seemed out of keeping with her harsh dry features but however all other feelings may be withered in a woman's nature there is always one bright smiling spot in the desert of her heart and that is the shrine of maternal love i forgive you what i was saying villefort was that the bonapartists had not our sincerity enthusiasm or devotion they had however what supplied the place of those fine qualities replied the young man and that was fanaticism napoleon is the mahomet of the west and is worshipped by his commonplace but ambitious followers not only as a leader and lawgiver but also as the personification of equality he cried the marquise napoleon the type of equality for mercy's sake then what would you call robespierre come come do not strip the latter of his just rights to bestow them on the corsican who to my mind has usurped quite enough nay madame i would place each of these heroes on his right pedestal that of robespierre on his scaffold in the place louis xv that of napoleon on the column of the place vendome the only difference consists in the opposite character of the equality advocated by these two men one is the equality that elevates the other is the equality that degrades one brings a king within reach of the guillotine the other elevates the people to a level with the throne observe said villefort smiling 
I do not mean to deny that both these men were revolutionary scoundrels, and that the ninth Thermidor and the 4th of April in the year 1814 were lucky days for France, worthy of being gratefully remembered by every friend to monarchy and civil order, and that explains how it comes to pass that, fallen as I trust he is for ever, Napoleon has still retained a train of parasitical satellites. Still, Marquise, it has been so with other usurpers. Cromwell, for instance, who was not half so bad as Napoleon, had his partisans and advocates. Do you know, Belfort, that you are talking in a most dreadfully revolutionary strain? But I excuse it. It is impossible to expect the son of a Girondin to be free from a small spice of the old leaven. A deep crimson suffused the countenance of Villefort. "'Tis true, madame,' answered he, "'that my father was a Girondin, "'but he was not among the number of those "'who voted for the king's death. "'He was an equal sufferer with yourself "'during the reign of terror, "'and had well nigh lost his head "'on the same scaffold on which your father perished. "'True,' replied the Marquis, "'without wincing in the slightest degree "'at the tragic remembrance thus called up. "'But bear in mind, if you please,' that our respective parents underwent persecution and proscription from diametrically opposite principles, in proof of which I may remark that while my family remained among the stanchest adherents of the exiled princes, your father lost no time in joining the new government, and that while the citizen Noirtier was a Girondin, the Count Noirtier became a senator. Dear mother, interposed René, you know very well it was agreed that all these disagreeable reminiscences should forever be laid aside. Suffer me also, madame, replied Villefort, to add my earnest request to Mademoiselle de Mérens, that you will kindly allow the veil of oblivion to cover and conceal the past. What avails recrimination over matters wholly past recall? I have laid aside even the name of my father, and altogether disowned his political principles. He was, nay, probably may still be, a Bonapartist, and is called Noirtier, I, on the contrary, am a stanch royalist, and style myself de Villefort. Let what may remain of revolutionary sap exhaust itself and die away with the old trunk, and condescend only to regard the young shoot which has started up at a distance from the parent tree, without having the power, any more than the wish, to separate entirely from the stock from which it sprung. Bravo, Villefort, cried the Marquis. Excellently well said. Come now. I have hopes of obtaining what I have been for years endeavouring to persuade the Marquise to promise, namely a perfect amnesty and forgetfulness of the past. With all my heart, replied the Marquise, let the past be for ever forgotten. I promise you it affords me as little pleasure to revive it as it does you. All I ask is that Villefort will be firm and inflexible for the future in his political principles. Remember also, Villefort, that we have pledged ourselves to his majesty for your filthy and strict loyalty, and that, at our recommendation, the king consented to forget the past, as I do. And here she extended to him her hand, as I now do at your entreaty. But bear in mind that should there fall in your way any one guilty of conspiring against the government, you will be so much the more bound to visit the offence with rigorous punishment, as it is known you belong to a suspected family. Alas, madame, returned Villefort, my profession as well as the times in which we live compels me to be severe. I have already successfully conducted several public prosecutions and brought the offenders to merited punishment, but we have not done with the thing yet. Do you indeed think so? inquired the Marquise. I am at least fearful of it. Napoleon, in the island of Elba, is too near France, and his proximity keeps up the hopes of his partisans. Marseille is filled with half-prey officers, who are daily, under one frivolous pretext or another, getting off quarrels with the royalists. From hence arise continual and fatal duels among the highest classes of persons, and assassinations in the lower. You have heard, perhaps, said the Comte de Salvieux, one of M. de Méran's oldest friends, and trembling to the Comte d'Artois, that the Holy Alliance purposed removing him from thence? Yes, they were talking about it when we left Paris, said M. de saint Méran. And where is it decided to transfer him? To St. Helena. For heaven's sake, where is that? asked the Marquise. An island situated on the other side of the equator, 
at least two thousand leagues from here replied the count so much the better as villefort observes it is a great act of folly to have left such a man between corsica where he was born and naples of which his brother-in-law is king and face to face with italy the sovereignty of which he coveted for his son unfortunately said villefort there are the treaties of eighteen fourteen and we cannot molest napoleon without breaking those compacts oh well we shall find some way out of it responded m de salvieux there wasn't any trouble over treaties when it was a question of shooting the poor duc d'anguien well said the marquise it seems probable that by the aid of the holy alliance we shall be rid of napoleon and we must trust to the vigilance of m de villefort to purify marseilles of his partisans the king is either a king or no king if he be acknowledged a sovereign of france he should be upheld in peace and tranquillity and this can best be effected by employing the most inflexible agents to put down every attempt at conspiracy tis the best and surest means of preventing mischief unfortunately madame answered villefort the strong arm of the law is not called upon to interfere until the evil has taken place then all he has got to do is to endeavor to repair it nay madame the law is frequently powerless to effect this all it can do is to avenge the wrong done oh monsieur de villefort cried a beautiful young creature daughter to the comte de salvieux and a cherished friend of mademoiselle de saint meran do try and get up some famous trial while we are at marseilles i never was in a law court i am told it is so very amusing amusing certainly replied the young man inasmuch as instead of shedding tears at the fictitious tale of woe produced at the theatre you behold in a law court a case of real and genuine distress a drama of life the prisoner whom you dare see pale agitated and alarmed instead of as is the case when a curtain falls on a tragedy going home to sup peacefully with his family and then retiring to rest that he may recommence his mimic woes on the morrow is removed from your sight merely to be reconducted to his prison and delivered up to the executioner i leave you to judge how far your nerves are calculated to bear you through such a scene of this however be assured that should any favorable opportunity present itself i will not fail to offer you the choice of being present for shame monsieur de villefort said rene becoming quite pale don't you see how you're frightening us and yet you laugh what would you have tis like a duel i have already recorded sentence of death five or six times against the movers of political conspiracies and who can say how many daggers may be ready sharpened and only awaiting a favorable opportunity to be buried in my heart gracious heavens monsieur de villefort said rene becoming more and more terrified you surely are not in earnest indeed i am replied the young magistrate with a smile and in the interesting trial that young lady is anxious to witness the case would only be still more aggravated suppose for instance the prisoner as is more than probable to have served under napoleon well can you expect for an instant that one accustomed at the word of his commander to rush fearlessly on the very bayonets of his foe will scruple more to drive a stiletto into the heart of one he knows to be his personal enemy than to slaughter his fellow-creature merely because bidden to do so by one he is bound to obey besides one requires the excitement of being hateful in the eyes of the accused in order to lash one's self into a state of sufficient vehemence and power i would not choose to see the man against whom i pleaded smile as though in mockery of my words no my pride is to see the accused pale agitated and as though beaten out of all composure by the fire of my eloquence rene uttered a smothered exclamation bravo cried one of the guests that is what i call talking to some purpose just the person we require at a time like the present said a second what a splendid business that last case of yours was my dear villefort remarked a third i mean the trial of the man for murdering his father upon my word you killed him ere the executioner had laid his hand upon him oh as for parasites and such dreadful people as that interposed rene it matters very little what is done to them but as regards poor unfortunate creatures whose only crime consists in having mixed themselves up in political intrigues 
Why, that is the very worst offence they could possibly commit. For don't you see, René, the king is the father of his people, and he who shall plot or contrive aught against the life and safety of the parent of thirty-two million of souls is a parasite upon a fearfully great scale. I don't know anything about that, replied René, but, Monsieur de Villefort, you have promised me, have you not, always to show mercy to those I plead for. Make yourself quite easy on that point, answered Villefort, with one of his sweetest smiles. You and I will always consult upon our verdicts. My love, said the Marquise, attend to your doves, your lapdogs, and embroidery, but do not meddle with what you do not understand. Nowadays the military profession is in abeyance, and the magisterial robe is the badge of honor. There is a wise Latin proverb that is very much in point. Sedant armatoge, said Villefort with a bow. I cannot speak Latin, responded the Marquise. Well, said René, I cannot help regretting you had not chosen some other profession than your own. A physician, for instance. Do you know I always felt a shudder at the idea of even a destroying angel? Dear good René, whispered Villefort, as he gazed with unutterable tenderness on the lovely speaker. Let us hope, my child, cried the Marquis, that M. de Villefort may prove the moral and political physician of this province. If so, he will have achieved a noble work, and one which will go far to efface the recollection of his father's conduct, added the incorrigible Marquise. Madame, replied Villefort with a mournful smile, I have already had the honor to observe that my father has, at least I hope so, abjured his past errors, and that he is, at the present moment, a firm and zealous friend of the religion and order, a better royalist, possibly, than his son, for he has to atone for past dereliction, while I have no other impulse than warm, decided preference and conviction. Having made this well-turned speech, Villefort looked carefully round to mark the effect of his oratory, much as he would have done had he been addressing the bench in open court. "'Do you know, my dear Villefort,' cried the Comte de Salvieux, that is exactly what I myself said the other day at the Tuileries, when questioned by His Majesty's principal chamberlain touching the singularity of an allegiance between the son of a Girondin and the daughter of an officer of the Duc de Condé. And I assure you he seemed fully to comprehend that this mode of reconciling political differences was based upon sound and excellent principles. Then the king, who, without our suspecting it, had overheard our conversation, interrupted us by saying, Villefort, observe that the king did not pronounce the word Nortier, but, on the contrary, placed considerable emphasis on that of Villefort. Villefort, said His Majesty, is a young man of great judgment and discretion, who will be sure to make a figure in his profession. I like him much, and it gave me great pleasure to hear that he was about to become the son-in-law of the Marquis and Marquise de saint méran I should myself have recommended the match, had not the noble Marquis anticipated my wishes by requesting my consent to it. Is it possible the king could have condescended so far as to express himself so favorably of me? asked the enraptured Villefort. I give you his very words, and if the Marquis chooses to be candid, he will confess that they perfectly agree with what His Majesty said to him when he went six months ago to consult him upon the subject of your espousing his daughter. That is true, answered the Marquis. How much do I owe this gracious prince? What is there I would not do to evince my earnest gratitude? That is right, cried the Marquise. I love to see you thus. Now then, were a conspirator to fall into your hands, he would be most welcome. For my part, dear mother, interposed René, I trust your wishes will not prosper, and that Providence will only permit petty offenders, poor debtors, and miserable cheats to fall into Monsieur de Villefort's hands then I shall be contented, just the same as though you prayed that a physician might only be called upon to prescribe for headaches, measles, and the string of wasp, or any other slight affection of the epidermis. If you wish to see me the king's attorney, you must desire for me some of those violent and dangerous diseases, from the cure of which so much honor redounds to the physician. At this moment, and as though the utterance of Villefort's wish had sufficed to effect its accomplishment, a servant entered the room, and whispered a few words in his ear. Villefort immediately rose from table, and quitted the room upon the plea of urgent business. He soon, however, returned, his whole face beaming with delight. René regarded him with fond affection, 
and certainly his handsome features, lit up as they then were with more than usual fire and animation, seemed formed to excite the innocent admiration with which she gazed on her graceful and intelligent lover. "'You were wishing just now,' said Villefort, addressing her, "'that I were a doctor instead of a lawyer. "'Well, I at least resemble the disciples of Euscalipius, "'in one thing, that of not being able to call a day my own, "'not even that of my betrothal. "'And wherefore were you called away just now?' "'asked Mademoiselle de saint Méran with an air of deep interest. "'For a very serious matter, "'which bids fair to make work for the executioner.' "'How dreadful!' exclaimed René, turning pale. "'Is it possible?' burst simultaneously from all who were near enough to the magistrate to hear his words. "'Why, if my information proved correct, a sort of Bonaparte conspiracy had just been discovered.' "'Can I believe my ears?' cried the Marquise. "'I will read you the letter containing the accusation, at least,' said Villefort. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and the religious institutions of his country that one named Edmond Dantes, mate of the ship Pharaon, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and again taken charge of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmond Dantes who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in the possession of father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dantes on board the Pharaon. But, said René, this letter, which after all is but an anonymous scrawl, is not even addressed to you, but to the king's attorney. True, but that gentleman being absent, his secretary, by his orders, opened his letters, thinking this one of importance, he sent for me, but not finding me, took upon himself to give the necessary orders for arresting the accused party. Then the guilty person is absolutely in custody, said the Marquise. Nay, my dear mother, said the accused person, you know we cannot yet pronounce him guilty. He is in safe custody, answered Villefort, and rely upon it. If the letter is found, he will not be likely to be trusted abroad again unless he goes forth under the special protection of the headsman. "'And where is the unfortunate being?' asked René. "'He is at my house.' "'Come, come, my friend,' interrupted the Marquise. "'Do not neglect your duty to linger with us. "'You are the king's servant, and must go wherever that service calls you.' "'Oh, Villefort!' cried René, clasping her hands and looking toward her lover with piteous earnestness. "'Be merciful on this day of our betrothal.' The young man passed round to the side of the table, where the fair pleader sat, and leaning over her chair said tenderly, To give you pleasure, my sweet René, I promise you to show all the lenity in my power. But if the charges brought against this Bonapartist hero prove correct, why then you really must give me leave to order his head to be cut off. René shuddered. Never mind that foolish girl, Villefort, said the Marquise. She will soon get over these things. So saying, Madame de saint Méran extended her dry bony hand to Villefort, who, while imprinting a son-in-law's respectful salute on it, looked at René as much as to say, I must try and fancy it is your dear hand I kiss, as it should have been. These are mournful auspices to accompany a betrothal, sighed poor René. Upon my words, child, exclaimed the angry Marquise, your folly exceeds all bounds. I should be glad to know what connection there can possibly be between your sickly sentimentality and the affairs of state. Oh, mother, murmured René. Nay, madame, I pray you pardon this little traitor. I promise you that to make up for her want of loyalty, I will be most inflexibly severe. Then casting an expressive glance at his betrothed, which seemed to say, Fear not, for your dear sake my justice shall be tempered with mercy. And receiving a sweet and approving smile in return, Villefort quitted the room. End of chapter six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J. C. Guan. 
Montreal, May 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 7. The Examination. No sooner had Villefort left the salon than he assumed the grave air of a man who holds the balance of life and death in his hands. Now, in spite of the mobility of his countenance, the command of which, like a finished actor, he had carefully studied before the glass, it was by no means easy for him to assume an air of judicial severity. Except the recollection of the line of politics his father had adopted, and which might interfere unless he acted with the greatest prudence with his own career, Gérard de Villefort was as happy as a man could be. Already rich, he held a high official situation, though only twenty-seven. He was about to marry a young and charming woman, whom he loved, not passionately, but reasonably, as became a deputy attorney of the king. And besides her personal attractions, which were very great, Mademoiselle de saint Méran's family possessed considerable political influence, which they would, of course, exert in his favor. The dowry of his wife amounted to fifty thousand crowns, and he had, besides, the prospect of seeing her fortune increased to half a million at her father's death. These considerations naturally gave Villefort a feeling of such complete felicity that his mind was fairly dazzled in its contemplation. At the door he met the commissary of police, who was waiting for him. The sight of this officer recalled Villefort from the third heaven to earth. He composed his face, as we have before described, and said, I have read the letters, sir, and you have acted rightly in arresting this man. Now inform me what you have discovered concerning him and the conspiracy. We know nothing as yet of the conspiracy, monsieur. All the papers found have been sealed up and placed on your desk. The prisoner himself is named Edmond Dantes, mate on board the three master de Pharaon, trading in cotton with Alexandria and Smyrna, and belonging to Morel and Son of Marseille. Before he entered the merchant service, has he ever served in the marines? Oh, no, monsieur, he is very young. How old? Nineteen or twenty at the most. At this moment, and as Villefort had arrived at the corner of the Rue des Conseils, a man who seemed to have been waiting for him approached. It was M. Morel. Ah, M. de Villefort, cried he, I am delighted to see you. Some of your people have committed the strangest mistake. They have just arrested Edmond Dantes, mate of my vessel. I know it, monsieur, replied Villefort, and I am now going to examine him. Oh, said Morel, carried away by his friendship, you do not know him, and I do. He is the most estimable, the most trustworthy creature in the world, and I will venture to say there is not a better seaman in all the merchant service. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, I beseech your indulgence for him. Villefort, as we have seen, belonged to the aristocratic party at Marseille, Morel to the plebeian. The first was a royalist, the other suspected of Bonapartism. Villefort looked disdainfully at Marel, and replied, You are aware, monsieur, that a man may be estimable and trustworthy in private life, and the best seaman in the merchant service, and yet be, politically speaking, a great criminal, is it not true? The magistrate laid emphasis on these words, as if he wished to apply them to the owner himself, while his eyes seemed to plunge into the heart of one who, interceding for another, had himself need of indulgence. Morel reddened, for his own conscience was not quite clear on politics. Besides, what Dantes had told him of his interview with the Grand Marshal, and what the Emperor had said to him, embarrassed him. He replied, however, I entreat you, Monsieur de Villefort, be as you always are kind and equitable, and give him back to us soon. This give us sound and revolutionary in the deputy's ears. Ah, ah, murmured he, is Dantes then a member of some carbonary society? that his protector thus employs the collective form. He was, if I recollect, arrested in a tavern, in company of a great many others. Then he added, Monsieur, you may rest assured I shall perform my duty impartially, and that if he be innocent, you shall not have appealed to me in vain. Should he, however, be guilty, in this present epoch, immunity would furnish a dangerous example, and I must do my duty. As he had now arrived at the door of his own house, which adjoined the Palais de Justice, he entered after having coldly saluted the shipowner who stood as if petrified on the spot where Villefort had left him. 
The antechamber was full of police agents and gendarmes, in the midst of whom, carefully watched, but calm and smiling, stood the prisoner. Villefort traversed the antechamber, cast a side glance at Dantes, and taking a packet which a gendarme offered him, disappeared, saying, Bring the prisoner. Rapid as had been Villefort's glance, it had served to give him an idea of the man he was about to interrogate. He had recognized intelligence in the high forehead, courage in the dark eye and bent brow, and frankness in the thick lips that showed a set of pearly teeth. Villefort's first impression was favorable, but he had been so often warned to mistrust first impulses that he applied the maxim to the impression, forgetting the difference between the two words. He stifled, therefore, the feelings of compassion that were rising, composed his features, and sat down, grim and somber, at his desk. An instant after Dantes entered, he was pale but calm and collected, and saluting his judge with easy politeness, looked round for a seat, as if he had been in M. Morel's salon. It was then that he encountered the first time Villefort's look, that look peculiar to the magistrate who, while seeming to read the thoughts of others, betrays nothing of his own. "'Who and what are you?' demanded Villefort, turning over a pile of papers containing information relative to the prisoner that a police agent had given to him on his entry, and that already in an hour's time had swelled to voluminous proportions, thanks to the corrupt espionage of which the accused is always made the victim. "'My name is Edmond Dantes,' replied the young man calmly. "'I am mate of the pharaon belonging to Messrs. Morel and Son. Your age, continued Villefort. Nineteen, returned Dantes. What were you doing at the moment you were arrested? I was at the festival of my marriage, monsieur, said the young man, his voice slightly tremulous. So great was the contrast between that happy moment and the painful ceremony he was now undergoing. So great was the contrast between the sombre aspect of Monsieur de Villefort and the radiant face of Mercedes. You were at the festival of your marriage, said the deputy, shuddering in spite of himself. Yes, monsieur, I am on the point of marrying a young girl I have been attached to for three years. Before, impassive as he was, was struck with this coincidence, and the tremulous voice of Dantes, surprised in the midst of his happiness, struck a sympathetic chord in his own bosom. He also was on the point of being married, and he was summoned from his own happiness to destroy that of another. This philosophic reflection, thought he, will make a great sensation at M. de saint mérance and he arranged mentally, while Dantes awaited further questions, the antithesis by which orators often create a reputation for eloquence. When the speech was arranged, Villefort turned to Dantes. "'Go on, sir,' said he. "'What would you have me say?' "'Give all the information in your power.' "'Tell me on which point you desire information, and I will tell all I know.' Only, added he with a smile, I warn you I know very little. Have you served under the usurper? I was about to be mustered into the Royal Marines when he fell. It is reported your political opinions are extreme, said Villefort, who had never heard anything of the kind, but was not sorry to make this inquiry, as if it were an accusation. My political opinions, replied Dantes. Alas, sir, I never had any opinions. I am hardly nineteen. I know nothing. I have no part to play. If I obtain the situation I desire, I shall owe it to M. Morel. Thus all my opinions, I will not say public but private, are confined to these three sentiments. I love my father, I respect M. Morel, and I adore Mercedes. This, sir, is all I can tell you, and you see how uninteresting it is. As Dantes spoke, Villefort gazed at his ingenuous and open countenance, and recollected the words of René, who, without knowing who the culprit was, had besought his indulgence for him. With the deputy's knowledge of crime and criminals, every word the young man uttered convinced him more and more of his innocence. This lad, for he was scarcely a man, simple, natural, eloquent, with that eloquence of the heart never found when sought for, full of affection for everybody, because he was happy, and because happiness renders even the wicked good extended his affection even to his judge, in spite of Villefort's severe look and stern accent. Dantès seemed full of kindness. Pardieu, said Villefort, he is a noble fellow. I hope I shall gain Renée's favor easily by obeying the first command she ever imposed on me. 
I shall have at least the pressure of the hand in public, and a sweet kiss in private. Full of this idea, Villefort's face became so joyous that when he turned to Dantès, the latter, who had watched the change on his physiognomy, was smiling also. Sir, said Villefort, have you any enemies, at least that you know? I have enemies, replied Dantès. My position is not sufficiently elevated for that. As for my disposition, that is perhaps somewhat too hasty, but I have striven to repress it. I have had ten or twelve sailors under me, and if you question them they will tell you that they love and respect me not as a father, for I am too young, but as an elder brother. But you may have excited jealousy. You are about to become captain at nineteen, an elevated post. You are about to marry a pretty girl, who loves you, and these two pieces of good fortune might have excited the envy of some one. You are right. You know men better than I do, and what you say may possibly be the case, I confess, but if such persons are among my acquaintances, I prefer not to know it, because then I should be forced to hate them. You are wrong. You should always strive to see clearly around you. You seem a worthy young man. I will depart from the strict line of my duty to aid you in discovering the author of this accusation. Here is the paper. Do you know the writing? As he spoke, Villefort drew the letter from his pocket and presented it to Dantès. Dantès read it. A cloud passed over his brow as he said, No, monsieur, I do not know the writing, and yet it is tolerably plain. Whoever did it writes well. I am very fortunate, added he, looking gratefully at Villefort to be examined by such a man as you, for this envious person is a real enemy. And by the rapid glance that the young man's eyes shot forth, Villefort saw how much energy lay hid beneath this mildness. Now, said the deputy, answer me frankly, not as a prisoner to a judge, but as one man to another who takes an interest in him. What truth is there in the accusation contained in this anonymous letter? and Villefort drew disdainfully on his desk the letter Dantès had just given back to him. None at all. I will tell you the real facts. I swear by my honor as a sailor, by my love for Mercedes, by the life of my father. Speak, monsieur, said Villefort. Then internally, if René could see me, I hoped she would be satisfied, and would no longer call me a decapitator. Well, when we quit at Naples, Captain Leclerc was attacked with a brain fever. As we had no doctor on board, and he was so anxious to arrive at Elba that he would not touch at any other port, his disorder rose to such a height that at the end of the third day, feeling he was dying, he called me to him. My dear Dantès, said he, swear to perform what I am going to tell you, for it is a matter of the deepest importance. I swear, Captain, replied I. Well, as after my death the command devolves on you as mate, Assume the command, and bear up for the island of Elba. Disembark at Porto Ferraro. Ask for the Grand Marshal. Give him this letter. Perhaps they will give you another letter, and charge you with a commission. You will accomplish what I was to have done, and derive all the honor and profit from it. I will do it, Captain. But perhaps I shall not be admitted to the Grand Marshal's presence as easily as you expect. Here is a ring that will obtain audience of him and remove every difficulty, said the captain. At these words he gave me a ring. It was time. Two hours after he was delirious. The next day he died. And what did you do then? What I ought to have done, and what every one would have done in my place. Everywhere the last requests of a dying man are sacred, but with a sailor the last requests of his superior are commands. I sailed for the island of Elba, where I arrived the next day. I ordered everybody to remain on board, and went on shore alone. As I had expected, I found some difficulty in obtaining access to the Grand Marshal, but I sent the ring I had received from the captain to him, and was instantly admitted. He questioned me concerning Captain Leclerc's death, and, as the latter had told me, gave me a letter to carry on to a person in Paris. I undertook it because it was what my captain had bade me to do. I landed here, regulated the affairs of the vessel, and hastened to visit my affianced bride, whom I found more lovely than ever. Thanks to Monsieur Marel, all the forms were got over. In a word I was, as I told you, at my marriage feast, and I should have been married in an hour, 
and to-morrow I intended to start for Paris, had I not been arrested on this charge which you as well as I now see to be unjust. Ah, said Villefort, this seems to me the truth. If you have been culpable it was imprudence, and this imprudence was in obedience to the orders of your captain. Give up this letter you have brought from Elba, and pass your word you will appear should you be required, and go and rejoin your friends. Am I free then, sir? cried Dantes joyfully. Yes, but first give me this letter. You have it already, for it was taken from me, with some others which I see in that packet. Stop a moment, said the deputy, as Dantes took his hat and gloves. To whom is it addressed? To M. Noirtier, Rue Coqueron, Paris. Had a thunderbolt fallen into the room, Villefort could not have been more stupefied. He sank into his seat, and hastily turned over the packet, drew forth the fatal letter at which he glanced with an expression of terror. M. Noirtier, Rue Coqueron, number 13, murmured he, growing still paler. Yes, said Dantes. Do you know him? No, replied Villefort. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. It is a conspiracy, then, asked Dantes, who, after believing himself free, now began to feel a tenfold alarm. I have, however, already told you, sir, I was entirely ignorant of the contents of the letter. Yes, but you knew the name of the person to whom it was addressed, said Villefort. I was forced to read the address to know to whom to give it. Have you shown this letter to any one? asked Villefort, becoming still more pale. To no one, on my honor. Everybody is ignorant that you are the bearer of a letter from the island of Elba, and addressed to M. Noirtier? Everybody, except the person who gave it to me. And that was too much, far too much, murmured Villefort. Villefort's brow darkened more and more. His white lips and clenched teeth filled Dantes with apprehension. After reading the letter, Villefort covered his face with his hands. Oh, said Dantes timidly, what is the matter? Villefort made no answer, but raised his head at the expiration of a few seconds, and again perused the letter. And you say that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter? I give you my word of honor, sir, said Dantes. But what is the matter? You are ill. Shall I ring for assistance? Shall I call? No, said Villefort, rising hastily. Stay where you are. It is for me to give orders here, and not you. Monsieur, replied Dantes proudly. It was only to summon assistance for you. I want none. It was a temporary indisposition. Attend to yourself, answer me. Dantes waited, expecting a question, but in vain. Villefort fell back on his chair, passed his hand over his brow, moist with perspiration, and for the third time read the letter. Oh, if he only knows the contents of this, murmured he, and that Noirtier is the father of Villefort, I am lost and he fixed his eyes upon Edmond as if he would have penetrated his thoughts. "'Oh, it is impossible to doubt it,' cried he suddenly. "'In heaven's name!' cried the unhappy young man. "'If you doubt me, question me. I will answer you.' Villefort made a violent effort, and in a tone he strove to render firm. "'Sir,' said he, "'I am no longer able, as I have hoped, to restore you immediately to liberty. Before doing so, I must consult the trial justice.' What my own feelings is, you already know. Oh, monsieur, cried Dantes, you have been rather a friend than a judge. Well, I must detain you some time longer, but I will strive to make it as short as possible. The principal charge against you is this letter, and you see, Villefort approached the fire, cast it in, and waited until it was entirely consumed. You see, I destroy it? Oh, exclaimed Dantes, you are goodness itself. Listen, continued Villefort, you cannot have confidence in me after what I have done. Oh, command, and I will obey. Listen, this is not a command, but advice I give you. Speak, and I will follow your advice. I shall detain you until this evening in the Palais de Justice. Should anyone else interrogate you, say to him what you have said to me, but do not breathe a word of this letter. I promise. It was Villefort who seemed to entreat, and the prisoner who reassured him. You see, continued he, glancing toward the grate, where fragments of burnt paper fluttered in the flames. The letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. Should you therefore be questioned, deny all knowledge of it, deny it boldly, and you are saved. 
be satisfied. I will deny it. It was the only letter you had? It was. Swear it. I swear it. Villefort rang. A police agent entered. Villefort whispered some words in his ear, to which the officer replied by a motion of his head. Follow him, said Villefort to Dantès. Dantès saluted Villefort and retired. Hardly had the door closed when Villefort threw himself half fainting into a chair. Alas, alas, murmured he, if the procureur himself had been at Marseilles, I should have been ruined. This accursed letter would have destroyed all my hopes. Oh, my father, must your past career always interfere with my successes? Suddenly a light passed over his face, a smile played round his set mouth, and his haggard eyes were fixed in thought. This will do, said he, and from this letter which might have ruined me, I will make my fortune. Now to the work I had in hand, and after having assured himself that the prisoner was gone, the deputy procureur hastened to the house of his betrothed. End of chapter 7This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. Green, K -R -I dot com. The Count of Monte Cristo. By Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 8 The Chateau D. The commissary of police, as he traversed the antechamber, made a sign to two gendarmes, who placed themselves one on Dante's right and the other on his left. A door that communicated with the Palais de Justice was opened, and they went through a long range of gloomy corridors, whose appearance might have made even the boldest shudder. The Palais de Justice communicated with the prison a sombre edifice that from its grated windows looked on the clock-tower of the Accoules. After numberless windings Dante saw a door with an iron wicket. The commissary took up an iron mallet and knocked thrice, every blow seeming to Dante as if struck on his heart. The door opened, the two gendarmes gently pushed him forward, and the door closed with a loud sound behind him. The air he inhaled was no longer pure, but thick and mephitic. He was in prison. He was conducted to a tolerably neat chamber, but grated and barred, and its appearance, therefore, did not greatly alarm him. Besides, the words of Villefort, who seemed to interest himself so much, resounded still in his ears like a promise of freedom. It was four o'clock when Dante was placed in this chamber. It was, as we have said, the first of March, and the prisoner was soon buried in darkness. The obscurity augmented the acuteness of his hearing. At the slightest sound he rose and hastened to the door, convinced they were about to liberate him. But the sound died away, and Dante sank again into his seat. At last, about ten o'clock, and just as Dante began to despair, steps were heard in the corridor. A key turned in the lock. The bolts creaked and the massy oaken door flew open, and a flood of light from two torches pervaded the apartment. By the torchlight Dante saw the glittering sabres and carbines of four gendarmes. He had advanced at first, but stopped at the sight of this display of force. "'Are you come to fetch me?' asked he. "'Yes,' replied a gendarme. "'By the orders of the deputy procureur?' "'I believe so.' The conviction that they came from Monsieur de Villefort relieved all Dante's apprehensions. He advanced calmly and placed himself in the centre of the escort. A carriage waited at the door, the coachman was on the box, and a police officer sat beside him. "'Is this carriage for me?' said Dante. "'It is for you,' replied the gendarme. Dante was about to speak but feeling himself urged forward, and having neither the power nor the intention to resist, he mounted the steps, and was in an instant seated inside between two gendarmes. The two others took their places opposite, and the carriage rolled heavily over the stones. The prisoner glanced at the windows. They were grated. He had changed his prison for another that was conveying him, he knew not whither. 
Through the grating, however, Dante saw they were passing through the Rue Casserie, and by the Rue Saint-Laurent, and the Rue Taramy to the port. Soon he saw the light of La Consigne. The carriage stopped, the officer descended, approached the guard-house. A dozen soldiers came out and formed themselves in order. Dante saw the reflection of their muskets by the light of the lamps on the quay. "'Can all this force be summoned on my account?' thought he. The officer opened the door, which was locked, and without speaking a word answered Dante's question. For he saw between the ranks of the soldiers a passage formed from the carriage to the port. The two gendarmes who were opposite to him descended first. Then he was ordered to alight, and the gendarmes on each side of him followed his example. They advanced towards a boat, which a custom-house officer held by a chain near the quay. The soldiers looked at Dantes with an air of stupid curiosity. In an instant he was placed in the stern sheets of the boat, between the gendarmes, while the officer stationed himself at the bow. A shove sent the boat adrift, and four sturdy oarsmen impelled it rapidly towards the pilon. A shout from the boat, the chain that closes the mouth of the port, was lowered, and in a second they were, as Dantes knew, in the Frioul, outside the inner harbour. The prisoner's first feeling was of a joy at again breathing the pure air, for air is freedom. But he soon sighed, for he passed before La Réserve, where he had that morning been so happy, and now through the open windows came the laughter and revelry of a ball. Dante folded his hands, raised his eyes to heaven, and prayed fervently. The boat continued her voyage. They had passed the Tête de Morte, were now off the Anse de Faro, and about to double the battery. This maneuver was incomprehensible to Dante. "'Whither are you taking me?' asked he. "'You will soon know.' "'But, but still, we are forbidden to give you any explanation.' Dante, trained in discipline, knew that nothing would be more absurd than to question subordinates, who were forbidden to reply. And so he remained silent. The most vague and wild thoughts passed through his mind. The boat they were in could not make a long voyage. There was no vessel at anchor outside the harbour. He thought, perhaps, they were going to leave him on some distant point. He was not bound, nor had they made any attempt to handcuff him. This seemed good augury. Besides, had not the deputy, who had been so kind to him, told him that provided he did not pronounce the dreaded name of Noirtier, he had nothing to apprehend? Had not Villefort in his presence destroyed the fatal letter, the only proof against him? He waited silently, striving to pierce through the darkness. They had left the Ile Ratonneau where the lighthouse stood on the right, and were now opposite the Point des Catalans. It seemed to the prisoner that he should distinguish a feminine form on the beach, for it was there Mercedes dwelt. How was it that a presentiment did not warn Mercedes that her lover was within three hundred yards of her? One light alone was visible, and Dante saw that it came from Mercedes' chamber. Mercedes was the only one awake in the whole settlement. A loud cry could be heard by her, but pride restrained him, and he did not utter it. What would his guards think if they had heard him shout like a madman? He remained silent, his eyes fixed upon the light. The boat went on, but the prisoner thought only of Mercedes. An intervening elevation of land hid the light. Dante turned and perceived that they had gone out to sea. While he had been absorbed in thought, they had shipped their oars and hoisted sail. The boat was now moving with the wind. In spite of his repugnance to address the guards, Dante turned to the nearest gendarme, and, taking his hand, Comrade, said he, I adjure you, as a Christian and a soldier, to tell me where we are going. I am Captain Dante, a loyal Frenchman, though accused of treason. Tell me where you are conducting me, and I promise you, on my honor, I will submit to my fate." The gendarme looked irresolutely at his companion, who returned for an answer a sign that said, I see no great harm in telling him now. The gendarme replied, You are a native of Marseille, and a sailor, and yet you do not know where you are going? 
On my honor, I have no idea. Have you no idea whatever? None at all. That is impossible. I swear to you it is true. Tell me, I entreat. But my orders. Your orders do not forbid you telling me what I must know in ten minutes, in half an hour, or an hour. You see I cannot escape, even if I intended. Unless you are blind, or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you, then. Dante rose and looked forward. When he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock on which stands the Chateau d'I, this gloomy fortress, which has for more than three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dante like a scaffold to a malefactor. Chateau d'I? cried he. What are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. I am not going there to be imprisoned, said Dante. It is only used for political prisoners. I have committed no crime. Are there any magistrates or judges at the Chateau d'If? There are only, said the gendarme, a governor, a garrison, turnkeys, and good thick walls. Come, come, do not look so astonished, or you will make me think you are laughing at me in return for my good nature. Dante pressed the gendarme's hand as though he would crush it. You think, then, said he, that I am taken to the Chateau d'If to be imprisoned there? <laughs> it is probable, but there is no occasion to squeeze so hard. Without any inquiry, without any formality? All the formalities have been gone through. The inquiry is already made. And so, in spite of Monsieur de Villefort's promises? I do not know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme. But I know we are taking you to the Chateau d'If. But what are you doing? Help! Comrade, help! By a rapid movement which the gendarme's practiced eye had perceived, Dante sprang forward to precipitate himself into the sea. But four vigorous arms seized him as his feet quitted the bottom of the boat. He fell back, cursing with rage. Good, said the gendarme, placing his knee on his chest. Believe, soft-spoken gentleman, again. Hark ye, my friend, I have disobeyed my first order, but I will not disobey the second. And if you move, I will blow your brains out and he leveled his carbine at Dante, who felt the muzzle against his temple. For a moment the idea of struggling crossed his mind, and of so ending the unexpected evil that had overtaken him. But he bethought him of M. de Villefort's promises, and besides, death in a boat from the hand of a gendarme seemed too terrible. He remained motionless, but gnashing his teeth and wringing his hands with fury. At this moment the boat came to a landing with a violent shock. One of the sailors leaped on shore, a cord creaked as it ran through a pulley, and Dante guessed they were at the end of the voyage, and that they were mooring the boat. His guards, taking him by the arms and coat collar, forced him to rise, and dragged him towards the steps that led to the gate of the fortress, while the police officer, carrying a musket with fixed bayonet, followed behind. Dante made no resistance. He was like a man in a dream. He saw soldiers drawn up on the embankment. He knew vaguely that he was ascending a flight of steps. He was conscious that he passed through a door, and that the door closed behind him, but all this indistinctly as through a mist. He did not even see the ocean, that terrible barrier against freedom which the prisoners look upon with utter despair. They halted for a minute, during which he strove to collect his thoughts. He looked around. He was in a court surrounded by high walls. He heard the measured tread of sentinels, and as they passed before the light he saw the barrels of their muskets shine. They waited upwards of ten minutes. Certain Dante could not escape the gendarmes released him. They seemed awaiting orders. The orders came. Where is the prisoner? said a voice. Here, replied the gendarmes. Let him follow me. I will take him to his cell. Go, said the gendarmes, thrusting Dante forward. The prisoner followed his guide, who led him into a room almost underground, whose bare and reeking walls seemed as though impregnated with tears. 
a lamp placed on a stool illumined the apartment faintly, and showed Dante the features of his conductor, an under-jailer, ill-clothed, and of sullen appearance. "'Here is your chamber for to-night,' said he. "'It is late, and the governor is asleep. "'Tomorrow, perhaps, he may change you. "'In the meantime there is bread, water, and fresh straw, "'and that is all a prisoner can wish for. "'Good night.' And before Dante could open his mouth, before he had noticed where the jailer placed his bread or the water, before he glanced towards the corner where the straw was, the jailer disappeared, taking with him the lamp and closing the door, leaving stamped upon the prisoner's mind the dim reflection of the dripping walls of his dungeon. Dante was alone in darkness and in silence cold as the shadows that he felt breathe on his burning forehead. With the first dawn of day the jailer returned, with orders to leave Dante where he was. He found the prisoner in the same position, as if fixed there, his eyes swollen with weeping. He had passed the night standing and without sleep. The jailer advanced. Dante appeared not to perceive him. He touched him on the shoulder. Edmund started. "'Have you not slept?' said the jailer. "'I do not know,' replied Dante. The jailer stared. "'Are you hungry?' continued he. "'I do not know.' "'Do you wish for anything?' "'I wish to see the governor.' The jailer shrugged his shoulders and left the chamber. Dante followed him with his eyes, and stretched forth his hands toward the open door. But the door closed. All his emotion then burst forth. He cast himself on the ground, weeping bitterly, and asking himself what crime he had committed that he was thus punished. The day passed thus. He scarcely tasted food, but walked round and round the cell like a wild beast in his cage. One thought in particular tormented him, namely that during his journey hither he had sat so still, whereas he might a dozen times have plunged into the sea, and thanks to his powers of swimming for which he was famous have gained the shore, concealed himself until the arrival of a Genoese or Spanish vessel, escaped to Spain or Italy where Mercedes and his father could have joined him. He had no fears as to how he should live, good seamen are welcome everywhere. He spoke Italian like a Tuscan and Spanish like a Castilian. He would have been free and happy with Mercedes and his father, whereas now he was confined in the Chateau d'If, that impregnable fortress, ignorant of the future destiny of his father and Mercedes, and all this because he had trusted to Villefort's promise. The thought was maddening, and Dante threw himself furiously down on his straw. The next morning, at the same hour, the jailer came again. "'Well,' said the jailer, are you more reasonable today?" Dante made no reply. Come, cheer up. Is there anything that I can do for you? I wish to see the governor. I have already told you it is impossible. Why so? Because it is against prison rules, and prisoners must not even ask for it. What is allowed, then? Better fare if you pay for it, books, and leave to walk about. I do not want books. I am satisfied with my food, and do not care to walk about. But I wish to see the governor. If you worry me by repeating the same thing, I will not bring you any more to eat. Well then, said Edmund, if you do not, I shall die of hunger, that is all. The jailer saw by his tone he would be happy to die, and as every prisoner is worth ten sous a day to his jailer, he replied in a more subdued tone, "'What you ask is impossible, but if you are very well behaved you will be allowed to walk about, and some day you will meet the governor, and if he chooses to reply that is his affair.' "'But,' asked Dante, "'how long shall I have to wait?' "'A month, six months, a year. It is too long a time. I wish to see him at once.' "'Ah,' said the jailer. Do not always brood over what is impossible, or you will be mad in a fortnight. You think so? Yes, we have an instance here. 
it was by always offering a million francs to the governor for his liberty that an abbey became mad who was in this chamber before you. How long has he left it? Two years. Was he liberated then? No, he was put in a dungeon. Listen, said Dante, I am not an abbe, I am not mad. Perhaps I shall be, but at present, unfortunately, I am not. I will make you another offer. What is that? I do not offer you a million, because I have it not. But I will give you a hundred crowns if, the first time you go to Marseille, you will seek out a young girl named Mercedes at the Catalans, and give her two lines from me. If I took them and were detected, I should lose my place, which is worth two thousand francs a year, so that I should be a great fool to run such a risk for three hundred. Well, said Dante, mark this. If you refuse at least to tell Mercedes I am here, I will some day hide myself behind the door, and when you enter I will dash out your brains with this stool. Threats! cried the jailer, retreating and putting himself on the defensive. You are certainly going mad. The abbe began like you, and in three days you will be like him, mad enough to tie up, but fortunately there are dungeon here. Dante whirled the stool round his head. All right, all right, said the jailer, all right, since you will have it so, I will send word to the governor. Very well, returned Dante, dropping the stool and sitting on it, as if he were in reality mad. The jailer went out, and returned in an instant with a corporal and four soldiers. "'By the governor's orders,' said he, "'conduct the prisoner to the tier beneath.' "'To the dungeon, then,' said the corporal. "'Yes, we must put the madman with the madmen.' The soldiers seized Dante, who followed passively. He descended fifteen steps, and the door of a dungeon was opened, and he was thrust in. The door closed, and Dante advanced with outstretched hands until he touched the wall. He then sat down in the corner until his eyes became accustomed to the darkness. The jailer was right. Dante wanted but little of being utterly mad. End of chapter 8「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 9 The Evening of the Betrothal Villefort had, as we have said, hastened back to Madame de saint Marin's in the Place de Grandcourt and on entering the house found that the guests whom he had left at table were taking coffee in the salon. René was, with all the rest of the company, anxiously awaiting him, and his entrance was followed by a general exclamation. "'Well, decapitator, guardian of the state, royalist, brutus, what is the matter?' said one. "'Speak out.' "'Are we threatened with a fresh reign of terror?' asked another. "'Has the Corsican ogre broken loose?' cried a third. Marquise, said Villefort, approaching his future mother-in-law, I request your pardon for thus leaving you. Will the Marquis honour me by a few moments' private conversation? Ah, it is really a serious matter, then, asked the Marquis, remarking the cloud on Villefort's brow. So serious that I must take leave of you for a few days. So, added he, turning to René, judge for yourself, if it be not important. You're going to leave us? cried René unable to hide her emotion at this unexpected announcement. Alas, returned Villefort, I must. Where then are you going? asked the Marquise. That, madame, is an official secret, but if you have any commissions for Paris, a friend of mine is going there to-night, and will with pleasure undertake them. The guests looked at each other. You wish to speak to me alone? said the Marquis. Yes, let us go to the library, please. The Marquis took his arm, and they left the salon. "'Well,' asked he, as soon as they were by themselves, "'tell me what it is. An affair of the greatest importance that demands my immediate presence in Paris. Now excuse the indiscretion, Marquis, but have you any landed property?' "'All my fortune is in the funds, seven or eight hundred thousand francs. Then sell out, sell out, Marquis, or you will lose it all.' "'But how can I sell out here?' 
"'You have a broker, have you not?' "'Yes.' "'Then give me a letter to him, and tell him to sell out without an instant's delay. Perhaps even now I shall arrive too late.' "'The deuce, you say,' replied the Marquis. "'Let us lose no time, then.' And sitting down, he wrote a letter to his broker, ordering him to sell out at the market price. "'Now then,' said Villefort, placing the letter in his pocket-book, "'I must have another. To whom? To the king. To the king? Yes. I dare not write to his majesty. I do not ask you to write to his majesty, but ask Monsieur de Servieux to do so. I want a letter that will enable me to reach the king's presence without all the formalities of demanding an audience. That would occasion a loss of precious time. But address yourself to the keeper of the seals. He has the right of entry at the Tuileries, and can procure you audience at any hour of the day or night. Doubtless, but there is no occasion to divide the honours of my discovery with him. The keeper would leave me in the background, and take all the glory to himself. I tell you, Marquis, my fortune is made if I only reach the Tuileries the first, for the king will not forget the service I do him. In that case, go and get ready. I will call Silvia and make him write the letter. Be as quick as possible. I must be on the road in a quarter of an hour. Tell your coachman to stop at the door. You will present my excuses to the Marquise and Mademoiselle René, whom I leave on such a day with great regret. You will find them both here, and can make your farewells in person. A thousand thanks, and now for the letter. The Marquis rang, a servant entered. Say to the Comte de Servieux that I would like to see him. Now then, go, said the Marquis. I shall be gone only a few moments. Villefort hastily quitted the apartment but reflecting that the sight of the deputy procureur running through the streets would be enough to throw the whole city into confusion, he resumed his ordinary pace. At his door he perceived a figure in the shadow that seemed to wait for him. It was Mercedes, who, hearing no news of her lover, had come unobserved to inquire after him. As Villefort drew near, she advanced and stood before him. Dante had spoken of Mercedes, and Villefort instantly recognized her. Her beauty and high bearing surprised him, and when she inquired what had become of her lover, it seemed to him that she was the judge and he the accused. "'The young man you speak of,' said Villefort abruptly, "'is a great criminal, and I can do nothing for him, mademoiselle.' Mercedes burst into tears, and as Villefort strove to pass her, again addressed him. "'But at least tell me where he is, that I may know whether he is alive or dead,' said she. "'I do not know. He is no longer in my hands.' replied Villefort. And desirous of putting an end to the interview, he pushed by her and closed the door, as if to exclude the pain he felt. But remorse is not thus banished. Like Virgil's wounded hero, he carried the arrow in his wound, and arrived at the salon, Villefort uttered a sigh that was almost a sob, and sank into a chair. Then the first pangs of an unending torture seized upon his heart. The man he sacrificed to his ambition, that innocent victim immolated on the altar of his father's faults, appeared to him pale and threatening, leading his affianced bride by the hand and bringing with him remorse, not such as the ancients figured, furious and terrible, but that slow and consuming agony whose pangs are intensified from hour to hour up to the very moment of death. Then he had a moment's hesitation. He had frequently called for capital punishment on criminals, and owing to his irresistible eloquence they had been condemned, and yet the slightest shadow of remorse had never clouded Villefort's brow, because they were guilty, at least he believed so. But here was an innocent man, whose happiness he had destroyed. In this case he was not the judge, but the executioner. As he thus reflected, he felt the sensation we have described, and which had hitherto been unknown to him, arise in his bosom, and fill him with vague apprehensions. It is thus that a wounded man trembles instinctively, at the approach of the finger to his wound, until it be healed. But Villefort's was one of those that never close, or if they do, only close to reopen more agonizing than ever. If at this moment the sweet voice of René had sounded in his ears, pleading for mercy, or the fair Mercedes had entered and said, In the name of God, I conjure you to restore me my affianced husband, his cold and trembling hands would have signed his release but no voice broke the stillness of the chamber, and the door was opened only by Villefort's valet, who came to tell him that the travelling carriage was in readiness. Villefort rose, or rather sprang from his chair, hastily opened one of the drawers of his desk, emptied all the gold it contained into his pocket, 
stood motionless an instant, his hand pressed to his head, muttering a few inarticulate sounds, and then, perceiving that his servant had placed his cloak upon his shoulders, he sprang into the carriage, ordering the postillions to drive to Monsieur de saint Marin's. The hapless Dante was doomed. As the Marquis had promised, Villefort found the Marquise and René in waiting. He started when he saw René, for he fancied she was again about to plead for Dante. Alas, her emotions were wholly personal. She was thinking only of Villefort's departure. She loved Villefort, and he left her at the moment he was about to become her husband. Villefort knew not when he should return, and René, far from pleading for Dante, hated the man whose crime separated her from her lover. Meanwhile, what of Mercedes? She had met Fernand at the corner of the Rue de la Loge. She had returned to the Catalan, and had despairingly cast herself on her couch. Fernand, kneeling by her side, took her hand, and covered it with kisses, that Mercedes did not even feel. She passed the night thus. The lamp went out for want of oil, but she paid no heed to the darkness, and dawn came, but she knew not that it was day. Grief had made her blind to all but one object. That was Edmond. "'Ah, you are there,' said she, at length, turning towards Fernand. "'I have not quitted you since yesterday,' returned Fernand sorrowfully. Monsieur Morel had not readily given up the fight. He had learned that Dante had been taken to prison, and he had gone to all his friends and the influential persons of the city. But the report was already in circulation that Dante was arrested as a Bonapartist agent, and as the most sanguine looked upon any attempt of Napoleon to remount the throne as impossible, he met with nothing but refusal, and had returned home in despair, declaring that the matter was serious, and that nothing more could be done. Carderousse was equally restless and uneasy, but instead of seeking, like M. Morel, to aid Dante, he had shut himself up with two bottles of black currant brandy, in the hope of drowning reflection but he did not succeed, and became too intoxicated to fetch any more drink, and yet not so intoxicated as to forget what had happened. With his elbows on the table he sat between the two empty bottles, while spectres danced in the light of the unsnuffed candle. Spectres such as Hoffman strews over his punch-drunk pages like black, fantastic dust. Danglars alone was content and joyous. He had got rid of an enemy, and made his own situation on the Ferron secure. Danglars was one of those men born with a pen behind the ear and an inkstand in place of a heart. Everything with him was multiplication or subtraction. The life of a man was to him of far less value than a numeral, especially when, by taking it away, he could increase the sum total of his own desires. He went to bed at his usual hour and slept in peace. Villefort, after receiving M. de Saveux's letter, embraced René, kissed the Marquise's hand, and shaken that of the Marquis, started for Paris along the X road. Old Dante was dying with anxiety to know what had become of Edmond, but we know very well what had become of Edmond. End of chapter 9
No, sire, for that would only be token for us seven years of plenty and seven years of scarcity, and with a king as full of foresight as your majesty, scarcity is not a thing to be feared. Then of what other scourge are you afraid, my dear Blaka? Sire, I have every reason to believe that a storm is brewing in the south. Well, my dear duke, replied Louis the Eighteenth, I think you are wrongly informed, and know positively that, on the contrary, it is very fine weather in that direction. Man of ability as he was, Louis the Eighteenth liked a pleasant jest. Sire, continued M. de Blacas, if it only be to reassure a faithful servant, will your majesty send into Languedoc, Provence, and Dauphine trusty men who will bring you back a faithful report as to the feeling in these three provinces? Canonis Surdis, replied the king, continuing the annotations in his Horace. Sire, replied the courtier, laughing, in order that he might seem to comprehend the quotation, your majesty may be perfectly right in relying on the good feeling of France, but I fear I am not altogether wrong in dreading some desperate attempt. By whom? By Bonaparte, or at least by his adherents. My dear Blaca, said the king, you with your alarms prevent me from working. And you, sire, prevent me from sleeping with your security. Wait, my dear sir, wait a moment, for I have such a delightful note on the pastor cum traheret. Wait, and I will listen to you afterwards. There was a brief pause, during which Louis the Eighteenth wrote, in a hand as small as possible, another note on the margin of his Horace, and then looking at the duke with an air of a man who thinks he has an idea of his own, while he is only commenting upon the idea of another, said, Go on, my dear duke, go on, I listen. Sire, said Blaca, who had for a moment the hope of sacrificing Villefort to his own profit, I am compelled to tell you that these are not mere rumours destitute of foundation which thus disquiet me, but a serious-minded man, deserving all my confidence, and charged by me to watch over the South, the Duke hesitated as he pronounced these words, has arrived by post to tell me that a great pearl threatens the King, and so I hasten to you, sire. Maladusis savi domum, continued Louis the Eighteenth, still annotating. Does your majesty wish me to drop the subject? By no means, my dear duke, but just stretch out your hand. Which? Whichever you please, there, to the left. Here, sire? I tell you to the left, and you are looking to the right. I mean on my left, yes, there. You will find yesterday's report of the minister of police. But here is Monsieur Dandre himself. And Monsieur Dandre, announced by the chamberlain in waiting, entered. Come in said Louis the Eighteenth with repressed smile. Come in, Baron, and tell the Duke all you know, the latest news of Monsieur de Bonaparte. Do not conceal anything, however serious. Let us see. The island of Elba is a volcano, and we may expect to have issuing thence flaming and bristling war. Bella, horrida Bella. Monsieur Dandre leaned very respectfully on the back of a chair with his two hands, and said, Has your Majesty perused yesterday's report? But tell the duke himself, who cannot find anything, what the report contains. Give him the particulars of what the usurper is doing in his islet. Monsieur, said the baron to the duke, all the servants of his majesty must approve of the latest intelligence which we have from the island of Elba. Bonaparte, Monsieur Dondre looked at Louis the Eighteenth, who employed in writing a note, did not even raise his head. Bonaparte, continued the baron, is mortally wearied, and passes whole days in watching his miners at work at Porto Longoni. And scratches himself for amusement, added the king. Scratches himself? inquired the duke. What does your majesty mean? Yes, indeed, my dear duke, did you forget that this great man, this hero, this demigod, is attacked with a malady of the skin which worries him to death? Perigo? And moreover, my dear duke, continued the minister of police, we are almost assured that, in a very short time, the usurper will be insane. Insane? Raving mad, his head becomes weaker. Sometimes he weeps bitterly, sometimes laughs boisterously. At other time, he passes hours on the seashore, flinging stones in the water, and when the flint makes duck and drake five or six times, he appears as delighted as if he had gained another marengo or Austerlitz. 
Now you must agree that these are indubitable symptoms of insanity. Or of wisdom, my dear Baron, or of wisdom, said Louis the Eighteenth, laughing. The greatest captains of antiquity amused themselves by casting pebbles into the ocean. See Plutarch's life of Scipio Africanus. Monsieur de Blaca pondered deeply between the confident monarch and the truthful minister. Villefort, who did not choose to reveal the whole secret, lest another should reap all the benefit of the disclosure, had yet communicated enough to cause him the greatest uneasiness. "'Well, well, Dandre," said Louis the Eighteenth, "'Blaca is not yet convinced. Let us proceed, therefore, to the usurper's conversion.' The minister of police bowed. "'The usurper's conversion?' murmured the duke, looking at the king and Dandre, who spoke alternately, like Virgil's shepherds. "'The usurper converted?' decidedly my dear duke in what way converted to good principles tell him all about it baron why this is the way of it said the minister with the gravest air in the world napoleon lately had a review and as two or three of his old veterans expressed a desire to return to france he gave them their dismissal and exhorted them to serve the good king these were his own words of that i am certain well Blaca? "'What do you think of this?' inquired the king triumphantly, and pausing for a moment from the voluminous goliast before him. "'I say, sire, that the minister of police is greatly deceived, or I am, and as it is impossible it can be the minister of police, as he has the guardianship of the safety and honour of your majesty, it is probable that I am in error. However, sire, if I might advise, your majesty will interrogate the person of whom I spoke to you, and I will urge your majesty to do him this honour. Most willingly, duke, under your auspices I will receive any person you please, but you must not expect me to be too confiding. Baron, have you any report more recent than this dated the 20th February? This is the 4th of March. No, sire, but I am hourly expecting one. It may have arrived since I left my office. Go thither, and if there be none, well, well, continued Louis the Eighteenth, make one. That is the usual way, is it not? and the king laughed facetiously. "'Oh, sire,' replied the minister, "'we have no occasion to invent any. Every day our desks are loaded with most circumstantial denunciations, coming from hosts of people who hope for some return for services, which they seek to render, but cannot. They trust to fortune, and rely upon some unexpected event in some way to justify their predictions.' "'Well, sir, go,' said Louis the Eighteenth, "'and remember that I am waiting for you.' I will but go and return, sire. I shall be back in ten minutes. And I, sire, said Monsieur de Blaca, will go and find my messenger. Wait, sir, wait, said Louis the Eighteenth. Really, Monsieur de Blaca, I must change your armorial bearings. I will give you an eagle with outstretched wings, holding in its claws a prey which tries in vain to escape, and bearing this device. Tanax. Sire, I listen, said de Blacas biting his nails with impatience. I wish to consult you on this passage. Molly fugien angelitu. You know it refers to a stag flying from a wolf. Are you not a sportsman and a great wolf hunter? Well then, what do you think of the Molly angelitu? Admirable, sire, but my messenger is like the stag you refer to, for he has posted two hundred and twenty leagues in scarcely three days which is undergoing great fatigue and anxiety, my dear Duke, when we have a telegraph which transmits messages in three or four hours, and that without getting in the least out of breath. Ah, sire, you recompense but badly this poor young man, who has come so far, and with so much ardour, to give your majesty useful information, if only for the sake of Monsieur de Servieux, who recommends him to me, I entreat your majesty to receive him graciously. Monsieur de Servieux, my brother's chamberlain? Yes, sire. He is at Marseilles, and writes me thence. Does he speak to you of this conspiracy? No, but strongly recommends Monsieur de Villefort, and begs me to present him to your majesty. Monsieur de Villefort, cried the king, is the messenger's name Monsieur de Villefort? Yes, sire. And he comes from Marseilles? In person. Why did you not mention his name at once? replied the king, betraying some uneasiness. Sire, I thought his name was unknown to your majesty. No, no, Blaca, he is a man of strong and elevated understanding, 
Ambitious, too. And Pardieu, you know his father's name. His father? Yes. Noirtier. Noirtier, the Girondin? Noirtier, the senator? He himself. And your majesty has employed the son of such a man? Blaca, my friend, you have but limited comprehension. I told you Villefort was ambitious, and to attain this ambition, Villefort would sacrifice everything, even his father. Then, sire, may I present him? This instant, duke, where is he? Waiting below in my carriage. Seek him at once. I hasten to do so. The duke left the royal presence with the speed of a young man. His really sincere royalism made him youthful again. Louis the Eighteenth remained alone, and turning his eyes on his half-opened Horace, muttered, Justum et tenacem propositi rurum. M. de Blacas returned as speedily as he had departed, but in the antechamber he was forced to appeal to the king's authority. Villefort's dusty garb, his costume, which was not of courtly cut, excited the susceptibility of M. de Braise, who was all astonishment at finding that this young man had the audacity to enter before the king in such attire. The duke, however, overcame all difficulties with a word, his majesty's order, and in spite of the protestations which the master of ceremonies made for the honor of his office and principles, Villefort was introduced. The king was seated in the same place where the duke had left him. On opening the door, Villefort found himself facing him, and the young magistrate's first impulse was to pause. "'Come in, Monsieur de Villefort,' said the king. "'Come in.' Villefort bowed, and advancing a few steps, waited until the king should interrogate him. "'Monsieur de Villefort,' said Louis the Eighteenth, "'the Duc de Blacas assures me you have some interesting information to communicate. Sire, the Duke is right, and I believe your Majesty will think it equally important. "'In the first place, and before everything else, sir, is the news as bad in your opinion as I am asked to believe?' Sire, I believe it to be most urgent, but I hope, by the speed I have used, that it is not irreparable. Speak as fully as you please, sir, said the king, who began to give way to the emotion which had showed itself in Blacas's face and affected Villefort's voice. Speak, sir, and pray begin at the beginning. I like order in everything. Sire, said Villefort, I will render a faithful report to your majesty but I must entreat your forgiveness if my anxiety leads to some obscurity in my language. A glance at the king after this discreet and subtle exordium assured Villefort of the benignity of his august auditor, and he went on. Sire, I have come as rapidly to Paris as possible to inform your majesty that I have discovered, in the exercise of my duties, not a commonplace and insignificant plot, such as is every day got up in the lower ranks of the people and in the army, but an actual conspiracy, a storm which menaces no less than your majesty's throne. Sire, the usurper is arming three ships. He meditates some project, which, however mad, is yet perhaps terrible. At this moment he will have left Elba, to go whither I know not, but assuredly to attempt a landing either at Naples or on the coast of Tuscany, or perhaps on the shores of France. Your Majesty is well aware that the sovereign of the island of Elba has maintained his relations with Italy and France? I am, sir, said the king, much agitated, and recently we have had information that the Bonapartist clubs have had meetings in the Rue Saint-Jacques. But proceed, I beg of you. How did you obtain these details? Sire, they are the results of an examination which I have made of a man of Marseilles, whom I have watched for some time and arrested on the day of my departure. This person, a sailor of turbulent character, and whom I suspected of Bonapartism, has been secretly to the island of Elba. There he saw the Grand Marshal, who charged him with an oral message to a Bonapartist in Paris, whose name I could not extract from him. But this mission was to prepare men's minds for a return. It is the man who says this, sire, a return which will soon occur. And where is this man? in prison, sire. And the matter seems serious to you? So serious, sire, that when the circumstance surprised me in the midst of a family festival, on the very day of my betrothal, I left my bride and friends, postponing everything, that I might hasten to lay at your majesty's feet 
the fears which impressed me, and the assurance of my devotion. True, said Louis the Eighteenth. was there not a marriage engagement between you and Mademoiselle de Saint-Morin, daughter of one of your majesty's most faithful servants? Yes, yes, but let us talk of this plot, Monsieur de Villefort. Sire, I fear it is more than a plot. I fear it is a conspiracy. A conspiracy in these times, said Louis the Eighteenth, smiling, is a thing very easy to meditate, but more difficult to conduct to an end, inasmuch as, re-established so recently on the throne of our ancestors, we have our eyes open at once upon the past, the present, and the future. For the last ten months my ministers have redoubled their vigilance in order to watch the shore of the Mediterranean. If Bonaparte landed at Naples, the whole coalition would be on foot before he could even reach Piemono. If he land in Tuscany, he will be in an unfriendly territory. If he land in France, it must be with a handful of men, and the result of that is easily foretold, execrated as he is by the population. Take courage, sir, but at the same time rely on our royal gratitude. Ah, here is Monsieur Dandre, cried the Blacas. At this instant the minister of police appeared at the door, pale, trembling, and as if ready to faint. Villefort was about to retire, but Monsieur de Blacas, taking his hand, restrained him. End of chapter 10「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 4th, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 11. The Corsican Ogre. At the sight of this agitation, Louis de Sweet pushed from him violently the table at which he was sitting. "'What ails you, Baron?' he exclaimed. "'You appear quite aghast. Has your uneasiness anything to do with what Monsieur de Blacas has told me, and Monsieur de Villefort has just confirmed?' Monsieur Blacas moved suddenly toward the Baron, but the fright of the courtier pleaded for the forbearance of the statesman, and— Besides, as matters were, it was much more to his advantage that the prefect of police should triumph over him than that he should humiliate the prefect. S sire stammered the baron. "'Well, what is it?' answered Louis de Sweet. The minister of police, giving way to an impulse of despair, was about to throw himself at the feet of Louis, who retreated a step and frowned. "'Will you speak?' he said. Oh, sire, what a dreadful misfortune! I am indeed to be pitied. I can never forgive myself. Monsieur, said Louis de Sweet, I command you to speak. Well, sire, the usurper left Elba on the 26th of February and landed on the 1st of March. And where? In Italy? asked the king eagerly. I in France, sire. At a small port, near Antibes, in the Gulf of Juan, the usurper landed in France, near Antibes, in the Gulf of Juan, two hundred and fifty leagues from Paris, on the first of March, and you only acquired this information today, the fourth of March? Well, sir, what you tell me is impossible. You must have received a false report, or, or you have gone mad. Uh, alas, sire, it is but too true. Louis made a gesture of indescribable anger and alarm, and then drew himself up as if this sudden blow had struck him in the same moment, in heart and in countenance. "'In France!' he cried. "'The usurper in France! And they did not watch over this man. Who knows? They, they were perhaps in league with him!' "'Oh, sire!' exclaimed the Duc de Blacasse. "'Monsieur d'André is not a man to be accused of treason, sire!' We have all been blind, and the minister of police has shared this general blindness, that is all. But, said Villefort, and then, suddenly checking himself, he was silent. Then he continued, Your pardon, sire, he said, bowing. My zeal carried me away. Will your majesty deign to excuse me? Speak, sir. Speak boldly, replied Louis. 
You alone, forewarned us of the evil, now try to aid us with the remedy. Sire, said Villefort, the usurper is detested in the south, and it seems to me that if he ventured into the south it would be easy to raise Languedoc and Provence against him. Yes, assuredly, replied the minister, but he is advancing by Gap and Cisteron. Advancing? He is advancing, said Louis de Suite. Is he then advancing on Paris? The minister of police maintained a silence which was equivalent to a complete avowal. And Dauphine, sir, inquired the king of Villefort. Do you think it's possible to rouse that as well as Provence? Sire, I am sorry to tell your majesty a cruel fact, but the feeling in Dauphine is quite the reverse of that in Provence or Languedoc. The mountaineers are Bonapartists, sire. Then, murmured Louis, he was well informed. How many men had he with him? I do not know, sire answered the minister of police. What? You do not know? Have you neglected to obtain information on that point? Of course it is of no consequence, he added, with a withering smile. Sire, it, it was impossible to learn. The dispatch simply stated the fact of the landing and the route taken by the usurper. And how did this dispatch reach you? inquired the king. The minister bowed his head, while a deep color overspread his cheeks. He stammered out, b b "'By the telegraph, sire!' Louis de Suite advanced a step, and folded his arms over his chest, as Napoleon would have done. "'So, then,' he exclaimed, turning pale with anger, seven conjoined and allied armies overthrew that man. A miracle of heaven replaced me on the throne of my fathers after five and twenty years of exile. I have, during those five and twenty years, spared no pains to understand the people of France and the interests which were confided to me. And now, when I see the fruition of my wishes almost within reach, the power I hold in my hands bursts and shatters me to atoms. Sire, it is a fatality, murmured the minister, feeling the pressure of the circumstances, however light a thing to destiny, was too much for any human strength to endure. What our enemies say of us, then, is true. We have learnt nothing, forgotten nothing. If I were betrayed as he was, I would console myself, but to be in the midst of persons elevated by myself to places of honor, who ought to watch over me more carefully than over themselves, for my fortune is theirs, before me they were nothing, after me they will be nothing, and perish miserably from incapacity, ineptitude, oh yes, sir, you are right, it is fatality." The minister quailed before this outburst of sarcasm. Monsieur de Blacasse wiped the moisture from his brow. Villefort smiled within himself, for he felt his increased importance. "'To fall,' continued King Louis, who at the first glance had sounded the abyss on which his monarchy hung suspended, "'to fall, and learn of that fall by telegraph.' Oh, I would rather mount the scaffold of my brother Louis says than thus descend the staircase at the Tuileries, driven away by ridicule. Ridicule, sir! Why, you know not its power in France, and yet you ought to know it. Sire, sire, murmured the minister, for pity's approach, Monsieur de Villefort, resumed the king, addressing the young man who— motionless and breathless, was listening to a conversation upon which depended the destiny of a kingdom, approach and tell monsieur that it is possible to know beforehand all that he has not known. Sire, it was really impossible to learn the secrets which that man concealed from all the world. Really impossible. Yes, that is a great word, sir. 
Unfortunately, there are great words, as there are great men. I have measured them. Really impossible for a minister who has an office, agents, spies, and fifteen hundred thousand francs for secret service money to know what is going on at sixty leagues from the coast of France. Well, then. See, here is a gentleman who had none of these resources at his disposal. A gentleman, only a simple magistrate, who has learned more than you with all your police, and would have saved my crown if, like you, he had had the power of directing a telegraph. The look of the minister of police was turned with concentrated spite on Villefort, who bent his head in modest triumph. I do not mean that for you, Blacas, continued Louis de Suite, for if you have discovered nothing, at least you have had the good sense to persevere in your suspicions. Any other than yourself would have considered the disclosure of Monsieur de Villefort insignificant, or else dictated by venial ambition. These words were an allusion to the sentiments which the Minister of Police had uttered with so much confidence an hour before. Villefort understood the king's intent. Any other person would perhaps have been overcome by such an intoxicating draught of praise, but he feared to make for himself the mortal enemy of the police minister, although he saw that d'André was irrevocably lost. In fact, the minister, who in the plenitude of his power had been unable to unearth Napoleon's secret, might in despair at his own downfall interrogate Dante's, and so lay bare the motives of Villefort's plot. Realizing this, Villefort came to the rescue of the crestfallen minister instead of aiding to crush him. Sire, said Villefort, the suddenness of this event must prove to your majesty that the issue is in the hands of providence. What your majesty is pleased to attribute to me as profound perspicacity is simply owing to chance, and I have profited by that chance like a good and devoted servant, that's all. Do not attribute to me more than I deserve, sire. Then your majesty may never have occasion to recall the first opinion you may have been pleased to form of me. The minister of police thanked the young man by an eloquent look, and Theophore understood that he had succeeded in his design that is to say that, without forfeiting the gratitude of the king, he had made a friend of one whom, in case of necessity, he might rely. "'Tis well,' resumed the king. "'And now, gentlemen,' he continued, turning toward Monsieur de Bocasse and the Minister of Police, "'I have no further occasion for you, and you may retire. What now remains to do is in the department of the Minister of War.' "'Fortunately, sire,' said Monsieur de Blacas, "'we can rely on the army. "'Your Majesty knows how every report confirms their loyalty and attachment. "'Do not mention reports, Duke, to me, "'for I know now what confidence to place in them. "'Yet, speaking of reports, Baron, "'what have you learned with regard to the affair in the Rue Saint-Jacques?' "'The affair in the Rue Saint-Jacques?' exclaimed Villefort, unable to repress an exclamation. Then, suddenly pausing, he added, "'Your pardon, sire, but my devotion to your majesty has made me forget not the respect that I have, for it is too deeply engraved in my heart, but the rules of etiquette.' "'Go on, go on, sir,' replied the king. "'You have to-day earned the right to make inquiries here.' "'Sire,' interposed the minister of police. I came a moment ago to give your majesty fresh information which I had obtained on this head, when your majesty's attention was attracted by the terrible event that has occurred in the gulf, and now these facts will cease to interest your majesty. On the contrary, sir, on the contrary, said Louis de Sweet. This affair seems to me to have a decided connection with that which occupies our attention and the death of General Quesnel will, perhaps, put us on the direct track of a great internal conspiracy. At the name of General Quesnel, Villefort trembled. "'Everything points to the conclusion, sire,' said the Minister of Police. "'That death was not the result of suicide, as we first believed, but of assassination. General Quesnel, it appears, has just left a Bonapartist club when he disappeared. An unknown person had been with him that morning, and had made an appointment with him in the Rue Saint-Jacques. 
Unfortunately, the general's valet, who was dressing his hair at the moment when the stranger entered, heard the street mentioned, but did not catch the number. As the police minister related this to the king, Viafor, who looked as if his very life hung on the speaker's lips, turned alternately red and pale. The king looked towards him. "'Do you not think with me, Monsieur de Villefort, that General Quesnel, whom they believed attached to the usurper, but who was really entirely devoted to me, has perished the victim of a Bonapartist ambush?' "'It is probable, sire,' replied Villefort. "'But is this all that is known?' They are on the track of the man who appointed the meeting with him. On his track? said Villefort. Yes, the servant has given his description. He is a man of from fifty to fifty-two years of age, dark, with black eyes, covered with shaggy eyebrows, and a thick moustache. He was dressed in a blue frock coat, buttoned up to the chin, and he wore at his buttonhole a rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Yesterday— a person exactly corresponding with this description was followed, but he was lost sight of at the corner of the Rue de la Jossienne and the Rue Coqueron. Villefort leaned on the back of an armchair, for, as the minister of police went on speaking, he felt his legs bend under him. But when he learned that the unknown had escaped the vigilance of the agent who followed him, he breathed again. "'Continue to seek for this man, sir,' said the king to the minister of police. "'For if, as I am all but convinced, General Quesnel, who would have been so useful to us at this moment, has been murdered, his assassins, Bonapartists or not, shall be cruelly punished.' It required all of Villefort's coolness not to betray the terror with which this declaration of the king inspired him. "'How strange!' continued the king with some asperity. The police think that they have disposed of the whole matter when they say a murder has been committed, and especially so when they can add, and we are on the track of the guilty persons. Sire, your majesty will, I trust, be amply satisfied on this point at least. We shall see. I will no longer detain you, Monsieur de Villefort, for you must be fatigued after so long a journey. Go and rest. Of course, you stopped at your father's? A feeling of faintness came over Villefort. No, sire, he replied. I alighted at the Hotel de Madrid in the Rue de Touron. But you have seen him. Sire, I went straight to the Duc de Blacas. But you will see him then? I think not, sire. Ah, I forgot said Louis, smiling in a manner which proved that all these questions were not made without a motive. I forgot that you and Mr. Noirtier were not on the best terms possible, and that is another sacrifice made to the royal cause, and for which you should be recompensed. Sir, the kindness your majesty deigns to evince toward me is a recompense which so far surpasses my utmost ambition that I have nothing more to ask for. Never mind, sir, we will not forget you. Make your mind easy. In the meanwhile, the king here detached the cross of the Legion of Honor, which he usually wore over his blue coat, near the cross of St. Louis, above the order of Notre Dame du Mont Carmel and Saint Lazare, and gave it to Viafour. In the meanwhile, take this cross. Sire, said Viafour, your majesty mistakes. This is an officer's cross. Ma foi, said Louis de Sweet, take it, such as it is, for I have not the time to procure you another blacasse. Let it be your care to see that the brevet is made out and sent to Monsieur de Villefort. Villefort's eyes were filled with tears of joy and pride. He took the cross and kissed it. And now, he said, May I inquire what are the orders with which your majesty deigns to honor me? Take what rest you require, and remember that if you are not able to serve me here in Paris, you may be of the greatest service to me and Marseille. Sire, reported Villefort, bowing, in an hour I shall have quitted Paris. 
"'Go, sir,' said the king. "'And should I forget you, king's memories are short, "'do not be afraid to bring yourself to my recollection. "'Baron, send for the minister of war. Blacas, remain.' "'Ah, sir,' said the minister of police to Villefort, "'as they left the Tuileries, "'you entered by luck's door. Your fortune is made.' "'Will it be long first? muttered Villefort, "'saluting the minister whose career was ended and looking about him for a hackney coach. One passed at the moment which he hailed. He gave his address to the driver, and, springing on, threw himself on the seat, and gave loose to dreams of ambition. Ten minutes afterward, Beaufort reached his hotel, ordered horses to be ready in two hours, and asked to have his breakfast brought to him. He was about to begin his repast, when the sound of the bell rang sharp and loud. The valet opened the door, and Villefort heard someone speak his name. "'Who would know that I was here already?' said the young man. The valet entered. "'Well,' said Villefort, "'what is it? Who rang? Who asked for me?' "'A stranger who will not send in his name.' "'A stranger who will not send in his name? What can he want with me? He wishes to speak to you.' "'To me? Yes. Did he mention my name? Yes.' "'What sort of a person is he?' "'Why, sir, a man of about fifty. "'Short or tall? About your own height, sir. "'Dark or fair? Dark. Very dark, with black eyes, black hair, black eyebrows. "'And how dressed?' asked Villefort quickly. "'In a blue frock coat, buttoned up close, decorated with the Legion of Honor. "'It is he,' said Villefort, turning pale. "'Eh, hey, pardieu,' said the individual, whose description we have twice given, entering the door. "'What a great deal of ceremony! Is it the custom in Marseilles for sons to keep their fathers waiting in their anterooms?' "'Father!' cried Villefort. "'Then I was not deceived. I felt sure it must be you.' "'Well, then, if you felt so sure,' replied the newcomer, putting his cane in a corner and his hat on a chair, "'allow me to say, my dear Gerard, that it was not very filial of you to keep me waiting at the door.' "'Leave us, Germain,' said Villefort. The servant quitted the apartment with evident signs of astonishment. So ends Chapter 11. The Corsican Ogre This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 6, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 12 Father and Son. M. Noirtier, for it was indeed he who entered, looked after the servant until the door was closed, and then, fearing no doubt that he might be overheard in the antechamber, he opened the door again. Nor was that precaution useless, as appeared from the rapid retreat of Germain, who proved that he was not exempt from the sin which ruined our first parents. M. Noirtier then took the trouble to close and bolt the antechamber door then that of the bedchamber, and then extended his hand to Villefort, who had followed all his motions with surprise which he could not conceal. "'Well, now, my dear Gerard,' he said to the young man, with a very significant look, "'do you know you seem as if you were not very glad to see me?' "'My dear father,' said Villefort, "'I am, on the contrary, delighted. But I so little expected your visit that it has somewhat overcome me. But, my dear fellow, replied M. Nautier, seating himself, I might say the same thing to you when you announce to me your wedding for the 28th of February, and on the 3rd of March you turn up here in Paris. And if I have come, my dear father, said Gerard, drawing closer to M. Nautier, do not complain. "'for it is for you that I came, and my journey will be your salvation.' "'Ah, indeed,' said M. Nautier, stretching himself out at his ease in the chair. "'Really, pray tell me all about it, for it must be interesting.' 
Father, have you heard speak of a certain Bonapartist club in the Rue Saint-Jacques? Number 53, yes, I am vice-president. Father, your coolness makes me shudder. Why, my dear boy? When a man has been proscribed by the mountaineers, has escaped from Paris in a hay-cart, has been hunted over the plains of Bordeaux by Robespierre's bloodhounds, he becomes accustomed to most things. But go on. What about the club in the Rue Saint-Jacques? Why, they induced General Quesnel to go there, and General Quesnel, who quitted his own house at nine o'clock in the evening, was found the next day in the Seine. And who told you this fine story? The king himself. Well, then, in return for your story, continued Noirtier, I will tell you another. My dear father, I think I already know what you are about to tell me. Ah, you have heard of the landing of the emperor. Not so loud, father, I entreat of you, for your own sake as well as mine. Yes, I heard the news, and knew it even before you could, for three days ago I posted from Marseilles to Paris with all possible speed, half desperate at the enforced delay. Three days ago? You are crazy. Why, three days ago the emperor had not yet landed. No matter, I was aware of his intention. How did you know about it? By a letter addressed to you from the island of Elba to me, to you, and which I discovered in the pocket-book of the messenger. Had that letter fallen into the hands of another, you, my dear father, would probably, ere this, have been shot. Villefort's father laughed. Come, come, said he. Will the restoration adopt imperial methods so promptly? Shot, my dear boy, what an idea. Where is the letter you speak of? I know you too well to suppose you would allow such a thing to pass you. I burnt it for fear that even a fragment should remain, for that letter must have led to your condemnation, and the destruction of your future prospects, replied Nortier. Yes, I can easily comprehend that, but I have nothing to fear while I have you to protect me. I do better than that, sir. I save you. You do? Why, really, the thing comes more and more dramatic. Explain yourself. I must refer again to the club in the Rue Saint-Jacques. It appears that this club is rather a bore to the police. Why didn't they search more vigilantly? They would have found, they have not found, but they are on the track. Yes, that is the usual phrase. I'm quite familiar with it. When the police is at fault, it declares that it is on the track, and the government patiently awaits the day when it comes to say, with a sneaking air, that the track is lost. Yes, but they have found a corpse. The general has been killed, and in all countries they call that a murder. A murder, do you call it? Why, there is nothing to prove that the general was murdered. People are found every day in the Seine, having thrown themselves in, or having been drowned from not knowing how to swim. Father, you know very well that the general was not a man to drown himself in despair, and people do not bathe in the Seine in the month of January. No, no, do not be deceived. There was murder in every sense of the word. And who thus designated it? The king himself. The king? I thought he was a philosopher enough to allow that there was no murder in politics. In politics, my dear fellow, you know as well as I do, there are no men but ideas, no feelings but interests. In politics, we do not kill a man, we only remove an obstacle, that is all. Would you like to know how matters have progressed? Well, I will tell you. It was thought reliance might be placed in General Quesnel. He was recommended to us from the island of Elba. One of us went to him and invited him to the Rue Saint-Jacques, where he would find some friends. He came there, and the plan was unfolded to him for leaving Elba, the projected landing, etc. When he heard and comprehended all to the fullest extent, he replied that he was a royalist. Then all looked at each other. He was made to take an oath, and he did so, but with such an ill grace that it was really tempting Providence to swear him, and yet, in spite of that, the general was allowed to depart free, perfectly free. Yet he did not return home. What could that mean, my dear fellow, that on leaving us he lost his way, that's all, a murder? Really, Villefort, you surprise me. 
You, a deputy procurer, to have found an accusation on such bad premises. Did I ever say to you, when you were fulfilling your character as a royalist, and cut off the head of one of my party, My son, you have committed a murder? No, I said very well, sir. You have gained the victory. Tomorrow, perchance, it will be our turn. But, father, take care. When our turn comes, our revenge will be sweeping. I do not understand you. You rely on the usurper's return? We do. You are mistaken. He will not advance two leagues into the interior of France without being followed, tracked, and caught like a wild beast. My dear fellow, the Emperor is at this moment on his way to Grenoble. On the 10th or 12th he will be at Lyon, and on the 20th or 25th at Paris. The people will rise, yes, to go and meet him. He has but a handful of men with him, and armies will be dispatched against him. Yes, to escort him to the capital. Really, my dear Gerard, you are but a child. You think yourself well informed, because the telegraph has told you three days after the landing. The usurper has landed at Cannes with several men he has pursued. But where is he? What is he doing? You do not know at all. And in this way they will chase him to Paris without drawing a trigger. Grenoble and Lyon are faithful cities, and will oppose to him an impassable barrier. Grenoble will open her gates to him with enthusiasm. All Lyon will hasten to welcome him, believe me. We are as well informed as you, and our police are as good as your own. Would you like proof of it? Well, you wished to conceal your journey from me, and yet I knew of your arrival half an hour after you had passed the barrier. You gave your direction to no one but your postillion, yet I have your address, and in proof I am here. At the very instant you are going to sit at your table. Ring that, if you please, for a second knife, fork, and plate, and we will dine together. Indeed, replied Villefort, looking at his father with astonishment. You really do seem to be well informed. Nay, the thing is simple enough. You who are in power have only the means that money produces. We who are in expectation have those which devotion prompts. Devotion, said Villefort with a sneer. Yes, devotion, for that is, I believe, the phrase for hopeful ambition. And Villefort's father extended his hand to the bell-rope, to summon the servant whom his son had not called. Villefort caught his arm. Wait, my dear father, said the young man. One word more. Say on. However stupid the royalist police may be, they do know one terrible thing. What is that? The description of the man who, on the morning of the day when General Quesnel disappeared, presented himself at his house. Oh, the admirable police have found that out, have they? And what may be that description? Dark complexion, hair, eyebrows, and whiskers, black, blue frock coat, buttoned up to the chin, rosette of an officer of the Legion of Honor in his buttonhole, a hat with a wide brim, and a cane. Ah, ah, that's it, is it? said Nortier. And why, then, have they not laid hands on him? Because yesterday, or the day before, they lost sight of him at the corner of the Rue Coqueron. Didn't I say that your police were good for nothing? Yes, but they may catch him yet. True, said Noirtier, looking carelessly around him. True. If this person were not on his guard, as he is, and he added with a smile, he will consequently make a few changes in his personal appearance. At these words he rose and put off his frock-coat and cravat, went towards a table on which lay his son's toilet articles, lathered his face, took a razor, and with a firm hand cut off the compromising whiskers. Theofor watched him with alarm, not devoid of admiration. His whiskers cut off, Dwartier gave another turn to his hair, and took, instead of his black cravat, a colored neckerchief, which lay at the top of an open portmanteau, put on in lieu of his blue and high-buttoned frock-coat a coat of Villefort's of dark brown, and cut away in front, tried on before a glass with a narrow-brimmed hat of his son's, which appeared to fit him perfectly, and, leaving his cane in the corner where he had deposited it, took up a small bamboo switch, and cut the air with it once or twice, and walked about with that easy swagger which was one of his principal characteristics. 
Well, he said, turning toward his wandering son when the disguise was completed, well, do you think your police will recognize me now? No, father, stammered Viafor. At least, I hope not. And now, my dear boy, continued Noirtier, I rely on your prudence to remove all the things which I leave in your care. Oh, rely on me, said Viafor. Yes, yes, and now I believe you are right, and that you have really saved my life. Be assured, I will return the favor hereafter. Viafor shook his head. You are not convinced yet. I hope at least that you may be mistaken. Shall you see the king again? Perhaps. Would you pass in his eyes for a prophet? Prophets of evil are not in favor at the court, father. True, but some day they do them justice, and supposing a second restoration, you would then pass for a great man. Well, what should I say to the king? Say this to him. Sire, you are deceived as to the feeling in France as to the opinions of the towns and the prejudices of the army. He whom in Paris you call the Corsican ogre, who at Nevers is styled the usurper, is already saluted as Bonaparte in Lyon, and Emperor in Grenoble. You think he is tracked, pursued, captured. He is advancing as rapidly as his own eagles. The soldiers you believe to be dying with hunger, worn out with fatigue, ready to desert, gather like atoms of snow about the rolling ball as it hastens forward. Sire, go, leave France to its real master, to him who acquired it not by purchase, but by right of conquest. Go, sire, that you not incur any risk, for your adversary is powerful enough to show you mercy, but because it would be humiliating for a grandson of St. Louis to owe his life to a man of Arcola, Marengo, Austerlitz. Tell him this, Gerard, or rather, tell him nothing. Keep your journey a secret. Do not boast of what you have come to Paris to do or have done. Return with all speed. Enter Marseille at night, and your house by the back door, and there remain quiet, submissive, secret, and above all inoffensive, for this time, I swear to you, we shall act like powerful men who know their enemies. Go, my son, go, my dear Gerard, and by your obedience to my paternal orders, or, if you prefer it, friendly counsels, we will keep you in your place. This will be, answered Moitier with a smile, one means by which you may a second time save me. If the political balance should some day take another turn and cast you aloft while hurling me down. Adieu, my dear Gerard, and at your next journey alight at my door. Noirtier left the room when he had finished, with the same calmness that had characterized him during the whole of his remarkable and trying conversation. Viafor, pale and agitated, ran to the window, put aside the curtain, and saw him pass, cool and collected, by two or three ill-looking men at the corner of the street, who were there, perhaps, to arrest a man with black whiskers and a blue frock coat, and a hat with a broad brim. Viafor stood watching, breathless, until his father had disappeared at the Rue Boussy. Then he turned to the various articles he had left behind him, put the black cravat and blue frock coat at the bottom of the portmanteau, threw the hat into a dark closet, broke the cane into small bits, and flung it in the fire, put on his traveling cap, and, calling his valet, checked with a look the thousand questions he was ready to ask, paid the bill, sprang into his carriage, which was ready, learned at Lyon that Bonaparte had entered Grenoble, and, in the midst of the tumult which prevailed along the road, at length reached Marseilles, a prey to all the hopes and fears which enter into the heart of a man with ambition, and its first successes. So ends Chapter 12, Father and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
Please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Yavar Murad. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Duma. Chapter 13 The Hundred Days. Monsieur Noirtier was a true prophet, and things progressed rapidly as he had predicted. Everyone knows the history of the famous return from Elba, a return which was unprecedented in the past and will probably remain without a counterpart in the future. Louis the Sixteenth made but a faint attempt to parry this unexpected blow. The monarchy he had scarcely reconstructed tottered on its precarious foundation, and at a sign from the emperor the incongruous structure of ancient prejudices and new ideas fell to the ground. Villefort, therefore, gained nothing save the king's gratitude, which was rather likely to injure him at the present time and the cross of the Legion of Honour, which he had the prudence not to wear, although Monsieur de Blacas had duly forwarded the brevet. Napoleon would, doubtless, have deprived Villefort of his office had it not been for Noirtier, who was all-powerful at the court, and thus the Girondin of 93 and the Senator of 1806 protected him who so lately had been his protector. All Villefort's influence barely enabled him to stifle the secret Dantes had so nearly divulged. The king's procurer alone was deprived of his office, being suspected of royalism. However, scarcely was the imperial power established, that is, scarcely had the emperor re-entered the Tuileries and begun to issue orders from the closet into which we have introduced our readers, he found on the table there Louis the Sixteenth's half-filled snuff-box. Scarcely had this occurred when Marseille began, in spite of the authorities, to rekindle the flames of civil war, always smouldering in the south, and it required but little to excite the populace to acts of far greater violence than the shouts and insults with which they assailed the royalists whenever they ventured abroad. Owing to this change, the worthy shipowner became at that moment, we will not say all-powerful, because Morel was a prudent and rather a timid man, so much so, that many of the most zealous partisans of Bonaparte accused him of moderation, but sufficiently influential to make a demand in favour of Dantes. Villefort retained his place, but his marriage was put off until a more favourable opportunity. If the emperor remained on the throne, Gerard required a different alliance to aid his career, if Louis the Sixteenth returned. The influence of Monsieur de saint Meran, like his own, could be vastly increased, and the marriage be still more suitable. The deputy procureur was, therefore, the first magistrate of Marseille, when one morning his door opened and Monsieur Morel was announced. Anyone else would have hastened to receive him, but Villefort was a man of ability, and he knew this would be a sign of weakness. He made Morel wait in the antechamber, although he had no one with him, for the simple reason that the king's procurer always makes one wait, and after passing a quarter of an hour in reading the papers, he ordered Monsieur Morel to be admitted. Morel expected Villefort would be dejected. He found him as he had found him six weeks before, calm firm and full of that glacial politeness, that most insurmountable barrier which separates the well-bred from the vulgar man. He had entered Villefort's office expecting that the magistrate would tremble at the sight of him. On the contrary, he felt a cold shudder all over him, when he saw Villefort sitting there with his elbows on his desk and his head leaning on his hand. He stopped at the door, Villefort gazed at him as if he had some difficulty in recognizing him. Then, after a brief interval, during which the honest shipowner turned his hats in his hand, Monsieur Morel, I believe, said Villefort. Yes, sir. Come nearer, said the magistrate, with a patronizing wave of the hand, and tell me to what circumstance I owe the honor of this visit. Do you not guess, monsieur? asked Morel. Not in the least, but if I can serve you in any way, I shall be delighted. Everything depends on you. Explain yourself, pray. Monsieur, said Morel, recovering his assurance as he proceeded, 
Do you recollect that a few days before the landing of His Majesty the Emperor, I came to intercede for a young man, the mate of my ship, who was accused of being concerned in correspondence with the island of Elba? What was the other day a crime is today a title to favor. You then served Louis the Sixteenth, and you did not show any favor. It was your duty. Today you serve Napoleon, and you ought to protect him. It is equally your duty. I come, therefore, to ask what has become of him. Villefort, by a strong effort, sought to control himself. What is his name? said he. Tell me his name. Edmond Dantes. Villefort would probably had rather stood the opposite muzzle of a pistol at five and twenty paces than have heard this name spoken, but he did not blanch. Dantes, repeated he. Edmond Dantes. Yes, monsieur. Villefort opened a large register, then went to a table. From the table turned to his registers, and then turning to Morel, Are you quite sure you are not mistaken, monsieur? said he, in the most natural tone in the world. Had Morel been a more quick-sighted man, or better versed in these matters, he would have been surprised at the king's procurer answering him on such a subject, instead of referring him to the governors of the prison or the prefect of the department. But Morel, disappointed in his expectations of exciting fear, was conscious only of the other's condescension. Villefort had calculated rightly. No, said Morel, I am not mistaken. I have known him for ten years, the last four of which he was in my service. Do not you recollect? I came about six weeks ago to plead for clemency, as I come today to plead for justice. You received me very coldly. Oh, the royalists were very severe with the Bonapartists in those days. Monsieur, returned Villefort, I was then a royalist, because I believed the Bourbons not only the heirs to the throne, but the chosen of the nation. The miraculous return of Napoleon has conquered me. The legitimate monarch is he who is loved by his people. That's right, cried Morel. I like to hear you speak thus, and I augur well for Edmund for him. Wait a moment, said Villefort, turning over the leaves of a register. I have it. A sailor who was about to marry a young Catalan girl. I recollect it now. It was a very serious charge. How so? You know that when he left here, he was taken to the Palais de Justice. Well? I made my report to the authorities at Paris, and a week after he was carried off. Carried off? said Morel. What can they have done with him? Oh, he has been taken to Fenestrels, to Pinerol, or to the St. Margaret Islands. Some fine morning he will return to take command of your vessel. Come when he will, it shall be kept for him. But how is it he is not already returned? It seems to me the first care of government should be to set at liberty those who have suffered for their adherence to it. Do not be too hasty, Monsieur Morel, replied Villefort. The order of imprisonment came from high authority, and the order for his liberation must proceed from the same source. And, as, as Napoleon has scarcely been reinstated a fortnight, the letters have not yet been forwarded. But, said Morel, is there no way of expediting all these formalities, of releasing him from arrest? There has been no arrest. How? It is sometimes essential to government to cause a man's disappearance without leaving any traces, so that no written forms or documents may defeat their wishes. It might be so under the Bourbons, but at present... It has always been so, my dear Morel, since the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. The Emperor is more strict in prison discipline than even Louis himself, and the number of prisoners whose names are not on the register is incalculable. Had Morel even any suspicions, so much kindness would have dispelled them. Well, Monsieur de Villefort, how would you advise me to act? asked he. Petition the minister. Oh, I know what that is. The minister receives two hundred petitions every day and does not read three. That is true. 
but he will read a petition countersigned and presented by me. And will you undertake to deliver it? With the greatest pleasure. Dantes was then guilty, and now he is innocent, and it is as much my duty to free him as it was to condemn him. Villefort thus forestalled any danger of an inquiry, which, however improbable it might be, if it did take place, would leave him defenceless. But how shall I address the minister? Sit down there, said Villefort, giving up his place to Morel, and write what I dictate. Will you be so good? Certainly. But lose no time, we have lost too much already. That is true. Only think what the poor fellow may even now be suffering. Villefort shuddered at the suggestion, but he had gone too far to draw back. Dantes must be crushed to gratify Villefort's ambition. Villefort dictated a petition in which, from an excellent intention, no doubt, Dantes' patriotic services were exaggerated, and he was made out one of the most active agents of Napoleon's return. It was evident that at the sight of this document, the minister would instantly release him. The petition finished, Villefort read it aloud. That will do, said he. Leave the rest to me. Will the petition go soon? Today. Countersigned by you? The best thing I can do will be to certify the truth of the contents of your petition. And, sitting down, Villefort wrote the certificate at the bottom. Dantes remained a prisoner and heard not the noise of the fall of Louis the Eighteenth's throne or the still more tragic destruction of the empire. Twice during the hundred days had Morel renewed his demand, and twice had Villefort soothed him with promises. At last there was Waterloo, and Morel came no more. He had done all that was in his power, and any fresh attempt would only compromise him uselessly. Louis the Eighteenth remounted the throne. Villefort, to whom he to whom Marseille had become filled with remorseful memories, sought and obtained the situation of king's procurer at Toulouse, and a fortnight afterwards he married Mademoiselle de saint Maron, whose father now stood higher at court than ever. And so Dantes, after the hundred days and after Waterloo, remained in his dungeon, forgotten of earth and heaven. Danglars comprehended the full extent of the wretched fate that overwhelmed Dantes, and when Napoleon returned to France, he, after the manner of mediocre minds, deemed the coincidence a degree of providence. But when Napoleon returned to Paris, Danglars' heart failed him, and he lived in constant fear of Dante's return on a mission of vengeance. He therefore informed M. Morel of his wish to quit the sea, and obtained a recommendation from him to a Spanish merchant, into whose service he entered at the end of March that is, ten or twelve days after Napoleon's return. He then left for Madrid and was heard no more of. Fernand understood nothing except that Dantes was absent. What had become of him he cared not to inquire. Only, during the respite the absence of his rival afforded him, he reflected, partly on the means of deceiving Mercedes as to the cause of his absence, partly on plans of emigration and abduction, as from time to time he sat and motionless on the summit of Cape Faro, at the spot from whence Marseilles and the Catalans are visible, watching for the apparition of a young and handsome man, who was for him also the messenger of vengeance. Fernand's mind was made up. He would shoot Dantes and then kill himself. But Fernand was mistaken. A man of his disposition never kills himself, for he constantly helps. During this time, the empire made its last conscription, and every man in France capable of bearing arms rushed to obey the summons of the emperor. Fernand departed with the rest, bearing with him the terrible thought that while he was away, his rival would perhaps return and marry Mercedes. Had Fernand really meant to kill himself, he would have done so when he parted from Mercedes. His devotion and the compassion he showed for her misfortunes produced the effect they always produce on noble minds. Mercedes had always had a sincere regard for Fernand, and this was now strengthened by gratitude. My brother, said she, as she placed his knapsack on his shoulders, be careful of yourself, for if you are killed, I shall be alone in this world. These words carried a ray of hope into Fernand's heart. Should Dantes not return, 
Mercedes might one day be his. Mercedes was left alone to face face with the vast plain that had never seemed so barren and the sea that had never seemed so vast. Bathed in tears, she wandered about the Catalan village. Sometimes she stood mute and motionless as a statue, looking towards Marseille, at other times gazing on the sea and debating as to whether it were not better to cast herself into the abyss of the ocean and thus end her woes. It was not want of courage that prevented her putting this resolution into execution, but her religious feelings came to her aid and saved her. Caderousse was, like Fernand, enrolled in the army, but, being married and eight years older, he was merely sent to the frontier. Old Dantes, who was only sustained by hope, lost all hope and Napoleon's downfall. Five months after he had been separated from his son, and almost at the hour of his arrest, he bequeathed his last in Mercedes' arms. Monsieur Morel paid the expenses of his funeral, and a few small debts the old poor man had contracted. There was more than benevolence in this action. There was courage. The South was aflame, and to assist, even on his deathbed, the father of so dangerous a Bonapartist as Dantes was stigmatized as a crime. End of chapter 13「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 14 The Two Prisoners A year after Louis the Eighteenth's restoration, a visit was made by the Inspector General of Prisons. Dantes in his cell heard the noise of preparation. Sounds that at the depth where he lay would have been inaudible to any but the ear of a prisoner, who could hear the splash of the drop of water that every hour fell from the roof of his dungeon. He guessed something uncommon was passing among the living, but he had so long ceased to have any intercourse with the world that he looked upon himself as dead. The inspector visited, one after another, the cells and dungeons of several of the prisoners, whose good behaviour or stupidity recommended them to the clemency of the government. He inquired how they were fed, and if they had any request to make. The universal response was that the fare was detestable, and that they wanted to be set free. The inspector asked if they had anything else to ask for. They shook their heads. What could they desire beyond their liberty? The inspector turned smilingly to the governor. I do not know what reason government can assign for these useless visits. When you see one prisoner, you see all. Always the same thing. Ill-fed and innocent. Are there any others? Yes. The dangerous and mad prisoners are in the dungeons. Let us visit them, then, said the inspector with an air of fatigue. We must play the farce to the end. Let us see the dungeons. Let us first send for two soldiers, said the governor. The prisoner sometimes, through mere uneasiness of life, and in order to be sentenced to death, commit acts of useless violence, and you might fall a victim. "'Take all needful precautions,' replied the inspector. Two soldiers were accordingly sent for, and the inspector descended a stairway, so foul, so humid, so dark, as to be loathsome to sight, smell, and respiration. "'Oh!' cried the inspector. "'Who can live here?' "'A most dangerous conspirator, a man we are ordered to keep the most strict watch over, as he is daring and resolute.' "'He is alone?' "'Certainly.' "'How long has he been there?' "'Nearly a year.' "'Was he placed here when he first arrived?' "'No, not until he attempted to kill the turnkey, who took his food to him.' "'To kill the turnkey?' "'Yes, the very one who is lighting us. Is it not true, Antoine?' "'Asked the governor. "'True enough. He wanted to kill me.' "'Return the turnkey. "'He must be mad,' said the inspector. 
"'He is worse than that. He is a devil,' returned the turnkey. "'Shall I complain of him?' demanded the inspector. "'Oh, no, it is useless. Besides, he is almost mad now, and in another year he will be quite so. "'So much the better for him. He will suffer less,' said the inspector. "'He was, as this remark shows, a man full of philanthropy, and in every way fit for his office.' "'You are right, sir,' replied the governor, "'and this remark proves that you have deeply considered the subject. "'Now we have in a dungeon about twenty feet distant, "'and to which you descended by another stair, "'an abbey, formerly leader of a party in Italy, "'who has been here since 1811, "'and in 1813 he went mad, and the change is astonishing. "'He used to weep. He now laughs. "'He grew thin. He now grows fat.' "'You had better see him, for his madness is amusing.' "'I will see them both,' returned the inspector. "'I must conscientiously perform my duty.' "'This was the inspector's first visit. "'He wished to display his authority. "'Let us visit this one first, added he. "'By all means,' replied the governor, "'and he signed to the turnkey to open the door.' At the sound of the key turning in the lock, and the creaking of the hinges, Dantes, who was crouched in a corner of the dungeon, whence he could see the ray of light that came through a narrow iron grating above, raised his head. Seeing a stranger, escorted by two turnkeys, holding torches and accompanied by two soldiers, and to whom the governor spoke bareheaded, Dantes, who guessed the truth, and that the moment to address himself to the superior authorities was come, sprung forward with clasped hands. The soldiers interposed their bayonets, for they thought that he was about to attack the inspector, and the latter recoiled two or three steps. Dante saw that he was looked upon as dangerous. Then, infusing all the humility he possessed into his eyes and voice, he addressed the inspector, and sought to inspire him with pity. The inspector listened attentively, then, turning to the governor, observed, "'He will become religious. He is already more gentle. He is afraid, and retreated before the bayonets. Madmen are not afraid of anything. I made some curious observations on this. At Charenton.' Then, turning to the prisoner, "'What is it you want?' said he. "'I want to know what crime I have committed.' to be tried, and if I am guilty, to be shot, if innocent, to be set at liberty. "'Are you well fed?' said the inspector. "'I believe so. I don't know. It's of no consequence. What matters really, not only to me, but to officers of justice and the king, is that an innocent man should languish in prison, the victim of an infamous denunciation, to die here cursing his executioners. "'You are very humble to-day.' "'remarked the governor. "'You are not always so. "'The other day, for instance, when you tried to kill the turnkey.' "'It is true, sir, and I beg his pardon, "'for he has always been very good to me. "'But I was mad. "'Are you not so any longer?' "'No. "'Captivity has subdued me. "'I have been here so long.' "'So long? "'When were you arrested, then?' "'asked the inspector.' the 28th of February, 1815, at half-past two in the afternoon. Today is the 30th of July, 1816. Why, it is but seventeen months. Only seventeen months? replied Dantes. Oh, you do not know what is seventeen months in prison. Seventeen ages, rather, especially to a man who, like me, had arrived at the summit of his ambition. To a man who, like me, was on the point of marrying a woman he adored, who saw an honourable career opened before him, and who loses all in an instant, who sees his prospects destroyed, and is ignorant of the fate of his affianced wife, and whether his aged father be living. Seventy months' captivity to a sailor accustomed to the boundless ocean is a worse punishment than human crime ever merited. Have pity on me, then, and ask for me, not intelligence, but a trial. Not pardon, but a verdict. A trial, sir, I only ask for that. 
that surely cannot be denied to one who is accused. "'We shall see,' said the inspector, turning to the governor. "'On my word, the poor devil touches me. "'You must show me the proofs against him.' "'Certainly, but you will find terrible charges.' "'Monsieur,' continued Dantes, "'I know it is not in your power to release me, "'but you can plead for me. "'You can have me tried, and that is all I ask. "'Let me know my crime and the reason why I am condemned. "'Uncertainty is worse than all.' "'Go on with the lights.' "'said the inspector. "'Monsieur,' cried Dantes, "'I can tell by your voice you are touched with pity. "'Tell me at least to hope.' "'I cannot tell you that,' replied the inspector. "'I can only promise to examine into your case.' "'Oh, I am free. Then I am saved. "'Who arrested you?' "'Monsieur Villefort. See him and hear what he says.' Monsieur Villefort is no longer at Marseilles. He is now at Toulouse. I am no longer surprised at my detention, murmured Dantes, since my only protector is removed. Had Monsieur de Villefort any cause of personal dislike to you? None. On the contrary, he was very kind to me. I can, then, rely on the notes he has left concerning you? Entirely. That is well. "'Wait patiently, then.' "'Dantes fell on his knees and prayed earnestly. "'The door closed, "'but this time a fresh inmate was left with Dantes. "'Hope. "'Will you see the register at once?' "'asked the governor, "'or proceed to the other cell. "'Let us visit them all,' said the inspector. "'If I once went up those stairs, "'I should never have the courage to come down again.' "'Ah, this one is not like the other, "'and his madness is less affecting "'than this one's display of reason. "'What is his folly? "'He fancies he possesses an immense treasure. "'The first year he offered government "'a million of francs for his release, "'the second, two, the third, three, "'and so on progressively. "'He is now in his fifth year of captivity. "'He will ask to speak to you in private "'and offer you five millions. "'How curious!' "'What is his name?' "'The Abbe Faria. "'Number twenty-seven, said the inspector. "'It is here. Unlock the door, Antoine.' "'The turnkey obeyed, "'and the inspector gazed curiously into the chamber of the mad Abbey. "'In the centre of the cell, in a circle traced with a fragment of plaster detached from the wall, "'sat a man whose tattered garments scarcely covered him.' He was drawing in this circle geometrical lines, and seemed as much absorbed in his problem as Archimedes was when the soldier of Marcellus slew him. He did not move at the sound of the door, and continued his calculations, until the flash of the torches lighted up with an unwanted glare the sombre walls of his cell. Then, raising his head, he perceived with astonishment the number of persons present, he hastily seized the coverlet of his bed and wrapped it round him. "'What is it you want?' said the inspector. "'Hi, monsieur,' replied the abbey with an air of surprise. "'I want nothing.' "'You do not understand,' continued the inspector. "'I am sent here by government to visit the prison and hear the requests of the prisoners.' "'Oh, that is different,' cried the abbey. "'And we shall understand each other, I hope.' "'There now,' whispered the governor. "'It is just as I told you.' "'Monsieur,' continued the prisoner, "'I am the Abbe Ferrari, born at Rome. "'I was for twenty years Cardinal Spader's secretary. "'I was arrested, why I know not, "'toward the beginning of the year 1811. "'Since then I have demanded my liberty "'from the Italian and French government. "'Why from the French government? "'Because I was arrested at Piombino.' "'and I presume that, like Milan and Florence, "'Piombino has become the capital of some French department.' "'Ah,' said the inspector, "'you have not heard the latest news from Italy?' "'My information dates from the day on which I was arrested,' "'returned the Abbe Ferrara, "'and as the Emperor had created the kingdom of Rome for his infant son, "'I presume that he has realised the dream of Machiavelli, 
and Caesar Borgia, which was to make Italy a united kingdom. Monsieur, returned the inspector, Providence has changed this gigantic plan you advocate so warmly. It is the only means of rendering Italy strong, happy, and independent. Very possibly, only I am not come to discuss politics, but to inquire if you have anything to ask or to complain of. The food is the same as in other prisons. That is very bad. The lodging is very unhealthful, but, on the whole, passable for a dungeon. And it is not that which I wish to speak of, but a secret I have to reveal of the greatest importance. We are coming to the point, whispered the governor. It is for that reason that I am delighted to see you, continued the abbey. Although you have disturbed me in a most important calculation, which, if it succeed, would possibly change Newton's system. Could you allow me a few words in private? What did I tell you? said the governor. You knew him, returned the inspector with a smile. What you ask is impossible, monsieur, continued he, addressing Ferraria. But, said the abbey, I would speak to you of a large sum amounting to five millions. The very sum you named, whispered the inspector in his turn. However, continued Ferraria, seeing that the inspector was about to depart. It is not absolutely necessary for us to be alone. The governor can be present. Unfortunately, said the governor, I know beforehand what you are about to say. It concerns your treasures, does it not? Ferraria fixed his eyes on him with an expression that would have convinced anyone else of his sanity. Of course, said he, of what else should I speak? "'Mr. Inspector,' continued the Governor, "'I can tell you the story as well as he, "'for it has been dined in my ears for the last four or five years.' "'That proves,' returned the Abbey, "'that you are like those of Holy Writ, "'who having ears hear not, and having eyes see not. "'My dear sir, the Government is rich and does not want your treasures,' "'replied the Inspector.' Keep them until you are liberated. The abbey's eyes glistened. He seized the inspector's hand. But what if I am not liberated? cried he, and am detained here until my death. This treasure will be lost. Had not government better profit by it? I will offer six millions, and I will content myself with the rest, if they will only give me my liberty. On my word, said the inspector in a low tone, had I not been told beforehand that this man was mad, I should believe what he says. "'I am not mad,' replied Ferraria, with the acuteness of hearing peculiar to prisoners. "'The treasure I speak of really exists, and I offer to sign an agreement with you, in which I promise to lead you to the spot where you shall dig, and if I deceive you, bring me here again. I ask no more.' The governor laughed. "'Is the spot far from here?' "'A hundred leagues.' "'It is not ill-planned,' said the governor. "'If all the prisoners took it into their heads to travel a hundred leagues, "'and their guardians consented to accompany them, "'they would have a capital chance of escaping.' "'The scheme is well known,' said the inspector, "'and the abbey's plan has not even the merit of originality.' "'Then, turning to Ferraria, "'I inquired if you were well fed,' said he. "'Swear to me,' replied Ferraria, "'to free me if what I tell you prove true, "'and I will stay here while you go to the spot.' "'Are you well fed?' repeated the inspector. "'Monsieur, you run no risk, for, as I told you, "'I will stay here, so there is no chance of my escaping.' "'You do not reply to my question,' replied the inspector impatiently. "'Nor you to mine,' cried the abbey. "'You will not accept my gold. "'I will keep it for myself. "'You refuse me my liberty. "'God will give it me.' "'And the abbey, casting away his coverlet, "'resumed his place and continued his calculations. "'What is he doing there?' said the inspector. "'Counting his treasures,' replied the governor. 
Ferrari replied to this sarcasm with a glance of profound contempt. The turnkey closed the door behind them. "'He was wealthy once, perhaps?' said the inspector. "'Or dreamed he was, and awoke mad.' "'After all,' said the inspector, "'if he had been rich, he would not have been here.' So the matter ended for the Abbey Ferraria. He remained in his cell, and this visit only increased the belief of his insanity. Caligula or Nero, those treasure-seekers, those desirers of the impossible, would have accorded to the poor wretch, in exchange for his wealth, the liberty he so earnestly prayed for. But the kings of modern times, restrained by the limits of mere probability, have neither courage nor desire. They fear the ear that hears their orders, and the eye that scrutinizes their actions. Formerly they believed themselves sprung from Jupiter, and shielded by their birth, but nowadays they are not invulnerable. It has always been against the policy of despotic governments to suffer the victims of their persecutions to reappear. As the Inquisition rarely allowed its victims to be seen with their limbs distorted and their flesh lacerated by torture, so madness is always concealed in its cell. From whence, should it depart, it is conveyed to some gloomy hospital, where the doctor has no thought for man or mind in the mutilated being the jailer delivers to him. The very madness of the Abbey Ferraria, gone mad in prison, condemned him to the perpetual captivity. The inspector kept his word with Dantes. He examined the register and found the following note concerning him. Edmund Dantes, violent Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from Elba. The greatest watchfulness and care to be exercised. This note was in a different hand from the rest, which showed that it had been added since his confinement. The inspector could not contend against this accusation. He simply wrote, Nothing to be done. This visit had infused new vigour into Dantes. He had, till then, forgotten the date. But now, with a fragment of plaster, he wrote the date, 30th of July, 1816, and made a mark every day, in order not to lose his reckoning again. Days and weeks passed away, then months. Dantes still waited. He at first expected to be freed in a fortnight. This fortnight expired. He decided that the inspector would do nothing until his return to Paris, and that he would not reach there until his circuit was finished. He therefore fixed three months. Three months passed away, then six more. Finally ten months and a half had gone by, and no favourable change had taken place. And Dantes began to fancy the inspector's visit but a dream, an illusion of the brain. At the expiration of a year, the governor was transferred. He had obtained charge of the fortress at Ham. He took with him several of his subordinates, and amongst them Dantes' jailer. A new governor arrived. It would have been too tedious to acquire the names of the prisoners. He learned their numbers instead. This horrible place contained fifty cells. Their inhabitants were designated by the numbers of their cell and the unhappy young man was no longer called Edmund Dantes. He was now number 34. End of chapter 14. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith. Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 15 Number 34 and Number 27 Dante passed through all the stages of torture natural to prisoners in suspense. He was sustained at first by that pride of conscious innocence which is the sequence to hope. Then he began to doubt his own innocence, which justified in some measure the governor's belief in his mental alienation. And then, relaxing his sentiment of pride, he addressed his supplications not to God, but to man. God is always the last resource. 
Unfortunates, who ought to begin with God, do not have any hope in him till they have exhausted all other means of deliverance. Dante asked to be removed from his present dungeon into another, for a change, however disadvantageous, was still a change, and would afford him some amusement. He entreated to be allowed to walk about, to have fresh air, books, and writing materials. His requests were not granted, but he went on asking all the same. He accustomed himself to speaking to the new jailer, although the latter was, if possible, more taciturn than the old one but still to speak to a man even though mute was something dante spoke for the sake of hearing his own voice he had tried to speak when alone but the sound of his voice terrified him often before his captivity dante's mind had revolted at the idea of assemblages of prisoners made up of thieves vagabonds and murderers he now wished to be amongst them in order to see some other face besides that of his jailer he sighed for the galleys with the infamous costume, the chain, and the brand on the shoulder. The galley slaves breathed the fresh air of heaven and saw each other. They were very happy. He besought the jailer one day to let him have a companion, were it even the mad abbey. The jailer, though rough and hardened by the constant sight of so much suffering, was yet a man. At the bottom of his heart he had often had a feeling of pity for this unhappy young man who suffered so, and he laid the request of number thirty-four before the governor. But the latter sapiently imagined that Dante wished to conspire or attempt an escape, and refused his request. Dante had exhausted all human resources, and he then turned to God. All the pious ideas that had been so long forgotten returned. He recollected the prayers his mother had taught him, and discovered a new meaning in every word, for in prosperity prayers seem but a mere medley of words, until misfortune comes, and the unhappy sufferer first understands the meaning of the sublime language in which he invokes the pity of heaven. He prayed and prayed aloud, no longer terrified at the sound of his own voice, for he fell into a sort of ecstasy. He laid every action of his life before the Almighty, proposed tasks to accomplish, and at the end of every prayer introduced the entreaty oftener addressed to man than to God, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Yet, in spite of his earnest prayers, Dante remained a prisoner. Then gloom settled heavily upon him. Dante was a man of great simplicity of thought, and without education. He could not, therefore, in the solitude of his dungeon, traverse in mental vision the history of the ages, bring to life the nations that had perished, and rebuild the ancient cities so vast and stupendous in the light of the imagination, and the past before the eye glowing with celestial colors in Martin's Babylonian pictures. He could not do this, he whose past life was so short, whose present so melancholy, and his future so doubtful nineteen years of light to reflect upon in eternal darkness no distraction could come to his aid his energetic spirit that would have exulted in thus revisiting the past was imprisoned like an eagle in a cage he clung to one idea that of his happiness destroyed without apparent cause by an unheard of fatality he considered and reconsidered this idea devoured it so to speak as the implacable Ugolino devours the skull of Archbishop Roger in the Inferno of Dante. Rage supplanted religious fervor. Dante uttered blasphemies that made his jailer recoil with horror, dashed himself furiously against the walls of his prison, wreaked his anger upon everything, and chiefly upon himself, so that the least thing, a grain of sand, a straw, or a breath of air that annoyed him, led to paroxysms of fury. Then the letter that Villefort had showed to him recurred to his mind, and every line gleamed forth in fiery letters on the wall like the many tekel ufarsen of Belshazzar. He told himself that it was the enmity of man, and not the vengeance of heaven, that had thus plunged him into the deepest misery. He consigned his unknown persecutors to the most horrible tortures he could imagine, and found them all insufficient, because after torture came death and after death, if not repose, at least the boon of unconsciousness. 
by dint of constantly dwelling on the idea that tranquillity was death and if punishment were the end in view other tortures than death must be invented he began to reflect on suicide unhappy he who on the brink of misfortune broods over ideas like these before him is a dead sea that stretches in azure calm before the eye but he who unwarily ventures within its embrace finds himself struggling with a monster that would drag him down to perdition once thus ensnared unless the protecting hand of god snatch him thence all is over and his struggles but tend to hasten his destruction this state of mental anguish is however less terrible than the sufferings that proceed or the punishment that possibly will follow there is a sort of consolation at the contemplation of the yawning abyss at the bottom of which lie darkness and obscurity edmund found some solace in these ideas all his sorrows all his sufferings with their train of gloomy spectres fled from his cell when the angel of death seemed about to enter dante reviewed his past life with composure and looking forward with terror to his future existence chose that middle line that seemed to afford him a refuge sometimes said he in my voyages when i was a man and commanded other men i have seen the heavens overcast the sea rage and foam the storm arise and like a monstrous bird beating the two horizons with its wings then i felt that my vessel was a vain refuge that trembled and shook before the tempest soon the fury of the waves and the sight of the sharp rocks announced the approach of death and death then terrified me and i used all my skill and intelligence as a man and a sailor to struggle against the wrath of god but i did so because i was happy because i had not courted death because to be cast upon a bed of rocks and seaweed seemed terrible because i was unwilling that i a creature made for the service of god should serve for food to the gulls and ravens but now it is different i have lost all that bound me to life death smiles and invites me to repose i die after my own manner i die exhausted and broken-spirited as i fall asleep when i have paced three thousand times round my cell no sooner had this idea taken possession of him than he became more composed arranged his couch to the best of his power ate little and slept less and found existence almost supportable because he felt that he could throw it off at pleasure like a worn-out garment two methods of self-destruction were at his disposal he could hang himself with his handkerchief to the window bars or refuse food and die of starvation but the first was repugnant to him dante has always entertained the greatest horror of pirates who are hung up to the yard-arm he would not die by what seemed an infamous death he resolved to adopt the second and began that day to carry out his resolve nearly four years had passed away at the end of the second he had ceased to mark the lapse of time dante said i wish to die and had chosen the manner of his death and fearful of changing his mind he had taken an oath to die when my morning and evening meals are brought thought he i will cast them out of the window and they will think that i have eaten them he kept his word twice a day he cast out through the barred aperture the provisions his jailer brought him at first gaily then with deliberation and at last with regret nothing but the recollection of his oath gave him strength to proceed hunger made viands once repugnant now acceptable he held the plate in his hand for an hour at a time and gazed thoughtfully at the morsel of bad meat of tainted fish of black and mouldy bread it was the last yearning for life contending with the resolution of despair then his dungeon seemed less somber his prospects less desperate he was still young he was only four or five and twenty he had nearly fifty years to live what unforeseen events might not open his prison door and restore him to liberty then he raised to his lips the repast that like a voluntary tantalus he refused himself but he thought of his oath and he would not break it he persisted until at last he had not sufficient strength to rise and cast his supper out of the loophole the next morning he could not see or hear the jailer feared he was dangerously ill 
Edmund hoped he was dying. Thus the day passed away. Edmund felt a sort of stupor creeping over him, which brought with it a feeling almost of content. The gnawing pain at his stomach had ceased. His thirst had abated. When he closed his eyes he saw myriads of lights dancing before them like the will-o'-the-wisps that play about the marshes. It was the twilight of that mysterious country called death. Suddenly, about nine o'clock in the evening, Edmund heard a hollow sound in the wall against which he was lying. So many loathsome animals inhabited the prison that their noise did not in general awake him, but whether abstinence had quickened his faculties, or whether the noise was really louder than usual, Edmund raised his head and listened. It was a continual scratching, as if made by a huge claw, a powerful tooth, or some iron instrument attacking the stones. Although weakened, the young man's brain instantly responded to the idea that haunts all prisoners. Liberty! It seemed to him that heaven had at length taken pity on him, and had sent this noise to warn him on the very brink of the abyss. Perhaps one of those beloved ones he had so often thought of was thinking of him, and striving to diminish the distance that separated them. No, no, doubtless he was deceived, and it was but one of those dreams that forerun death. Edmund still heard the sound. It lasted nearly three hours. He then heard a noise of something falling, and all was silent. Some hours afterwards it began again, nearer and more distinct. Edmund was intensely interested. Suddenly the jailer entered. For a week since he had resolved to die, and during the four days that he had been carrying out his purpose, Edmund had not spoken to the attendant, had not answered him when he inquired what was the matter with him, and turned his face to the wall when he looked too curiously at him. But now the jailer might hear the noise and put an end to it, and so destroy a ray of something like hope that soothed his last moments. The jailer brought him his breakfast. Dante raised himself up, and began to talk about everything, about the bad quality of the food, about the coldness of his dungeon, grumbling and complaining, in order to have an excuse for speaking louder, and wearying the patience of his jailer, who out of kindness of heart had brought broth and white bread for his prisoner. Fortunately, he fancied that Dante was delirious, and placing the food on the rickety table he withdrew. Edmund listened, and the sound became more and more distinct. "'There can be no doubt about it,' thought he. "'It is some prisoner who is striving to obtain his freedom. Oh, if I were only there to help him!' Suddenly another idea took possession of his mind, so used to misfortune that it was scarcely capable of hope. The idea that the noise was made by workmen the governor had ordered to repair the neighboring dungeon. It was easy to ascertain this, but how could he risk the question? It was easy to call his jailer's attention to the noise, and watch his countenance as he listened. But might he not by this means destroy hopes far more important than the short-lived satisfaction of his own curiosity? Unfortunately, Edmund's brain was still so feeble that he could not bend his thoughts to anything in particular. He saw but one means of restoring lucidity and clearness to his judgment. He turned his eyes towards the soup which the jailer had brought, rose, staggered towards it, raised the vessel to his lips, and drank off the contents with a feeling of indescribable pleasure. He had often heard that shipwrecked persons had died through having eagerly devoured too much food. Edmund replaced on the table the bread he was about to devour, and returned to his couch. He did not wish to die. He soon felt that his ideas became again collected. He could think, and strengthen his thoughts by reasoning. Then he said to himself, I must put this to the test, but without compromising anybody. If it is a workman, I need but knock against the wall, and he will cease to work, in order to find out who is knocking, and why he does so. But as his occupation is sanctioned by the governor, he will soon resume it. If, on the contrary, it is a prisoner, the noise I make will alarm him. He will cease, and not begin again, until he thinks every one is asleep. Edmund rose again, but this time his legs did not tremble, and his sight was clear. 
He went to a corner of his dungeon, detached a stone, and with it knocked against the wall where the sound came. He struck thrice. At the first blow the sound ceased, as if by magic. Edmund listened intently. An hour passed. Two hours passed. And no sound was heard from the wall. All was silent there. Full of hope, Edmund swallowed a few mouthfuls of bread and water, and, thanks to the vigor of his constitution, found himself well-nigh recovered. The day passed away in utter silence. Night came without recurrence of the noise. "'It is a prisoner,' said Edmund joyfully. The night passed in perfect silence. Edmund did not close his eyes. In the morning the jailer brought him fresh provisions. He had already devoured those of the previous day. He ate these, listening anxiously for the sound, walking round and round his cell, shaking the iron bars of the loophole, restoring vigor and agility to his limbs by exercise, and so preparing himself for his future destiny. At intervals he listened to learn if the noise had not begun again, and grew impatient at the prudence of the prisoner, who did not guess he had been disturbed by a captive as anxious for liberty as himself. Three days passed, seventy-two long, tedious hours, which he counted off by minutes. At length, one evening, as the jailer was visiting him for the last time that night, Dante, with his ear for the hundredth time at the wall, fancied he heard an almost imperceptible movement among the stones. He moved away, walked up and down his cell to collect his thoughts, and then went back and listened. The matter was no longer doubtful. Something was at work on the other side of the wall. The prisoner had discovered the danger, and had substituted a lever for a chisel. Encouraged by this discovery, Edmund determined to assist the indefatigable laborer. He began by moving his bed, and looked around for anything with which he could pierce the wall, penetrate the moist cement, and displace a stone. He saw nothing. He had no knife or sharp instrument. The window grating was of iron, but he had too often assured himself of its solidity. All his furniture consisted of a bed, a chair, a table, a pail, and a jug. The bed had iron clamps, but they were screwed to the wood, and it would have required a screwdriver to take them off. The table and chair had nothing. The pail had once possessed a handle, but that had been removed. Dante had but one resource, which was to break the jug, and with one of the sharp fragments attack the wall. He let the jug fall on the floor, and it broke in pieces. Dante concealed two or three of the sharpest fragments in his bed, leaving the rest on the floor. The breaking of his jug was too natural an accident to excite suspicion. Edmund had all the night to work in, but in the darkness he could not do much, and he soon felt that he was working against something very hard. He pushed back his bed and waited for day. All night he heard the subterranean workman, who continued to mine his way. Day came, the jailer entered. Dante told him that the jug had fallen from his hands while he was drinking, and the jailer went grumblingly to fetch another, without giving himself the trouble to remove the fragments of the broken one. He returned speedily, advised the prisoner to be more careful, and departed. Dante heard joyfully the key grate in the lock. He listened until the sound of steps died away, and then, hastily displacing his bed, saw by the faint light that penetrated into his cell that he had labored uselessly the previous evening in attacking the stone instead of removing the plaster that surrounded it. The damp had rendered it friable, and Dante was able to break it off, in small morsels, it is true, but at the end of half an hour he had scraped off a handful. A mathematician might have calculated that in two years, supposing that the rock was not encountered, a passage twenty feet long and two feet broad might be formed. The prisoner reproached himself with not having thus employed the hours he had passed in vain hopes, prayer, and despondency. During the six years that he had been imprisoned, what might he not have accomplished? In three days he had succeeded, with the utmost precaution, in removing the cement and exposing the stonework. The wall was built of rough stones, among which, to give strength to the structure, blocks of hewn stone were at intervals embedded. It was one of these he had uncovered, and which he must remove from its socket. Dante strove to do this with his nails, but they were too weak. 
the fragments of the jug broke, and after an hour of useless toil he paused. Was he to be thus stopped at the beginning, and was he to wait inactive until his fellow workmen had completed his task? Suddenly an idea occurred to him. He smiled, and the perspiration dried on his forehead. The jailer always brought Dante's soup in an iron saucepan. This saucepan contained soup for both prisoners, for Dante had noticed that it was either quite full or half empty, according as the turnkey gave it to him or to his companion first. The handle of the saucepan was of iron. Dante would have given ten years of his life in exchange for it. The jailer was accustomed to pour the contents of the saucepan into Dante's plate, and Dante, after eating his soup with a wooden spoon, washed the plate, which thus served for every day. Now, when evening came, Dante put his plate on the ground near the door. The jailer, as he entered, stepped on it and broke it. This time he could not blame Dante. He was wrong to leave it there, but the jailer was wrong not to have looked before him. The jailer, therefore, only grumbled. Then he looked about for something to pour the soup into. Dante's entire dinner service consisted of one plate. There was no alternative. "'Leave the saucepan,' said Dante. "'You can take it away when you bring me my breakfast.' This advice was to the jailer's taste, as it spared him the necessity of making another trip. He left the saucepan. Dante was beside himself with joy. He rapidly devoured his food, and after waiting an hour, lest the jailer should change his mind in return, he removed his bed, took the handle of the saucepan, inserted the point between the hewn stone and rough stones of the wall, and employed it as a lever. A slight oscillation showed Dante that all went well. At the end of an hour the stone was extricated from the wall, leaving a cavity a foot and a half in diameter. Dante carefully collected the plaster, carried it into the corner of his cell, and covered it with earth. Then, wishing to make the best use of his time while he had the means of labor, he continued to work without ceasing. At the dawn of day he replaced the stone, pushed his bed against the wall, and lay down. The breakfast consisted of a piece of bread. The jailer entered and placed the bread on the table. "'Well, don't you intend to bring me another plate?' said Dante. No, replied the turnkey, you destroy everything. First you break your jug, then you make me break your plate. If all the prisoners followed your example, the government would be ruined. I shall leave you the saucepan and pour your soup into that. So for the future, I hope you will not be so destructive. Dante raised his eyes to heaven and clasped his hands beneath the coverlet. He felt more gratitude for the possession of this piece of iron than he had ever felt for anything. He had noticed, however, that the prisoner on the other side had ceased to labor. No matter, this was a greater reason for proceeding. If his neighbor would not come to him, he would go to his neighbor. All day he toiled on untiringly, and by the evening he had succeeded in extracting ten handfuls of plaster and fragments of stone. When the hour for his jailer's visit arrived, Dante straightened the handle of the saucepan as well as he could, and placed it in its accustomed place. The turnkey poured his ration of soup into it, together with the fish, for thrice a week the prisoners were deprived of meat. This would have been a method of reckoning time, had not Dante long ceased to do so. Having poured out the soup, the turnkey retired. Dante wished to ascertain whether his neighbor had really ceased to work. He listened. All was silent, as it had been for the last three days. Dante sighed. It was evident that his neighbor distrusted him. However, he toiled on all the night without being discouraged, but after two or three hours he encountered an obstacle. The iron made no impression, but met with a smooth surface. Dante touched it, and found that it was a beam. This beam crossed, or rather blocked up, the hole Dante has made. It was necessary, therefore, to dig above or under it. The unhappy young man had not thought of this. "'Oh, my God, my God!' murmured he. I have so earnestly prayed to you that I hoped my prayers had been heard. After having deprived me of my liberty, after having deprived me of death, after having recalled me to existence, my God have pity on me, and do not let me die in despair. 
who talks of god and despair at the same time said a voice that seemed to come from beneath the earth and deadened by the distance sounded hollow and sepulchral in the young man's ears edmund's hair stood on end and he rose to his knees ah said he i hear a human voice edmund had not heard any one speak save his jailer for four or five years and a jailer is no man to a prisoner he is a living door a barrier of flesh and blood adding strength to restraints of oak and iron in the name of heaven cried dante speak again though the sound of your voice terrifies me who are you who are you said the voice an unhappy prisoner replied dante who made no hesitation in answering of what country a frenchman your name edmund dante your profession a sailor how long have you been here since the twenty eighth of february eighteen fifteen your crime i am innocent but of what are you accused of having conspired to aid the emperor's return what for the emperor's return the emperor is no longer on the throne then he abdicated at fontainebleau in eighteen fourteen and was sent to the island of elba but how long have you been here that you are ignorant of all this since eighteen eleven dante shuddered this man had been four years longer than himself in prison do not dig any more said the voice only tell me how high up is your excavation on a level with the floor how is it concealed behind my bed has your bed been moved since you have been a prisoner no what does your chamber open on a corridor and the corridor on a court alas murmured the voice oh what is the matter cried dante i have made a mistake owing to an error in my plans i took the wrong angle and have come out fifteen feet from where i intended i took the wall you are mining for the outer wall of the fortress but then you would be close to the sea that is what i hoped and supposing you had succeeded i should have thrown myself into the sea gained one of the islands near here the isle de dom or the isle de tipulin and then i should have been safe could you have swum so far heaven would have given me strength but now all is lost all yes stop up your excavation carefully do not work any more and wait until you hear from me tell me at least who you are i am i am number twenty seven you mistrust me then said dante edmund fancied he heard a bitter laugh resounding from the depths oh i am a christian cried dante guessing instinctively that this man meant to abandon him i swear to you by him who died for us that naught shall induce me to breathe one syllable to my jailers but i conjure you do not abandon me if you do i swear to you for i have got to the end of my strength that i will dash my brains out against the wall and you will have my death to reproach yourself with how old are you your voice is that of a young man i do not know my age for i have not counted the years i have been here all i do know is that i was just nineteen when i was arrested the twenty eighth of february eighteen fifteen not quite twenty-six murmured the voice at that age he could not be a traitor oh no no cried dante i swear to you again rather than betray you i would allow myself to be hacked in pieces you have done well to speak to me and ask for my assistance for i was about to form another plan and leave you but your age reassures me i will not forget you wait how long i must calculate our chances i will give you the signal but you will not leave me you will come to me or you will let me come to you we will escape and if we cannot escape we will talk you of those whom you love and i of those whom i love you must love somebody no i am alone in the world then you will love me if you are young i will be your comrade if you are old i will be your son i have a father who is seventy if he yet lives i only love him and a young girl called mercedes my father has not yet forgotten me i am sure but god alone knows if she loves me still i shall love you as i loved my father it is well returned the voice to-morrow these few words were uttered with an accent that left no doubt of his sincerity dante rose dispersed the fragments with the same precaution as before and pushed his bed back against the wall 
he then gave himself up to his happiness. He would no longer be alone. He was, perhaps, about to regain his liberty. At the worst, he would have a companion, and captivity that is shared is but half captivity. Plaints made in common are almost prayers, and prayers where two or three are gathered together invoke the mercy of heaven. All day Dante walked up and down his cell. He sat down occasionally on his bed, pressing his hand on his heart. At the slightest noise he bounded towards the door. Once or twice the thought crossed his mind that he might be separated from this unknown, whom he loved already, and then his mind was made up. When the jailer moved his bed and stooped to examine the opening, he would kill him with his water jug. He would be condemned to die, but he was about to die of grief and despair when this miraculous noise recalled him to life. The jailer came in the evening. Dante was on his bed. It seemed to him that thus he better guarded the unfinished opening. Doubtless there was a strange expression in his eyes, for the jailer said, "'Come, are you going mad again?' Dante did not answer. He feared that the emotion of his voice would betray him. The jailer went away, shaking his head. Night came. Dante hoped that his neighbor would profit by the silence to address him, but he was mistaken. The next morning, however, just as he removed his bed from the wall, he heard three knocks. He threw himself on his knees. "'Is it you?' said he. "'I am here.' "'Is your jailer gone?' "'Yes,' said Dante. "'He will not return until the evening, so that we have twelve hours before us.' "'I can work, then,' said the voice. "'Oh, yes, yes, this instant I entreat you.' In a moment that part of the floor on which Dante was resting his two hands, as he knelt with his head in the opening, suddenly gave way. He drew back smartly, while a mass of stones and earth disappeared in a hole that opened beneath the aperture he himself had formed. Then from the bottom of this passage, the depth of which it was impossible to measure, he saw appear, first the head, then the shoulders, and lastly the body of a man who sprang lightly into his cell. End of chapter 15